Hey guys welcome back to the channel this is a story about what if Deku ventured into a bizarre world of super weirdness part 1. If you guys enjoy this what if and want to see part 2 comment down below and let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel and also share this video with your friends and check out the description in my playlist so let's start the video. Two people are moving rapidly through a pass in a couple of mountains. One floats with fluffy tails floating behind them. The other is running a quick pace to their steps. We can't let them get away again. You mean her. She only calls herself they because of her twisted dream. The floating figure looks down at the one running and says, I suppose that is true. But you are one of the few who has been able to resist any attempt she has made to mess with mine. The one running smiles at that and grips down tighter on their cowboy hat. Just as they are coming up to the summit a pair of golems form from the rocks. The one running skids to a stop. Myrda, she just can't make it easy can she? When one of the golems tries to smash the one on the ground they jump back out of the way. As the moonlight passes through the clouds, you can see who they are. It is a young man with a leather cowboy hat on, a duster coat over a flannel and t-shirt, with black jeans and cowboy boots on his feet. His skin has an olive tone to it. The most striking feature is that he has yellow eyes. Before the golems strike again, one is blasted apart by the floating figure. It is a young woman with fox ears and four tails of a golden color. She is wearing a kimono that accentuates her body, without flaunting it. When the first golem puts itself back together, the man sees a meth on one of the rocks to the body, and another that has the same word on an arm. Aim for the first E. He shouts as he generates orbs of magic in his hands and launches a few at a golem. Once he's made an opening, he blasts the E turning a meth into meth. The fox woman uses a bit of her fox fire to damage the other golem before stabbing the first E with a wakazashi she had in her obai. With that done the two take to going up the pass again. And once they reach the top they see her, a woman in a robe with wild blonde hair, and a spell book in her hand. She turns back to see the two with fury in her blue eyes. Give it up Morta. I've already stopped plenty of your other spells, and plenty of other overseers have crippled most of your plans. You may have been skilled, but we can stop you, with little trouble. Once he has said that he creates a magic orb in each hand and aims it at her, while the fox readies four fox fire lights behind her and readies her blade. You're right. You and the other overseers have stood in our way. We cannot defeat you as we are, but I have a way to gather more weapons to fight against you all. A portal opens behind the woman while she smiles maniacally. This is only the beginning. She screams as she jumps in the portal. Maldita see, you're not getting away that easy. The man runs after her jumping into the portal. Yakayodai. Well, I said I would be by his side for whatever came. The fox woman sighs and flies in after the man. After a flash of light, the two of them are flying through the portal behind the woman. The man takes a few shots at her while they are going. He manages to hit her, but she then fires back with a few blasts of magic. The two dodge most of them but still get knocked back a bit. Where is she going? The fox says as she creates a barrier in front of the two. I don't know. I couldn't tell what type of spell she was using when she made that portal. Did you get a good look at it? The man asks the woman. She shrugs a bit and says, I could make out some kanji when she opened the portal. It only appeared for a second but there was something like the kanji for Boku in it. Aside from that, I think she took a page out of your book. Mixing and matching spells together in a way that somehow makes it stronger. The man grunts at that and blocking another set of shots says, I guess it doesn't matter right away. We've got to catch her. We can't let whatever crazy ambition she has play out. The monos. The man tries to rush ahead in the portal tunnel. Before they could catch up more, the woman fired a large blast back at them. Both blocked the shot in time, but they were pushed back a ways. Then another bright light opened up on them. When the two had exited the tunnel, they were falling toward the ground at high speed. The fox was fine since she could float. The man, yeah he was fine too. She saw him gliding down toward a pine grove. She followed behind him and landed. You okay? Yeah, I'm just worried. We exited the portal after her. Who knows how long she has been here. The two look out from the grove and see a city nearby. The woman speaks up first saying, Well best place to check is the city. Though something feels off about this place. I can sense magic but it's like it is far off. The man looks back to her before nodding. I agree. I tried connecting and contacting a few other overseers that should be in the area. But I'm getting nothing. It's like they don't exist. After walking a while, the two finally made it to town. When they got there, they were surprised to see multiple people with unusual appearances. There were some with horns, but that was all. A few with unusual skin tones. They both knew they were in America because everyone was speaking English, but none of the way people looked made sense. Okay this is odd. It like we're in the collapse zones. But no one is sick. What's going on? The man questioned. To which the fox woman replied. I don't know but I guess I don't really need to maintain my usual disguise. Once that was said and making sure no one watched she revealed her tails and ears. Usually, the two have to keep the fact she is a fox hidden. 
but tails and animal ears seem to be common here. We'll have to get intel in a few ways. I'm gonna poke around a few places. Get a phone from this world. Can you check some of the areas there might be magic focused? The man suggests. The fox on the other hand says, Actually do you mind if I look into things? And a new phone for myself. It's not like I stick out that much. If anything, you are more unusual. And besides, I can rarely show my true self in our world. Let me have this please. When she finishes, she pulls out the best puppy dog eyes she can. To which he caves with a sigh. Ha <laughs> ha. Alright. I'll check a few areas and see what I find. There's a cafe up the street a ways. We'll meet back up there. She nods and proceeds to ask for directions to the nearest electronic store. While she is getting info on the public space of this world, the man heads down a back alley and finds some of what he is looking for. There is a space here. But which group could be in this place? Doesn't feel right for dwarves or cyclops. Maybe you're a long way from the ranch cowboy. The man is pulled from his musings by a voice. A large man with a scantily dressed woman and a smaller rat-looking man walks up to him. The other man isn't intimidated. I'm no looking for trouble pal. Just was looking into something. The big man laughs and says, That's fine so long as you pay the fee for being here. Once he's said that, he coats his arms in rock and takes an intimidating stance. When it becomes clear the man isn't going to pay he takes a swing at him. To which the man sidesteps and punches the big guy in the groin. While Rock Man is falling, he takes another weak swing at the cowboy, to which he catches his arm, twists it a bit, and stomps on his shoulder dislocating it. With that done the other two run off. Once he's done checking a few other places he heads back to the cafe they discussed earlier. When he gets there, the fox girl is being hit on by multiple men and a few women. Sorry but I'm waiting for someone. Oh, over here. When the other guys see the cowboy walking up, a few walk off. But one woman decides to try and intimidate the man off. She bulks up a bit with her muscle enhancement power, places her hand on his shoulder and says, Why don't you head back to the boondocks hick? I'll show the lady some real fun. To which he responds with grabbing her thumb joint, twisting her arm a bit before placing his palm on her chest and blasting her two blocks away. Anybody else? The rest run after that. Once that is done, the two convene about what they've found. Apparently, those powers called quirks have become the norm for the world now and a large portion of the population has them. In contrast the man mentions having found a few magic spaces, but they are in a bit of disrepair. Unlike in their world where the imagining of gods and similar mythic beings ended up either immortalizing them or creating spaces where gods or beings of myth reside, the awakening of quirks caused a weakening of all mythic beings. There's a few places that I scanned that had power. It's not the same but it's there. The main ones are the Yukon, Rome, Greece, Cairo, a few Norse countries, a couple scattered across China and India. But one of the strongest reactions was from Japan. Not sure why. When man said that, the fox perked up and realized what the reason why. It's probably due to this all might person when the cowboy asked who, she showed a video of the man. A blonde brick wall with a big smile who seemed to be insanely strong. Reminds me of our own super-powered brick house. Wonder how him and the genie are doing. Once he comes out of his thoughts, he asks why she thinks he had something to do with it. Because he's not only given them a reason to hope, but he's made it peaceful enough that people can look into old legends, or are willing to tell old stories as well. America has always been a bit of an odd place for myths given its melting pot history. But with all these people with powers from possibly science or a disease, sorry internet conspiracies, my point is that they haven't had a reason to believe in more myths around the world as much. You remember what it was like after the collapse. The man has a stern look with hearing that but moves on. Okay, so, our next move is to go to Japan. Morta has more than likely set up there. And from what I've seen, she's got the possible weapons she needs. If she's had any time to take over people or maybe work with someone on this side, she'll be even harder to fight. Agreed. Plus, it will be nice to see my homeland without having to worry about my mother haunting me every step. The man just rolls his eyes at that and pays the bill. Next stop, Japan. I told y'all I had been sitting on these stories for a while. Just needed to decide how I was going to handle this one after making dropping the Huntic one. But this story and characters are much different from that line since I made them all myself. Hope you all like it. It was just another bad day for me. Ever since being labeled quirkless everyone around me did whatever they could to push me down. Today was the worst though. After Kachin mocked my dreams again, he said the only way I would get a quirk was to die and hope for one in the next life. I still think I have a chance though. Yue has dropped the rule that a person needs a quirk to apply. I might just have a chance. Then I hear something gurgling behind me. A massive sludge and slime comes out of the sewer pipe in the tunnel. Perfect. A medium-sized cloak to hide in. I run out into the sun a bit to get away, but the villain still grabs me. So, this is how it ends. Not today, kid. I hear a voice ring in my head. Next thing I know there is a glow beneath me and the villain. Next thing I know the villain is frozen. My mouth may still be covered, but at least I can breathe. You okay, kid? 
I hear a man say in what I English. I know a bit from heroes but I'm not fluent. Oh right, you probably can't understand me. You good kid. I hear the man say in near fluent Japanese. There is an accent but it's not too heavy. Maldita Baba. Hold still. I'll bust the part around your mouth. And with a downward fist strike he does just that. Thank you, sir. Um who are you? I ask quietly. I'm I'm here to stop you Villalo he's already stopped. All of the sudden All Might comes out of sewer too. He looked like he was about to fight, but he calmed down when he saw the villain frozen in place. I'm guessing this young man was attacked and froze the villain in self-defense. I would never blame you for reacting son but be careful with your quirk. I wince at that statement, and both seem to take notice. I actually don't have a quirk. If it weren't for this man, I would probably be dead. All Might seems a bit surprised though I'm not sure if it's my mentioning of no quirk or something else. That is when we both take a better look at my rescuer. He is probably from America with the way he dresses. He's wearing a leather cowboy hat, has blue jeans on and with a belt that has a wide belt buckle. His shirt has a white and blue plaid pattern to it and he's wearing a tan trench coat. He has dark brown hair with yellow eyes and a very tan skin complexion. I was close by and just stepped in. No big deal. All Might nods and says, I am impressed and I would like to thank you for catching this one. I was chasing him earlier and lost track of him in the sewers. But still, you shouldn't use your quirk too liberally. The other man lets out a sighing grunt and says, I don't have a quirk bub. I don't work with something so stupid. This floors both of us. Be more so. Here I was just saved by someone who claims to not have a quirk and yet he did something most would find impossible without one. So how were you able to stop him? I know I saw some sort of flash of light before the villain froze. So how did you do that? I ask taking out my hero notebook. He looks down at it, his eyes widening a bit. I take it you've been attacked more than once because of the fact you don't have one of those worthless mutations. No point lying kid. Between the singe on your clothes and the burns on that book probably someone with a fire or similar based power. All might seem shocked at this as well and looks at me. I am of course looking down and don't want to say anything. Son, even if you don't want to rat, or however you want to phrase it, this person out please answer, is this true? It's not the cowboy who is asking but All Might with a severe face. I can't really lie to my greatest hero and the one who saved me. Especially since all of this has been building up inside me for a while. I start to cry a bit before telling them most everything. All Might looks down in disappointment. I suppose some of his mentality and fixation is my fault. He probably has only ever seen the fights I get into on TV. With how overwhelmingly strong I am. And people knowing I have been like that for years, he thinks he'll be the next me based on his power alone. The other man though has a look of rage on his face. This isn't on you man. It's both the bullshit warped system of heroes you all have, as well as the fact that almost everyone with a quirk is a preening asshole who wants to play with their power. And don't deny some of that is true. How many of your so-called villains are really just stupid man and or woman children who want to just use their powers however they want? All Might coughs a bit and looks like he's about to say something but he's having trouble getting it out. The cowboy rolls his eyes and says, oh hold still, before setting his fist against All Might's side. With another bit of light gathering in his fist, it seems to do something to him, because he stands up with some extra pep and vigor. Wow that felt great. What did you do? It wasn't much just a light healing spell. At the word spell the two of us are even more dumbstruck. He can't mean magic right. Magic doesn't exist. Oh, I can assure you it does young man. All might and I hear a voice behind us the villain is gone and in his place is a woman with fox ears and four tails who is wearing a kimono. Wait where did the villain go? You have no reason to worry Mr. Might. She creates a mirror after moving her hands around. The reflection shows him sitting outside of the police station. I took the liberty to put that creature's frozen button or at least close to jail. Before All Might can question the two of them more the woman speaks up by saying, perhaps it would be better to talk about all of this later and at a place where you can drop the act you are putting on. She looks pointedly at All Might. He winces at that but the two of them just give him a disappointed or withering look. I'm not sure which. All Might takes a breath and then a cloud of smoke appears. Out of the smoke is this skeleton with blonde hair. As I'm about to freak out thinking he's an imposter, the woman suddenly grabs me in a hug. I don't know why but it calms me down. We can all talk about a few things elsewhere. There's a cafe up the road. If you are trying to keep a few secrets don't worry. We can make sure no one will know them. The cowboy says before gesturing up the road. I'm of course curious about all of this and All Might seems to be thinking a bit about what has been said and what these two imply. So, we go along with it for now. After they had gone to the cafe in question, the man surreptitiously created a circle under the four of them. Then he introduced himself. My name is Adam Garcia. This is my partner Tomo. What we're about to tell you is not only unusual but it's overly complicated. If that's the case why tell us? Izuku asks. Adam looks to the boy and tells him that you've got a lot of good. Even before I heard about your condition, I could see the greater compassion in you. You don't hope to be something everyone tells you that you can't for yourself. 
you do it for others. All Might upon hearing this looks to the boy in a bit of respect. He thinks back to his origin and how a person who didn't even know him was willing to put their faith in him. It's a bit of a perk to who and what I am. And before you ask, I'm getting to that. Due to the barrier, he placed under them and the illusion that Tomo had crafted. No one could see what Adam was creating to illustrate to the other two. Tomo and I come from a different dimension. And get that look off your faces. You've already seen us both do some unusual things. Even by your power's perspective. The two basically have to pick their jaws up off the ground. They shake their heads and Adam continues. In our world there are both metahumans and magic. But they more often than not keep themselves separate. Although metas didn't appear until a very devastating event. I won't get into full details but much of the world as we knew it almost ended. All Might has a terrified look on his face. Is this like when Quirks first awakened on our earth? That isn't though where we come in. Though it did have its effects. In our world there is an entity known as the Magus. It's their duty to maintain the balance of reality. Due to the sheer number of cultures on our world alone. Multiple gods and other deities awakened or were created from the collective consciousness. The Magus can't keep an eye on all of the day-to-day -day elements of these deities and similar. So, from ordinary people or even from other magic users, they created the Overseers. At that, he creates shifts up a few images of humans and mythics working together to act as police and magic crime enforcement. All of this just amazes Izuku more and more. These people despite being like police were almost like the heroes of their world. The Overseers operate in two groups. One are the city or culture gap worlds within entire cities. Then there is what I am. I'm what is known as a martial or ranger overseer. Tama was I guess you could say my first case. I helped her and she became my familiar. Anyway, gaps sometimes appear in strange locations that aren't connected to a major city. To illustrate he pulls up an image of a small town in the mountains. From those gaps you'll get things like, say a frost giant that wandered in from Jotunheim. Or you could see one of a number of entities born from Aditi or Izanagi. It's the job of the marshals to track down a cause of magic mayhem and stop it. Most try to avoid anything drastic, but there are people or entities who are going to fight no matter what. All Might while still enthralled by all that he talked about, asked the big question, Why are you here then? The two shared a look before bringing up the image of a woman with blonde hair. We're trying to track down a very dangerous magical criminal and terrorist. In our world she's guilty for the deaths of over a thousand people. The two of us, as well as other overseers have stopped her plans more than once. But she used a dangerous spell to bring herself to your world. And after much of what I've seen I know what she is after. It's more than likely she has an ally in this world. At hearing that All Might panics even more. His injury was making it harder to work as a pro hero already. If there was someone who could do all of that and this person feared, he wasn't sure he'd ever be able to stop them. Izuku though has almost fainted at the thought of someone like that being here. Tamo takes this moment to speak up. We came here to stop her. But unfortunately, we don't have the same kind of luxuries and resources we used to. There is enough magic for us to work with, but we are all alone in this fight. When it came to you all might admittedly, we were hoping to get your help in working with some higher-ups or police that we could trust. The boy however is a different story. With that stated all three of the adults looked at Izuku, to which he started to freak out until Tamo grabbed him. Don't swing your arms around too much. There's only so much my illusion can handle. Calming down Izuku asked what they wanted with him. Adam explained that. Even though he is an accomplished overseer, he didn't think they should place all their eggs in one basket. When Izuku didn't get the metaphor, All Might explained he didn't want to bet that they could do it all alone. I feel it's better to have a backup plan. Or rather backup period. Adam said looking pointedly at Izuku, who is just trying to process what he is suggesting. I want to train you in a few things. Magic is the obvious part. But also want you to learn more about the worlds that exist within the world. The worlds created by cultures that the cultures don't even know are there. And in the worst case, you could finish the battle we came here for. The two of us may be capable but one person or even one team can't do everything alone. Izuku is dumbstruck by what he offered. Instead of a quirk he could learn a power that maybe no one else in the world can use. I know it's a lot to take in. For both of you. Tamo. She nods and reaches into the sleeves of her kimono and pulls out a pair of talismans. Hold on to these. If you decide you want to learn from us or want to help us, think of our names and it will open a portal to where we are. All Might and Izuku take the talismans, though neither is entirely sure if this is really happening. Adam stands up and goes to pay the bill at the counter. When that is done, he tells them, hopefully we'll hear from you soon. Good luck. All Might walks Izuku home given it isn't very far. While they are walking All Might tells him a bit more about his injury and why he looks like he does. Just before reaching Izuku's home, he asks All Might a burning question. Can I be a hero without a quirk? All Might sighs and looks up before saying, before meeting those two I might have said no. But when I think about it, what it means to be a hero is much more subjective than everyone else wants to admit. In this world we want so hard to believe the powers we are born with can make us money or we can show how great we are. 
But really, a hero is someone who tries to save a life and is willing to risk their own. And from what they said about you, I do think you could be a hero. Upon hearing all of that, Izuku broke down in happy tears. Not even his mother was willing to believe in his dream. But now there were three people who thought he had the potential to be something great. After a few days, I decided that I both needed the help Garcia-san and Tomo-san were offering, as well and realizing that they needed help too. Once I was sure mom wouldn't check in on me, I took out the paper and thought of the two I had met. All of a sudden, the portal opened in my room. I stepped through and All Might was there as well. I guess we thought roughly the same thing at the same time. But still this space we are in is incredible. It almost looks like everything should be floating but there is still gravity. Then we hear the two call out, up here, come on up we can talk more with some food and drinks. They say to come up there, but I don't see a stairway to get up to them. All Might is about to buff up and jump us up there when Tomo-san shouts. This is more for Izuku, but you have to let go of what you think you know. Then you will find what you believe to be impossible is possible. I don't really know what she means by that, but I decide to take my chance. I run forward and jump with all my might. I'm sure that I will probably fall into whatever this void is but if what she says is true then I really need to let go of what is rational or realistic. And what do you know, it works. I'm actually floating towards where the two of them are situated and at a comfortable pace. I have a little trouble landing but not too much. All Might comes up right after and is confused by the physics of this space we are all in. Like she said you have to get things like rationality or logic and even physics out of your mind to really understand what we can do. Now, let's get down to business. At that the other two of us sit down to discuss matters with the overseers. All Might leads off with a few matters. First of all, I gave the description of the woman you told us about to a few that know about my condition. They have at least confirmed that she does pop up in a few places, but we can't track her. Even her physical description isn't that unusual for Japan anymore. I'm guessing in your world she might have been more of an easily identifiable face. But I have told them she is incredibly dangerous and that they should not engage her. Just to pass the location to me for right now. The overseer's not in agreement at all of what All Might has said noting that with this unusual world, most of her powers could be easily passed off as a quirk. And if she made connections with the right, or rather wrong, people they could hide her with no problem. Second, both a good friend and a few others want to meet you too. Given the situation it would be best if you could explain what is happening. Let alone that there is magic in our world. One of them was very interested at this idea of magic and superpowers that have nothing to do with the logic we tell ourselves every day. The two look at each other, seeming to mull over the possibility in their own minds. Actually, that is what they are doing. I know it has been a while since you've been home but do think that sounds about right for this area. It's not like this place is anything like our world's version of Japan. Those it does have the same problem of obnoxious assholes who think they are heroes. At that thought Adam sighs before thinking, not what I meant. Do you think that between the gap space here and the people who are administrating, we could have more to work with? Tomo puts her hand to her chin contemplating the likely scenarios. Given what All Might has done for this version of my homeland we could gain some support from the myriad of gods. And having the support of the trained beasts might be helpful as well. So are you two gonna actually talk to us more or are you just gonna keep sitting there with those looks that say you are talking to each other in your mind? All Might says with an annoyed look on his face. At that, the two overseers blush a bit before Adam says, Sorry about that. It's more convenient when you are dealing with someone who you have to interrogate. But I guess it wouldn't hurt to have a few more know about what is going on. But we need to keep the circle small. Morta wouldn't have much trouble peeking into certain minds if she wanted to. And it's better if she doesn't know where we are. All Might nods to that and asks if they can meet with both the principal of UA, plus a few of the teachers, and the head of the Hero Commission. At the mention of the Hero Commission both growl a bit, but that is when Izuku brings up the point about what he will do. Um I know I may have passed a bit of a test before, but I don't know how you two plan on teaching me magic. At that all the adults in the room turn to him before realizing that they have been talking over him a lot. With a cough All Might starts out, I'd actually like to help you train a bit too young Midori. From what these two have said, you have great potential. Honestly, you have something in you I had forgotten after being at the top and everything for so long. It wouldn't be right if I didn't help mentor that potential as well. Izuku is just floored by this offer. The number one hero is offering to help him train. Well, that might be better in the long term. While the two of us can teach you magic, I'm ashamed to admit it that I often forget to work out or similar at times. If he can train your body up, the two of us will work on your mind, magic, and spirit. We'll even take you to the Japanese gap space in Kyoto to get a better feel for what you will be learning. Adam says before Tomo coughs a bit. He gives her a look and she proceeds to sigh, before admitting that she often uses magic to make sure she looks her best, and that she knows her way around a sword, but she sometimes forgets to practice. With those plans out of the way the training begins the next day. 
All Might decides that the best place for Izuku to train is Dagaba Beach. The place had become a dump over the years from neglect and people illegally dumping their trash there. Adam agrees that it would be the perfect place and that it was far enough away that they can even practice magic with little interruption. They even create a space-time bubble a few times. That accelerates the training even more. Over time Izuku learns more of what they had meant that about thinking the impossible is possible. In many ways magic simply requires a bit of imagination. An obvious part is picturing how a spell works in your mind before casting it. But even then, parts of that can vary from caster to caster. In Izuku's case certain spells would have a green hue to them. Even when he wasn't using a plant magic spell. But he eventually got a better handle on how to use magic. Many times, Tama would cast illusions on Izuku. These were not for him to practice magic with, no these were to test his mind, to help break in a few points that he may not be willing to accept. Thoughts like, not everyone can be saved, or even wants to be saved. It may be a bit harsh, but it is often a fact overseers and even heroes of his world have to deal with. While some might think this would break his spirit, and they aren't entirely wrong, it doesn't for Izuku. The main reason being that he has seen some of those truths already due to his quirklessness. But thanks to that and all the other training Izuku felt more ready than ever for the UA entrance exam. During the training time, Adam and Tama met with the people All Might had suggested. At first, they had met at UA in the principal's office. But when it was clear that they didn't believe in what they had said, they took the meeting to their own space. While there the heroes and the commission head were amazed at what they saw. Let alone when Adam just started walking onto a space where there was nothing but a void. The others thought he and Tamo might have flight or similar quirks, until they saw All Might follow them and be able to do the exact same thing. It was after this that the small, strange animal who was the principal of UA, Nazu, decided to take his own leap of faith. He stepped forward, and even with his incredible mind chose to let go of reason and rational, and he was able to float forward as well. When the few others decided to try, they were more able to, except for one who had been trying to cancel out all of the irrational and insane things he saw. This was a scruffy-looking man named Aizawa Shota, also known as Eraser Head. When he couldn't stop what he was seeing and a few of the others tried to talk him into it, he took his chance. However, his obsession with being rational, logical and reason led to him falling into the void. Adam did manage to save him from falling for eternity, but he basically spent a while after that sitting in a corner rocking about wanting to cling to rationality. So, he was worthless as the talks proceeded. The commissioner had some good news to give the two from a different dimension. He could give them both hero licenses and special investigator authorization. This would allow them to operate, and no heroes or police would hassle them about their powers, and it would allow them to access police files and databases that most heroes wouldn't have access to. The two accepted and were given their authorization. Mezu came forward with his own offer and statement, as All Might is going to be a teacher at UA. I fear this may give more reason to attack the students. I would like it if both of you would also come on board as instructors and some extra insurance. Aizawa snapped out of his stupor long enough to try and make a case for them not to be there at UA. But of course, he was ignored. The two thought about it and conversed with each other mentally about the matter before they both agreed. With all of that out of the way the heroes left, while the overseers prepared more for their roles as teachers even more than they already were. It had been a few months of training when Izuku was told by Adam to pack his things. We're going on a trip to Kyoto. We'll be gone for about a week. Izuku was just confused and asked why they needed to go there. Tama spoke up next with, Because you need to get better acquainted with the magic forces of your homeland. You have learned a variety of spells and talismans from the two of us, but you need more than that to help yourself grow as a mage and overseer. With a smile she pats him on the head and goes over some travel plans for the three of them with Adam. Izuku still has no idea what this is about, but he assumes more of it will make sense when they get there. Luckily for Izuku, the overseers had timed this trip with his summer break, so he only had to worry a bit about his summer homework, which Adam was currently walking him through on the train trip to Kyoto. Luckily, this doesn't seem too hard. We'll finish most of this on the ride down. Then we'll have more time for you to understand a bit more of what we hope you'll learn. Adam says before helping Izuku with some equations. Tamo on the other hand is just enjoying that she doesn't have to hide herself as much as she used to. It feels so nice to have my ears and tails out without getting too many strange looks. Between your style choices and my appearance, people often wondered if we were some sort of. Well maybe it's better not to say it in young company. Tamo says with a giggle. Adam on the other hand just face palms while Izuku is confused at what she is getting. You'll understand when you are older kid. Now you're on your own for the Japanese history. Or Tama will go over it with you. At that the three continue on to Kyoto in relative peace. Once they had reached the city, they checked into a hotel near the older parts of the town. Izuku decided to ask the big question on his mind. So what exactly do we gain by coming to this part and area of town? Sure I sense more magic around here, but that can't be the real reason. 
The two overseers look at each other before Adam confirms his thoughts. You're right. It is more than just the fact that magic is stronger here. This place is a belief hotspot. Enough of the collective unconscious of humanity here in Japan has created a gap zone. Izuku remembers them talking about gap zones and spaces, and how they are like pocket dimensions within certain areas, that are strengthened by the belief of even rumors of certain things. Tamo continues with, We intend for you to see more of the gap and the beings that live there. Hopefully you can grow to understand some of what we are hoping for while adventuring in there. But you have to be careful. Tamo goes on to explain the aspects of spiriting away and similar that some of the creatures of the gap zone may try to do. And Adam finishes her thought by saying that Izuku shouldn't wander too far from them on the first trip in. They decide to wait till the next day to enter the gap. When the next day comes, the overseers lead Izuku into an old alley that may have once been a shopping center or similar hotspot. From here he can see an old temple up the road from them. Adam checks to make sure no one had followed them and creates a small portal to the gap zone. Izuku is just in awe of the strange world he has stepped into once again. The whole area they entered looked like a city from the Edo period and it was lit up like the town was celebrating a festival. Izuku wanted to look around a bit, but Adam caught him. Well there Chico, bad idea to just wander in these places, especially if you're human. For now, stay close. We'll get a better lay of the land, so to speak, and just get to know some of the folks around here. With that the three started exploring the area. Izuku was still in awe of what he was seeing. Adam was keeping an eye out for anyone who may be trouble or could be an informant. Tamo on the other hand was just eating up the admiration from a few of the yakai of the area. There were many male yakai who were admiring her beauty and the female yakai were either jealous or enamored by her. She hadn't felt this in a long time, given she was still on the outs with her mother back in their old world. While they were walking, they heard a crash from behind them and saw some young yakai running. Catch them, those little thieves. A shout from a pair of long-limbed humans called out as the yakai children ran past. Two bumped into Izuku and fell. When a young girl with red hair and fox features and a possibly young boy that looked more like a badger. Both had raggedy-looking kimonos on. We've got to run Kai. Come on, the badger boy said, helping the girl up. They both continued on while the long-limbed humans were still chasing them. Izuku was confused at the whole matter but had a different thought after they had left. They both kinda looked like they needed and wanted help. You might want to check to see if you still have your wallet Izuku. Tamo teased. Izuku checked his pockets and they had not taken anything luckily. I'm good. It's still here. What was that about? Same thing that happens in any world or place. Those who are desperate may resort to the worst things just to stay alive. Doesn't matter how they look or what their background may be, Adam said with a grim face, before saying they need to move on. As they were walking Izuku took note of the variety of yakai in the area. There are multitudes of types ranging from multiple prefectures. There are Joraguma which look like women with multiple eyes and spider legs on their backs. Some Abura Sumashi were at a stall selling oil. Even some Furibiri and Kametachi that were floating and flying overhead. However, Izuku's mind kept going back to the young yakai that had apparently stolen something from others. I know you said not to worry about it but, I know kid, but the fact is you can never truly fix everything with any sentient group. No matter how much people want to think otherwise, a utopia is not possible. Better to try and work as well as you can with what is in front of you. Adam says while knocking on a large door to a building in the center of the district. Tamo agrees with him pointing out that even with power of any kind, most still can't or want help most because they are trying to either keep or gain more their power for themselves or are desperately clinging to what little they may have. Once she has said that a large blue-skinned Oni opens the door to let the three of them into the large building, Tamo then says to Izuku, Let me and Adam do most of the talking here. The person we are meeting is one of the three great yakai of Japan. I'm not sure you're really ready for this but we need their information. Don't worry you should be fine so long as you don't ask too many questions. Izuku gulps and wonders what the hell he is doing here. But before he can ask more the audience room opens and before them was the great Tengu, Emperor Sudoku. So, you are the ones who have requested the audience with us. Who exactly are you? The large blue-skinned man said, his hair rising up in unnatural ways. At this Adam, Tamo and Izuku stepped forward and sat Siza in front of the throne. Emperor Sudoku, I know you are one of the greatest yakai in this world. I need your aid to find a dangerous human. I know you do not think much of humanity now and you think there is no one who could challenge you outside of the other three great yakai. I am here to tell you that this not remain a truth much longer. Adam says with calm and resolve. Sudoku at first seems insulted by the statement that a human thinks that someone could challenge his power. But then he remembers that others have usurped him before. Very well. We are willing to listen more. Who is it that believes they can challenge us? Sudoku says with a critical eye on Adam. Adam and Tom will go on to explain some of who they are and who it is that could challenge his standing. At hearing what the mad mage Morta has committed in their world, Sudoku is more inclined to take them seriously. You make a fair point and a good argument human. 
We will allow you to have more information about our regions. If you are willing to do us a few favors, Sudoku says with an imposing look upon his face. Both Adam and Tomo sigh at this but realize that they don't have many options. They agree and Sudoku allows them to explore his manner. Izuku is given a charm that signifies he is protected by Sudoku so the staff and other yakai won't try to eat him. With that done, the overseers agree to speak with Sudoku more about matters that need to be done in his realm over the next week. The next few days Adam and Tama were wandering around the gap space dealing with certain matters as they could. Izuku on the other hand decided to explore more on his own. At one point he bumped into the group of yakai kids again. Hold it right there you little rats. I know you stole something from my stand. An apostia said coming up to them. Izuku wasn't sure what exactly to do but he knew he had to help them. They couldn't have done something because they were showing me around. I've only been here twice so I asked if they could guide me. The kids looked confused, as did the Apostia man. He was about to try and eat Izuku, until he noticed that he had a charm from the Sudoku around his neck. Giorar fine, I better not catch you brats near my stand again. And with that the Apostia walked away. Hey thanks for that. I'm Riku and this is Chika. I'm a Mugina and she's a Kitsune. The Badger Boy, or rather Mugina, explained while Chika just waved hello from behind him. Izuku smiled and asked if they could show him around for real. The other young yakai went off to do whatever it was they had to do, while Riku and Chika guided Izuku. At one point they were passing some dango stands and Izuku bought both of them some, plus a few extra to take to the other kid. It was after they had walked around a while that Izuku finally asked both of them where their parents were. Riku sighed before saying, I don't know about mine. I've been on the streets for so long I don't remember my parents. Izuku was saddened by this, thinking back on his own parents. His dad may be away because of work, but he still tried to keep in touch with his family. What about you Chika? He asked innocently. Chika suddenly froze up and started hugging herself tightly. Riku put an arm over her shoulder and tried to comfort her. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to Izuku said before Riku cut him off. It's not your fault. If anything, it's her mother's. Her mother was something of a dangerous and fairly evil yakai in her home region. She never intended to have Chika and basically told her that every day for some time. Her mother had attacked and raped some random man in the human realm some time ago. She is the product from that. I was from the area and I was her only friend. Riku went on to explain that he had heard Chika's mother was planning to sell her off, and he wouldn't let what her mother had planned happen. So, he snuck in and helped get Chika away from there. Managed to cut that damn bitch pretty good with a sword I had stolen from her house. Don't have it anymore. Had to sell it so we could get here. Not that it's been much easier. At that Izuku decides to help them more even if they may not know it. He gives them a bit of money and a few talismans. He tells them, if you ever really need help, think of these and I'll know. And I'll do my best to save you. Neither of them knows what to say at this but thank him before heading out. While that has been going on, Adam and Tamo had gotten some background on the individual that was causing extra trouble in Sudoku's realm. There was some person causing unrest, using everything from a new type of mystic drug to even some various thefts and extortion. The biggest issue is that no one knows who the head is. They had talked with the former head of the organized crime, an oni who had lost most of his power. He only told them so much. Don't exactly who or what they are, but I do know it was a woman or whoever it was preferred a female form. They seemed to know every way I would fight. Any attack I threw their way missed. She had some sort of funny charm with her too. It didn't weaken her, but it weakened me and my men. The old Oni explained. Tamo asked if this individual was using his old headquarters. He said no, given she destroyed the house after taking him and his group down. He went on to explain that she had no respect for the old ways or for the old honor of the gangs. Before he could start on a rant Adam stopped him and asked what the woman looked like. Well, I can't tell you much, but she did have this strange covering over her eyes, and a necklace of coins for some reason. The two overseers looked at each other and nodded. They thanked the old Oni and gave him a few special kinds of liquor. A good bottle of sake is nice, but some of these others smell nice too. What are these? One's a whiskey from Ireland, one Caribbean rum, some vodka from outside of Moscow, and a bottle of wine from Italy. Should tide you over for a while, Adam says. The old Oni salutes them with a sakazuki as the two walk off. Well that gives us something to work with but the question is who is trying to mess with Sudoku? And what's the point to all of these other matters? Adam questions as they are heading to pick up Izuku. Tamo shakes her head before saying, I think you're far too used to the maniacal and scheming types we usually deal with. This is more than likely a yakai following its nature more than anything. But they are being extra aggressive about certain matters. When they find Izuku he tells them about exploring around the shopping areas among other things. After two more days there, it is getting close to the time to leave and the overseers haven't made much progress. Whoever is causing a mess is here somewhere. But we keep coming up dry on the leads. Que Diablos esta disputa? Adam asks while pacing back and forth in their hotel room. 
Tamo is in no better spot, drinking three cups of coffee while reviewing notes. They both are wishing that they had some city overseers to work with. If only we had the help of the Kyoto branch back home. They could put more of this together. Tamo complains. Izuku had helped a bit with noting that there seemed to be someone behind even the street kids and the like, saying, maybe they're recruiting young or something. It worked with you too. But even that had turned up dry when some of the kids disappeared. It was the day before they were planning to head back that Izuku felt his talismans light up and create a portal for him to follow. He jumped through without hesitation and found Chika and Riku badly injured. Just then an attack came from nowhere and he created a shield to protect them and a few of the other kids. What are you doing here? Chika asked in a scared voice. To which Izuku responded, I'm here to save you. And I will save you. I'll leave it at that for now. I'll come back to this eventually. But I need to deal with matters in real life for now. So you'll have to live with a cliffhanger for a while. Izuku had just managed to put up his shield in time to save the young yakai from being attacked by the strange woman. As she came out of the shadows, Izuku could see more of her appearance. She wore a sleeveless kimono, had long black hair, and a strange mask on her face that only obscured her eyes. Who is this brat who dares to stand in my way? Some pitiful human. He will fall like all the others before you. With that the woman waved her hands and created a set of spells to attack the kids. Izuku blocked most of them and told Riku and Chika to get themselves and the kids to cover. Once that was done, Izuku took cover himself while firing a few magic blasts at the woman. To give himself more cover Izuku used a smokescreen spell to buy more time. With some cover Izuku started a few trap spells to be laid out while fighting. He could place them when he got closer to whoever this was. But all of a sudden, a few magic shots flew towards him from strange angles. He barely had time to dodge and block the blasts. Once the barrage let up, the woman came out of nowhere and kicked him across the floor. But Izuku had managed to lay a trap near her feet. He just needed her to walk to it. Guess you have to hide how gruesome your face is. Bet you can never look in a mirror if you need a covering all the time. Izuku knew it was a lame taunt, but he needed his opponent to walk towards it. She did, but she stopped just short of the trap he laid and walked around it. Nice try brat but I knew you had something planned. Between my own power and the charm, the western witch gave me, I can defeat you easily. Izuku grit his teeth before firing off a few more shots. The woman still dodged most of them but Izuku noticed that he had managed to strike her foot even if minorly. The woman started screeching in pain and Izuku saw some type of glyphs on a small choker around her neck. So that's it. That choker has the charm, but what is her power? And how does she seem to know what I'm doing from every angle? Izuku thought and realized he needed to get closer to tell more of what was going on. But without some better cover or a distraction that wasn't happening. All of the sudden Riku leapt in with a few orbs of blue fox fire following him. Chika was in the rafters of the building controlling the fire. Riku had managed to scratch the woman and then backed off to stand next to Izuku. You damn brats. I'll kill all of you the woman screeched before firing of some more magic. Izuku took advantage of the distraction and rushed in close, dropping a few traps along the way. He struck the yakai with a punch and then a kick while keeping a close eye on her choker and the rest of her body. He saw it flash as he struck and could tell the writing was Gaelic and what some of the symbols meant. This attack enraged the woman though and she unleashed an omnidirectional spell at all of them. Shika however managed to teleport all of them out of the room before it landed. While the woman was rushing around trying to find the kids, Izuku and the two yakai were resting and treating their wounds. While Riku was being bandaged up he said I don't know how we can stop her. I got one scratch off, but she barely seemed phased. No adults and trained warriors could beat her so what can we do? We should just run. Izuku just says, we're the only ones who can beat her. She's weak against children and I know what type of yakai she is. Riku and Chika are both confused by this so Izuku explains. First of all, she's a dadonki. I noticed it when I got close. On her arms there look to be closed eyes or eyelids. My guess is she's using a spell to send her eyes to multiple points in the room. That way she can see whatever attack is coming at her. But that also means she can be distracted. With that being said, the two young yakai realize his point. With Riku stating it made sense why almost no attacks could hit her. Chika on the other hand says that her fox fire if used right could distract the Dodonki. Well, that explains the first part, but why are we the only ones who can beat her? Surely an adult would have a better chance. We should just run. Chika asks Izuku while listening at the door for the enemy. Izuku wraps his hand and creates a few talismans before continuing. The choker on her neck has a special curse that only affects adults. I gotta look at it in that last rush. It's in Gaelic but I could make out a few parts. Namely, that there was the name Matcha and the words curse and weaken. It's modified but it is a curse from Ireland that affects only men originally or rather weakens them for a period of time. It's been adjusted to make it to where men and women are weakened but it comes with the same drawback. It only affects adults and children can defeat her. Izuku then says he needs their help. While both aren't sure he says to them, I know you've both had to run for so long but now you have a chance to stop this monster and help so many people. 
what she's involved in, who she's working with. They are incredibly dangerous, and we need to stop both of them at any cost. Chika is still scared, but Riku realizes that Izuku is right. Even if we run, she'll eventually come back around and try to hurt us and others again. You're right we have to stop her. Both of the boys look to Chika who is shaking thinking back to her mother and what she could do or what will be left for her if they fail. Riku then tells her she doesn't need to come and that he and Izuku will try to handle this, before grabbing a sword sitting in a barrel in the closet, they are in. No, I can't keep being scared. Keep being saved by you and others. I have to stand for myself. So, I'll fight too. Chika says with her legs still shaking a bit. With a nod from Izuku they head out and set up a spot to take down the Dodoki. Chika suggests that they destroy the medicine factory to lure her out. With that they head to the underground drug factory and lay their trap. Meanwhile the Dodonki is searching parts of her base, attacking the minions who say they haven't seen the children. When she hears an explosion, she asks a fleeing Aniobo what exploded. The medicine factory madam. It was set ablaze by a couple of children. This enraged the Dodonki more and she rushes that way. Two rooms before the medicine shop, she was hit by an explosion under her feet. While still reeling Izuku and Chika unleashed a barrage of blasts at her before Riku gets behind her and slices the demon's side. The Donoki screeches again before wailing. How is this possible? This charm should make me untouchable. That which promised me it would work. Oh it does work. Just not against anyone younger. It only applies to adults so we can take you down. Izuku says casting an enchantment on the sword Riku held. While angered by the weakness of this charm, the Dodonki wasn't too concerned. While Izuku was talking she started her spell to spread out her eyes. It won't matter brat, you just gave me the time I needed to orchestrate your end. With that she unleashes beams from her eyes that freeze all of the kids in place. She starts to stalk up to Izuku, planning to kill him first, when all of the sudden she feels a searing pain and flash by her eyes in the room. The chica that she thought she had frozen was just an illusion. And then Chika created discreet fox fire lights next to each of the eyes she had seen. With that done, Izuku and Riku were freed from the spell and could attack. Izuku clapped his hands and activated the binding traps he had laid, while Riku rushed forward and cut the Dodonki's head clean off. While Izuku was unsettled by this he knew that this would happen anyway, given they were planning to take her to Emperor Sudoku, and he would execute her. Besides, they had a different problem to deal with. The local guards and his overseer mentors had shown up. Riku had grabbed the head of the Dodonki and Chika had set the body of fire which in turn set alight the rest of the complex that wasn't burning. Once outside, Tamo rushed to Izuku and wrapped him in a hug. We were so worried when you disappeared. What happened? How did you end up here? Tamo gave him a moment to breathe. And I don't think he's the only one with some answers for us, Adam said before nodding to the yakai kids behind Izuku. Once she had calmed down, Izuku explained everything of meeting Riku and Chika to them summoning him to help them, and then fighting the Dodonki with a Celtic Irish charm. It's similar to some of what you do, eh Mr. Architect? Tamo says teasingly while looking at the charm. Adam makes an annoyed grunt before saying, You're not wrong but this is nothing compared to what I make when I adjust spells. Besides, I do more of overlaying and interweaving multiple different spells from different backgrounds. This is just adjusting a spell to work with a specific set. And don't call me the architect. I can't stand those titles or nicknames or whatever. Oh sorry, but are you sure you wouldn't prefer your other nickname? Dragons keep San. The kids are confused by this whole matter, even Izuku. He hadn't heard about these titles before, but given how Adam reacted he probably preferred not to think about that. Once they were done and a few of the other members had been arrested, Adam and Tamo offered to let Riku and Chika stay at their hotel room for the night. We'll need you two to come with us to talk to Sudoku later. He should hear more about what has been happening. But for now, you kids look like you need a bath, a hot meal, and good night's sleep, Adam says with a gruff but caring tone to his voice. The two orphans are amazed at the offer and agree right away. They do think more about the other kids and that they wish they could share it with them. Tamo then tells them that the guards found the other kids and are taking them in and helping them with a few matters. The overseers tell them they will explain more later. After a good night of sleep and warm meals and baths, the five all go to meet with Emperor Sudoku in his palace. Shika and Riku were given nice new kimonos from Tamo and Adam had specially adjusted the sword Riku had used so it could grow with him. It had been a bit unwieldy during the fight with the Dodonki but now it fit him better. So, these are the young ones who defeated the threat to our realm, Sudoku asks while looking down from his throne. Adam then responds saying, Indeed your majesty. It turns out the Donkey had a special charm that made it to where adults would be weakened or would have their capabilities interfered with. It's most likely why we weren't getting anywhere with our investigations. Sudoku nods at this before addressing the children. You have done us a great service by dealing with this threat. We intend to make good on any debt to each of you we may have. Starting with you young Midoriya Izuku was it? Step forth. Izuku does that and stands before the emperor. The Tengu ruler then reaches down and touches the charm he had given Izuku. 
It lights up and changes into a cloak around his shoulders. We have blessed the charm we gave you with more of our power. It will allow you to make Tengu-like wings and grant you control of the winds, to an extent anyway. Izuku bows his head low and profusely thanks Sudoku for the gift. He then beckons Chika forward, who is both shell-shocked and terrified at all that has happened. We have heard of some of the trouble your mother is causing, and we can tell that you are more concerned for the other children you were all stealing with. I will proclaim this first. The children will be brought to the palace to be trained in a variety of skills. Then he could prove useful for protecting my realm. There are a few of the more noble and trustworthy guards who have offered to adopt some of the younger ones. The elder ones can learn new skills. Chika and Riku are amazed that the great Tengu would offer to take care of or watch over orphans but they're both happy to hear that. For you though child, take this. Sudoku waves his hand and summons a Tanto and Miko's prey bells. He then hands them to Chika saying, the tanto can only be draw by you and the bells will both keep your mother away and strengthen your spells. May you use it well. At this Chika prostrates herself and thanks Sudoku for the gift. When he calls Riku up he comments, You have a blade already, but a good warrior needs armor as well. With a snap of his fingers, a set of armor appears in front of Riku. It then floats to him putting itself on the boy. Much like your sword, this armor will adjust as you need it. It can even change to a shape allowing for more covert combat and strikes. It also has protection from most elemental forces. With this Riku bows as well thanking the Tengu ruler. With this done Adam and Tamo both apologize for not being able to aid him as they had planned. Sudoku just laughs and says, it is not your fault that the enemy had a way to counter anything you could do. Besides, by bringing this boy you were able to fulfill what we had agreed on. We will provide a bit more information and keep a watch on matters that may involve this dangerous entity. You have our word. At that, all five of them bow and leave the audience chamber of the palace. Once they are all outside, Izuku asks what Riku and Chika plan to do. If it's not too much trouble Izuku, I'd like to come along with you. Riku says with Chika agreeing with him. By meeting you we gained a bit more hope, and even a chance to do a lot of good. We probably wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for you. Would you be willing to take us? Izuku is stunned but snaps out of it when Adam pats him on the back. This isn't too different from when Tamo and I met. I gave her hope and a chance for something new. And maybe that's enough. She'll teach them a few things with it like staying out of sight close to you. Might be a good idea for now. Izuku looks at his two mentors and back to the two young yakai he inspired. And with a smile, he says, Okay, I'd be glad to have you two as partners. Or rather familiars. At that, the two young yakai break into big smiles and Chika jumps at Izuku and hugs him. With their plan set and their job done, the overseers and their young students head back to Mustafa. When we got back home, mom was a bit confused by the two extra members who came with us. Though at seeing Chika hide away from her behind me, she was a bit more sympathetic. All right, how about you explain what is going on over dinner? We're having katsudan. That gets me extra excited and Riku was interested too. He had never had a home-cooked meal, so this would be a new experience for him. After dinner with both Riku and Chika being happily stuffed, I told mom about what had happened in Kyoto. When she heard about what both of my familiars had been through, she started to cry. She rushed over to both of them and wrapped them in as warm of a hug as she could manage. Riku again was confused but eventually relaxed into the embrace. Chika was scared at first, as her mother had faked such warm moments just to hurt her. But this time, there was no pain to follow. Instead, she only felt the warmth from my mom. So, she started crying. But I knew these were probably happy tears, because she finally felt some more genuine care. Once all the explanations were given, mom said that both of them were more than welcome to stay in their home as long as possible. You can even call me mom as well. You don't look too far off from Izuku's age, so I don't mind thinking of you as some extra children. With that, mom sets them up in the extra room in our apartment. They don't have much for personal items, but we could get them something later. For the next couple of months, we all continued to train. All Might had been healed and restored to full strength thanks to the spell work of Garcia-san and Tamo-san. Now I don't have to worry about running out of time anymore. Thank you, both of you, All Might said with a happy look on his face. He then gave both Garcia-san and Tamo-san their licenses and detective certificates so they could look into finding that mortal woman. If what happened in that gap world in Kyoto is correct, then we have much greater concerns than we thought. If she is making charms to weaken adult heroes, then we'll have to rely more and more on the students at UA. Tomber, Religato. She probably won't use the same spell. Or curse as it were. She's got a good, bad habit of not returning to most plans or reusing the same big spell after it has failed or been used. Not sure why. Garcia Sen explained during a break with my training at Dagaba Beach. Speaking of All Might was interested in my two familiars. And while he gave Chika some space, after hearing what she had been through, he put Riku through the ringer training him in combat. Even with the sword he had, Riku couldn't even scratch All Might. And with as impressive as the armor he had was, 
All Might could still hurt him through it. Now I see why Izuku. And everyone is so impressed with you. You might just be a match for some of the strongest yakai out there. Riku said after their first sparing session. All Might of course just gave a big hearty laugh at that description. Before saying Riku needed to work more with me on building up his strength. In the last couple of months leading up to the UA entrance exam, Katsuki had tried to intimidate me and push me down so I wouldn't take the test. Every time though, he got tripped up or ended up with part of his uniform burning. Chika and Riku had learned from Tamo-san on how to turn invisible and intangible in others' presence. They both despised Katsuki, but I told them not to do too much to mess with him. As we were heading toward the UA exam site, he again tried to insult me. And yet again, he wound up face first on the ground. He'll never learn. And apparently, I'm still way too clumsy too. Just as I'm sure Chika and Riku are going to try and catch me, I feel myself floating. Man, that was close. Sorry for using my quirk on you, but you look like you needed help. I turn and see a cute girl with a permanent bush on her face smiling at me. Oh yeah thanks, can you let me down now? I say stammering a little. She just gives a surprised oh and brings her hands together. When she does, I feel myself float back to the ground. Well good luck on the exam. You too, I say to her. As I'm walking in, Riku is enjoying teasing me about the girl who saved me. Shika is laughing a bit but doesn't say anything to tease. Once the written portion of the test is done, it is time for the practical side of the hero exam. And while I want to geek out about seeing present Mike giving the explanation of the enemies and the objective of the exam, I keep my cool for the most part. When a taller participant speaks up next, I start thinking more about the exam and what more of the focus is about. I vaguely hear him try to call me out since I'm lightly vocalizing my thoughts. But that changes as soon as the taller boy's pants drop. While the rest of the auditorium is laughing at his misfortune, I know who is behind it. Chica, that was mostly unnecessary. It was funny, but don't do that too often. Okay, I was just mad at what he said about you. She says in my mind while the tall boy is pulling his pants up. Mike then explains, the last robot is more of an obstacle than a villain. You won't gain any points by taking it down. So then, each of you should have your exam site cards. I only have one last thing to say to you all. Break a leg out there and go beyond. Plus, Ultra. With that said I check my card and see I'm at site too. As we on the way, I put together a base plan with Chika and Riku. I'll launch into the site as fast as I can with enhancement magic. Once we're in a ways, you two appear and take out what robots you can. Let's do this as efficient as possible. With an affirmative from both of them, we get ready with each piece of gear. Chika draws her bells and tanto. Riku prepares his sword and armor. And once I've stepped outside of the bus, I activate the cloak I got from Emperor Sudoku. That action surprises a few people, and they start questioning what my quirk could be. As I'm passing by the girl who helped me before the exam, I wish her good luck and surreptitiously plant a little charm on her. Just in case. Now then, time for the practical. While most were still psyching themselves up, present Mike shouted over the intercoms, Go. As the doors opened, most of the applicants were surprised but Izuku and his familiars were the first to rush in. What are you waiting for? There's no countdown in real life. Move it. And with that the rest of the applicants start into the faux city. After Izuku spots the first robot to attack he rushes in and blasts it up close with some impact spells. Once that is done, Chika and Riku take off in different directions. Chika takes to the air, floating and unleashing some fox fire. Riku on the other hand sticks to the ground and cuts down three robots in a single go. Okay what's with these two kids? They came out of nowhere. Midnight says while watching the second site's video feed, most of the teachers are confused. Even Nezu. That is when All Might speaks up. I know them. They are both true yakai. And they are the familiars of one of our applicants. All of them are shocked at the revelation. But Nezu feels a bit better given he hadn't put most of who they were together. That applicant wouldn't happen to be the student of Garcia and Tama. Would they? Aizawa says with an annoyed tone to his voice. He still hadn't gotten over the fact that destroyed his perception of what was rational in the world. With All Might's acknowledgement, this made the rest of the teachers curious. And I brought a different matter into question. We should count their robot takedowns as the applicants. It is fair. They are an extension of that person's power. But for now, we need to give the real test to these students. Nezu said before nodding to Power Loader. The support-focused hero nodded and pressed the big red button before him. Izuku had managed to take out a fair number of robots on his own. His rough total for himself, he figured was around 25 to 30 points. From what Chika and Riku had reported, they too had taken out enough for a total of 40 or so points. It was at this point that they all felt a rumbling beneath their feet, while some of the applicants were thinking it was just an earthquake. Izuku had a good feeling on what it actually was, and Chika confirmed his suspicions. There is a huge robot heading towards all of you. You need to run now, she shouted to Izuku's mind. He quickly unfurled the cloak on his back and took to the air to see the opponent better. 
The huge robot crashed through a building and was heading towards the other applicants. Riku on the other hand had a different report. Izuku, that girl from the start is in trouble. At hearing that, Izuku turned and flew as fast as he could toward the zero pointer. The charm he put on her gave him an idea on her position, and it would help if he couldn't get there right away. Oh, my leg, Achako said with some debris pinning her ankle. She looked up and could see the robot's large fist coming down toward her, right as it was about to impact though. A barrier appeared around her stopping the attack. Just after that Riku appeared out of nowhere and lifted the debris off of her. Are you okay? He shouted to her. While she was confused at the strange-eared boy, she was able to respond with a nod. But before Riku could help her get away, the zero-pointer robot went in for another attack. Riku tried to cover up Achako's body with his own but knew it wouldn't be enough. Thankfully though, Izuku made it in time. He flew in and stopped the punch with a strong magic barrier. The while the robot was reeling, he clapped his hands together and formed a variety of spells with a wave. Once ready he crossed his hands and snapped his fingers. With that snap, a barrage of multiple elemental and magical blasts were unleashed on the robot. After the magic had run its course, there was nothing left of the zero pointer but the tank treads on the ground. This shocked not just Riku, Chika and Achako, but also the teacher who were observing. With that done, Izuku flew down to Achako and Riku to check on them. Great job Riku, you did just like a hero would. Riku smiled and just said, I just did what I thought you would do, like when you saved us. With that, Riku disappears from sight, leaving Achako very confused on what is going on. Let's get you back to the entrance. Sorry but I'm not good enough at healing magic yet to fix your ankle. Izuku said before picking Achako up bridal style and creating his black wings from his cloak. Achako was blushing quite a bit now and was even more confused when a girl with fox ears and tails flew up to meet them. And then after a short conversation, the girl also disappeared. Recovery girl was intrigued and intrigued by Izuku given what she had seen in the observation room and now with helping the girl. Are there others who are missing? I can go look for them, Izuku offered. And recovery girl smiled a bit more before saying, Don't you worry Sunny. We've found everyone you can relax your wing quirk. As Izuku is putting Achako down he then says, with a little bit of pride, I don't actually have a quirk. And as for this, while the former statement surprises all involved, when he changes his wings into a cloak and then a small charm around his neck, they are all completely dumbfounded. During the following week, Izuku took to studying a few other spells, especially healing and recovery spells. Want to make sure you can heal the girl in case something happens again. Chika teased a bit while reading over some scrolls Tamo had lent her. Izuku blushed and was about to retort when his mom said his letter from Yue had arrived. The three who had been there looked on with rapt attention as the projector started up. I am here, as a projection. Now then young Midoriya, I'm betting you're wondering about this. Well, I'm going to be your newest teacher at Yue. Izuku was surprised at first but then realized that All Might could be going there to protect the future generations. If this mortal woman is really here trying to control or destroy things, then having the strongest hero would be a smart idea. Off screen on the projection, someone tells All Might to hurry up as he has more letters to do. All Might coughs before saying, you scored quite well on the written portion of the exam. For the practical though, you threw many of the proctors off when your familiars showed up. When I mentioned both Adam and Tamo had taught you, they added all of the scores together and you came out with 73 villain points. At that all of us are happy at how well we had done in stopping the villain bots. But that wasn't the only thing. All Might continued with, but that isn't all we look for in an applicant. There is also the most noble element of a hero, the spirit of self-sacrifice. Both you and young Riku showed this when you stood to face the zero-point robot, and we caught on the cameras that you had been the one to inspire Riku in the first place. The images of that are shown on the projection, and both of the boys smile a bit brighter. How could we deny such exceptional spirit and capabilities? The answer is, we can't. And that is where the second part of the exam comes in. And that is, rescue points. And as such you have been awarded 70 rescue points. At this Izuku just starts to cry a bit before All Might makes his final statement. Come young Midoriya. This is your hero academia. While Izuku was dealing with getting into UA, Adam and Tama were going about their own investigations. Adam had taken to setting up some minor places in other countries where a few magic beings could help with protecting and saving humans and magical beings. His latest had him in the Yukat and helping a few creatures from Sayabalba. You know, this should get you guys started, he said to a few Lux wandering around. One was even riding on the shoulders of a Nahuel, putting up a few decorative talismans. What Adam was hoping this could do, was that in a few of these regions, the offices could find promising people with the potential for magic, then they could act as overseers and could start setting up support to stop Morta or any other dangerous entity. With some luck this would be the case. You should have a few things to help all of you in case that Sipiktil shows up again. Well, Buna Suerte. Adam said as he created a portal to take him back to Japan. 
The portal opened at Dagaba Beach and he and Tama were surprised to see both All Might and Izuku there. Ah good to see you too. I was just congratulating young Midoriya here on his acceptance to UA. He and the other two made quite the showing. Adam just gave Izuku a proud smile, while Tamo took the time to give Izuku and his familiars a big hug, which made the boys blush a bit and made Chika a bit jealous. When All Might asked where the two had been during the week, Tamo explained the situation. We've been going to a few places and helping mythics and creating, well small overseer offices. Even if Morta is focused and working in Japan primarily, that doesn't mean she won't be elsewhere. Better to have some minor backup. Plus, the ones we've been helping have agreed to be on the lookout for those with magic potential. All Might nodded seeing this as a good thing. Izuku though was wondering if they would forget about him with training others. Don't worry Chiko, they'll be taught by the local groups more than us. We have a bigger focus and priority right now, Adam said with an endearing look on his face. This made Izuku smile and nod saying that he'll make them all proud, with Riku and Chika promising the same. Izuku, do you have your handkerchief? And Chika dear, do you have what you need for the day? Yeah mom. And don't worry, Izuku said as he was dressed in his UA school uniform with his familiars off to either side. Riku was the first to respond saying, he's right, we got all the gear we need for today, and we'll probably be staying invisible the whole time. So, nothing to worry about there. Chika chuckled while putting on her geta and checking her prayer beads and bells over. Inko decided to do something extra for the two familiars though. Hold on you too. Izuku I know you will want to have a meal at UA, but I want your partners to have something special. She said as she walked up to them and handed each a homemade lunch. Neither of the yakai were sure what to expect, but they were both happy to receive the gift. Izuku just smiled before saying they all needed to go. But Inko stopped him one last time before saying, You look really cool, honey. She said this with a big smile on her face, one that her son mirrored. After a quick train ride, Izuku stood in front of the leading institute for teaching heroics in Japan. Good to see you Chiko. The green-haired teen heard from behind him. He turned and saw his two teachers walking up. Adam had a bit more of a tan compared to the last time Izuku saw him and had swapped for a lighter and shorter trench coat compared to his usual. Tamo on the other hand had taken to wearing her kimono in a more proper manner. Rather than show her cleavage off and the shoulders draping a bit, she wore it up. And she had a rather nice pin for her hair as well. If it wasn't for the fact she had light brown hair, she might look very befitting of the term Yamato ne Chiko. For now, they all were walking up for their first day of classes. Izuku was placed in class 1 a while Adam and Tamo were supposed to be new hero investigation and response teachers. To be honest I'm betting Nezu made up what we'd be teaching. But it would be a pretty good idea for a few of the estudians to learn how to investigate a crime scene. Adam said with a light smile on his face. Tamo tittered a bit before mentioning that she would be doing some interesting things to test the students later in the week. Izuku said goodbye to his magic teachers and headed for his classroom. When he got there, Katsuki was already in an argument with the same stiff applicant that had been at his exam site. When they saw Izuku, Katsuki was quick to think he shouldn't be there, but the taller boy quickly went up to him to congratulate Izuku. You understood a hidden element about the practical, didn't you? The boy, Ida Tenya as he had told Izuku, asked, but Izuku just chuckled and shook his head. No, I did what I felt was the right thing to do. It has nothing to do with whether or not it scores the most points. We're here to be heroes. And that means we put the lives of others first in as many cases as we can. After saying that, most of his classmates had enamored and impressed looks on their faces, with one red-haired student calling out manly. At hearing Izuku's speech, wow, that's a cool way to say it. Izuku hears behind himself. So, he turns and sees the cute girl from the exam standing there with her permanent blush. Hey I was wondering, where's Riku? And that other girl who you talked to? The girl asked after introducing herself as Yuraka Achako. Shika was wanting to tease Izuku a bit, but Riku interrupted those thoughts by mentioning a matter. Hey Izuku, there's some, like big yellow caterpillar that is heading your way. Izuku was confused by that but quickly said, we might want to sit and quiet down. There's someone here who has business with us, at saying that most of them quiet down but mostly because they are confused. So you noticed me and tried to calm everyone down. Not bad, shows you're more rational than I would think. All the students hear and see a man in a yellow sleeping bag in front of the door to the classroom. Once he gets out of said bag, he introduces himself as Aizawa Shota, their homeroom teacher. Is this guy for real right now? Shika asks telepathically. Riku is thinking much the same, but Izuku on the other hand has an idea on what could happen next. Now then, get your PE clothes and meet me outside. We're going to have a little test. While most of the students are confused, Izuku's suspicion is confirmed. He's going to test if those of us in this class have what it takes to be heroes, at least by the measure he wants to give. Riku sees where this is going but Chika doesn't. The Munjana boy explains that he wants to push the students to make sure they aren't just thinking this whole matter is for fun. 
These guys are trying to be heroes. That means going into danger and being put in situations that they may not be ready for. He's going to try and weed out who can't hack it. While this is happening, Izuku has changed and met with the rest of his class at the PE grounds. Alright then, for the test today we're going to be doing the standard tests for middle and high school, but a different way. Midoriya, come up here, Aizawa says before motioning to Izuku. The teacher then grabs a softball and tosses it to Izuku. You scored the highest on the entrance exam, coming in at 143 total points. Today I want you to use your quirk. No, I guess that's not right. I want you to use your abilities to their maximum today. At the mention of both his score and the correction of a quirk to abilities, Izuku's classmates are both amazed and confused. Well for most of them, Bakugo is just livid at the fact that Izuku had that high of a score, almost double his own. Izuku coughs a bit before clarifying the rules. I just can't leave the circle, right? At Aizawa's nod, Izuku smirks. While he is standing there in the circle, the rest are watching with intrigue. Chika, Izuku says and said person responds with right here Izuku. When she says that Chika appears in her white and red kimono, her tanto tucked behind her back in her obai, with her bright red hair and two fox tails flowing behind her. Almost all of the students are shocked to see the girl, but Achako and a few of the others from Izuku's exam group remember seeing her in the exam site. What is going on? I thought she was an applicant from the exam. Are a few of the statements tossed around, but Izuku has a more important matter to focus on. I want you to take this as far as you feel comfortable flying. Then blast it with as much magic as you can muster. Hold still. I'll amp you up a bit. As Izuku is saying that in handing Chika the softball, he creates a magic circle to amplify her magic. With a nod, the Kitsune girl took off at high speed. After a few seconds, she constructed her own spell and launched the ball even further. When the monitor back at the ground beeped, it came back with 3,278 meters. Before you all get up in arms about the girl. We already knew Midoriya had these types of abilities, and the girl and the boy at the site with him are part of his power. A few are confused but only one decides to react to it. Dia Kyu, Bakugo shouts before launching himself at Izuku. Aizawa is about to intervene, when Riku decides to do brutally do it instead. Izuku had been preparing to stop Bakugo's attack, but Riku caught the explosive boy's arm before he could continue with the attack. He then proceeds to pull it back and stomp on his shoulder, dislocating it. When Bakugo screams and tries to lash out with the other arm, but Riku stops it by smacking his hand with his sword before smashing the side of Bakugo's knee with a kick. When the boy is down, Riku puts his sword by the explosive boy's neck. Give me more of an excuse, you worthless piece of shit. He taunts before Izuku orders him to back down. When Chika returns and sees the matter before her, she just says not surprising that dumb animal tried to do something. He's little more than a rabid dog that should be put down. She states all of this with a cold look in her eyes. More of the students are terrified, but Izuku surprises them by chopping the two on top on the head. Enough, both of you. Unfortunately, I'm still not very good at healing magic, and neither are you right Chika. At a nod from the Kitsune girl, Izuku sighs before offering to teleport Bakugo to the nurse. Aizawa shakes his head before explaining he had response robots on standby. Normally they are here for when a student overdoes it during the tests. Didn't think I'd need it for this. You might want to explain what is going on. I'll bring Bakugo back when he's healed up, Aizawa says before postponing the tests. Izuku and his familiars face the rest of class who look like they are bursting at the seams with question. So, with a sigh, Izuku mentions that they should get comfortable before all three explain matters. To prove some more of what he can do, Izuku casts a few different spells to show the class what they believe to be impossible. So magic is real. We're so used to quirks that I'd think this is just that. A tall dark-haired girl asked Izuku. Trust us when we say magic is real. After all the two of us are yakai, Riku said with a pointed look to the rest. This makes all of the class's jaws drop. To demonstrate, Chika and Riku explain what they are before changing form a few times. When asked about what they are and how they relate to Izuku, said mage just rubs the back of his head. We're his familiars. He saved both of us and dozens of kids. It's not just because we feel like we owe him, but he gave us both some hope we had lost. Riku said while both he and Chika were looking down. A few wanted to ask what he meant, but Izuku felt they should press on a bit with other matters. So yeah, you guys have heard of Adam Garcia and Tomo, right? The interesting new investigative heroes to most of us. At an affirmative from the class, the dark-haired girl is the first to put it together. They taught you, didn't they? And the Tomo woman is also a Kitsune, isn't she? This makes the others in the class drop their jaws. But the magic members are impressed. Yeah, Garcia-san saw that I had potential and took to teaching me. I met these two in a, well, a gap world. There are places in the world where the magic we humans have either dreamt up or similar exist. Izuku went on to explain that he had already defeated a villain that was trying to take over a gap space, and that Chika and Riku had helped him. 
As he was explaining that Aizawa was bringing Bakugo back to the PE grounds, they both heard how Izuku had saved his two familiars' lives and they worked together to bring down a dangerous adversary. Shouldn't you have left the matter to Garcia-san and Tomo-san Midoriya? It was reckless of you to get involved in a matter you were not prepared for. Aizawa mirrored that thought. Before Izuku explained that he didn't have a choice, she had a spell on her that made any adults powerless against her, so only a boy or girl could defeat her. At hearing that explanation, Aizawa is more concerned than ever. But he doesn't voice these concerns right away. For now, they have tests to get back to. Alright we've wasted enough time. Back Hugo if you try that again, I will expel you. Do you understand me? Aizawa says with a flash of his eyes. This intimidates the explosive blonde, so he agrees. He then goes on to explain that Izuku has experienced the fact that the world of heroes is unforgiving. And they can't hold back or limit themselves in these cases. So, whoever doesn't put out the most for this series of tests, I will expel them. While a few are thinking that ultimatum isn't fair, they also realize he has a point. So, they all internally plan to give it their all during the tests. During the tests, Izuku keeps surprising everyone by using a variety of spells. For a few like the grip strength test, he uses the hands of Heracles to boost his strength to the point it breaks the grip tester. For the long distance run and long jump, he takes flight with his Tengu cloak and finishes the former before the rest. Bakugo on the other hand feels more and more pressure. It was bad enough that Deku has that magic bullshit to show me up, but I'm still falling short of a few others. He thought as he went up to try the long distance throw. Die. He shouted as loud as he could and let off as strong of an explosion as he could. The meter came back with 684 meters for his maximum distance. The explosive boy grits his teeth and walks away, knowing he couldn't do much more right now. For the rest of the tests, Izuku doesn't need Chika and Riku too much. Given that, the two take to sitting on the side and watching a bit. With the tests done, Aizawa tallies up the monitored number for each student. When the display shows up, Izuku is sitting at the top of the list. In second place is Yeyarazu Momo, the dark-haired girl who had figured out who taught Izuku. Todoroki Shoto is in third place, Ida Tenya in fourth place and Takoyami Fumikage in fifth place. Bakugo stared at his placement. He placed sixth out of all of his classmates. He was so accustomed to being at the top, he couldn't even process how far down he had fallen. With that done, Aizawa was up to say next. You all did what you could and pushed as best you could for right now. Mainta. He looked to the short boy who had come in last place. He even looked disappointed in himself that he was at the bottom. Your biggest problem is probably that you are much smaller than the rest of your class. You used your quirk as best you could, so you won't be expelled. For now. But don't give me a reason to remove you. Aizawa said with a flash of his eyes. With that done, Aizawa dismissed the class and said to pick up a syllabus on their desks. Once that matter was handled, a few others asked about Izuku's magic and his familiars. Is it really fair that you have two partners at all times? A redhead named Kirishima Ijiro asked. But the bird-headed student Takoyami pointed out, if you think about it, the familiars are a bit like my quirk. I have my shadow partner, so is that unfair? With that said a few acknowledged the legitimate point that he made. With classes done for the day, class 1 headed out for home. For Aizawa though, he was discussing a matter with All Might and Vlad King. All Might you should do your first class with both first year classes. They should see what Midoriya is able to do. I agree Eraser. We got a bit on what Garcia and Tamo are, but this is still new territory for us. The large, bodied blood themed hero said. All Might agree as well and decided to rework his lesson plan for this matter. When it came time for the first class of heroics, they would be in for a few surprises. With the dramatic day that was the first day of UA, a few of the students were happy that the next few days were regular classes. With Mike teaching English and Ectoplasm teaching mathematics, Midnight though had called out to Izuku to bring out his familiars for a few of the arts classes. I know they aren't actually from a different time period, but their clothing does bring that artistic idea to mind. I'd like them to model in a sense for some drawings, both in human form and their yakai forms please, she said with a smile on her face. Chika was uncomfortable around midnight but Riku was willing to go along. This fact was noted by quite a few of the girls, as well as mentioning that she didn't seem comfortable around any of the other girls. But when they asked Izuku and Riku about it they just said, it's not our story to tell. She'll come around in time. But let's just say more women have hurt her than any man could. All of the students were confused by that. But Ida is quick to come in and say, not everyone may be comfortable revealing their past. You just need to give them time. With that the matter was dropped, and both boys told Ida thank you quietly. But that wasn't the most important thing for the student on their fourth day of class, because today was the Heroics 101 class, and just as they were all wondering what would happen, they heard a booming laugh as they were sitting in class. I am, coming through the door gum. 
just as All Might was bursting into the room with gusto and bravado. His face suddenly impacted an invisible wall, and he backflipped into the air. Amigo, you need to lay off the spectacle when it comes to this, Adam says while holding out his hand with a magic circle surrounding it. Tomo on the other hand is tittering behind her partner. Once All Might has regained his composure, he stands and gives the rundown of what he and the mystic duo are there for. As you may have surmised students, I am your new Heroics 101 instructor, and the two next to me will be instructing in a few other ways. From hand-to-hand -hand drills to Adam instructing on investigating a case or location to track a villain, or even solving murder in similar cases. Back Hugo is quick to voice his own opinion saying that type of work is pointless for a hero. We're here to beat down villains. Investigating is stupid police work. Adam gets an angry look and then tells Katsuki that he has already failed for the day. When most of the students stand up against this, Adam pushes them down with a snap of his fingers. Don't forget, this school has a lot of freedom on the campus. We can do what we want to make our points. If you think that one piece of the work we do is pointless, you can opt out for it. Just know it will go on to be a failure for you. He says this with a cold look in his eyes. This intimidates most of the students and Bakugo is already reeling at the thought that he failed. But All Might comes in next to alleviate the situation. Easy there Adam. There is a difference between what I am having the students do today and what you may be planning. For now, we are going into battle trials. He went on to explain that they would be working with Class 1B the Sister Heroics class, and that they will be competing together. But before that comes, looking like a hero, as he was saying that he pushes a button, and the wall opens to show the suitcases with the hero course students' costumes inside. He then tells all of them to meet at Ground Beta once they had changed. When Izuku arrived at the grounds with his costume, most were curious about a few of the details. The basic jumpsuit had been made by his mother and enhanced by both his magic and the support department. He wore pants that had extra pockets on the sides, which contained a variety of talismans and other pieces to quick cast magic. But just like his mentor, he had taken to wearing a lightweight trench coat as well. Though said coat also had his camouflage Tengu wings over it, as well as more spells of protection and other quick cast options. Well don't you all look cool? Definitely look like heroes, but looking the part is only half of what is needed. Next comes the foundations of what it means to be a hero, Tamo said with her kimono draping in its usual fashion. A fact that had some of the teenage students looking at her wide-eyed, the boys for arousal, and some of the girls for envy. Even Momo and Kendo were feeling small in comparison. Adam noticed this and facepalmed, before saying they needed to move on. All Might then gave the description of what the scenario was the groups would be working with. Teams of two would be chosen at random, with one team playing the hero and the other playing the villain. You have 15 minutes to fulfill your objective. For the heroes, capture the weapon or the villains in the allotted time. And for the villains, capture the heroes or stall long enough for time to run out. With that said, the teams were chosen by lots, with Juzo noting that it made sense for heroes as they often had to make impromptu teams of to fight. And the teams were as follows. Team A, Midoriya Izuku and Achako Yuraraka Team B, Ida Tenya and Bakugo Katsuki Team C, Inagi Ryaiko and Kodai Yui Team D, Todoroki Shoto and Mizo Shoji Team E, Hagakir Toru and Shazaki Ibarra Team F, Tetsu 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 and Kota Koji Team G, Mono Manito and Minda Minoru Team H, Suburaba Kosai and Takage Satsuna Team I, Komori Kanoko and Awase Yosu Team J, Ayama Yuga and Ashido Mina Team K, Kirishima Ijiro and Fukudashi Manga Team L, Bondo Kajiro and Rin Huryu Team M, Suno Tori Pony and Ajiro Mashiro Team N, Kaminari Denki and Jairo Kayoka Team O, Asuitsuyu and Honnuki Juzo Team P, Shota Nironjiki and Kirwaro Shihai. Team Q, Kamakiri Tagaru and Siro Hanada Team R, Yayarazu Momo and Kaibara Sen Team S, Shishida Jirota and Takoyami Fumikage Team T, Sato Rikido and Kendo Itsuka with the initial team set, All Might decided to drop the plan for the rest of the exercise. While normally I would keep to this pattern, I'm changing a few things up. Young Midoriya, you will actually be facing off against your teammate that was chosen, as well as the other team. You have the power of your familiars, and I would like to see how you plan and fight with them in this situation. Adam nodded seeing his point. Tama was a bit annoyed at the plan and voices her own objection. How exactly is this fair? And what if he didn't have two familiars? Would you still make him do this? Honestly probably not. But I do have a bigger point to this. I know Izuku and his familiars have to be in sync in most cases. And that is something needed for all heroes who team up with one another. I want him to demonstrate this to the rest. All Might says to defend his plan. Tamo still doesn't like it, but she knows she is outvoted. With that, the two teams head for their designated battleground. Bet you were hoping to work with Achako again eh Izuku? Riku asked teasingly. Izuku just sighed, before admitting that he was disappointed. But I do see All Might's point. If the mortal woman that Garcia-san and Tamo were hunting for is here, then other heroes need a better idea of what mages can do. 
Chika agrees before mentioning they need a plan. Izuku has an idea on how things will play out and gives the roles he has in mind to each familiar. With a nod they are all set. Bakugo on the other hand is feeling like this is his chance to beat all three of them. Ida mentions though that, I'm not sure you could hurt or beat them to a point anyway. Two of our opponents are Yakai after all. We don't know much about how they operate, and Midoriya already has practical experience. Screw that. All that matters is power at the end of the day. I'll beat all of you and show how strong I am. Bakugo claims loudly before heading off to the lower floors. His teammates though shake their heads and stand by to protect the bomb. When he gets to the lower floors, he hears someone walking and prepares for his sneak attack. Right when he thinks they are close, he unleashes the best blast he can. But he strikes nothing but air. He then gets kicked in the back of head before his leg is grabbed and he is slammed into the wall. After he has recovered, he looks up and sees. Deku. This aggravates him more and he starts to spout about how much stronger he is. Until Izuku interrupts him with a quick painful combo that sends him flying again. After he has recovered, Bakugo blasts forward and tries to strike at Izuku with a big swing. But this is not only countered, but Izuku breaks Bakugo's right arm. As the explosive fool is screaming, Izuku runs off, presumably to look for the weapon. Meanwhile with the weapon, Ida is trying to get into the mindset for this battle, and Achako is just laughing at him being a dork. Bakugo gets back up and tries to go after Izuku again, but he knows he can't use his quirk to its fullest. Damn it, he broke my arm so I would have half as much power. This isn't how heroes fight. They're supposed to show off their greatness with their quirks, make it as big of a spectacle as possible. He's fighting like, I don't even know what. As Bakugo is finishing this thought, he has spotted Izuku in another room. He decides to use his ace. If the nerds made my suit right, then all the sweat I've built up will be in this grenade. I'll finish this now. He uses a bit of cloth tied around the pin on his left grenade to pull it, with a manic smile on his face. Izuku though looks incredibly calm and lets out a slightly annoyed sigh. This incises Bakugo more and he shouts, don't look down on me. As he pulls the pin, Izuku tosses a charm into the air. At that, the explosion completely disappears. Bakugo is dumbfounded, but then feels a heat coming from his side. He turns and sees a talisman floating in the air, and then the same explosion he unleashed engulfs the Bakuhatsu Bakamano, sending him into a wall and breaking most of his bones. Izuku then walks over to him, with a shimmer dissipating around him. This was not Izuku but Riku who then ties the capture tape around the broken fool's arms. While up above, Izuku and Chika have burst through the window where the weapon was located, with Chika binding both Achako and Ida, while Izuku touched the weapon. With that done the exercise is called, and medic bots come to take Bakugo to Recovery Girl. As he is going though, he thinks, he didn't even need to put out. Hell, Deku wasn't even here, and I got stomped. If we had fought, would I have been able to do anything at all? In the observation room a few people ask what was going on with the match. I chose to take advantage of a few different factors. 1. I knew Bakugo would be looking to fight me. So, I had Riku face him. The Mungia boy then mentions that not only can he shapeshift, but I can move through walls, let alone my stronger senses. I could smell that asshole coming from the second floor. Izuku's second point is that both he and Chika could fly, making it the better option for this situation. Most assume that an opponent would use the same routes they did meaning they wouldn't look out of a window for a possible breach. Chika then finishes his last point by noting that they didn't fight using complicated spells or super blasts for the most part. Most of the damage came from that idiot trying to blow up Riku. We just used his stupidity against him. All Might and the other teacher nod respecting the way the three fought, as well as, you were all perfectly coordinated in how you would go about the mission at hand. De Akuido Amigo. This is how you all need to learn to not only fight but operate if you intend to follow this path. Adam says with a nod to his student. Tomo though is quite happy that they not only won and came out unscathed, but that they showed up the biggest bully in Izuku's life, and completely destroyed his pride. With that match out of the way, the rest continue. During each match, the students show their own varieties of teamwork or conflict with each other. By the time classes let out, a few from each class have either gained a new respect or friend or have more of a reason to dislike one another. For Izuku though he is wondering if he should try to help Bakugo. I wouldn't man. But that's just my two cents. Or I guess 100 yen Adam says with a laugh. Tomo then says, I think that boy needs this in more than one way. He needs to realize his obsession with power or powers will lead him to ruin. And if you try to help him, he won't respond kindly. If anything, maybe talk to him tomorrow. Izuku is a bit pained to leave the matter at that. So, he just catches Katsuki as he is coming out of the infirmary. I'm not going to rub this win in your face, or say you are an idiot or anything like that. You've more than likely been doing that in your own mind while you've been in the infirmary. With a tongue click from Bakugo and him turning away, Izuku knows he's right. The green-haired boy sighs before saying, This isn't some bull about winning or losing Katsuki. 
Not everything will boil down to the fights you see on the news. Some battles are all about tipping the odds in your favor, without using powers of any kind. Bakugo grits his teeth and the look on his face makes it seem like he's about to lash out at Izuku. But at the last second, he lets out a frustrated breath before saying, I'm starting to see that. I guess you knew it better since you've done some serious hero work already. Meanwhile, I've just been thinking I would still be the best here after what everyone said in Aldera. But this is my starting line. I'll catch up to you and the others, and then I'll surpass you all. Izuku just smirks before mentioning that he is more than welcome to try. The day after the battle trials, all of the students were comparing what they saw and had done against each other. While most were intimidated by Izuku and his familiar's teamwork, they were also impressed and tried to emulate it in their own battles. With varying success, those paired with their classmates seemed to do well all together, like Kodai and Yanagi. Some like Tsunotori and Ajiro worked well mixing their long-range and close-range potential. Others were able to match each other's rhythm and style, like Sato and Itsuka. But others wound up just butting heads, like Minda and Monoma who couldn't come up with a decent strategy to fight, or Kamakiri and Siro, whose powers messed with each other enough that they quickly failed the challenge. But some of the students could get a redemption in the next day's class. But first each class had their own new objective. You have to pick a class president, Aizawa said after going over a few of the battles. While everyone was quick to nominate themselves, Ida quickly put a stop to it with his own presence. We should hold an election. We may not know each other that well, but what if anyone votes for more than one person then that means they have made a substantial impact on the group as a whole. Most agreed with his point, and ballots were passed out. Izuku thought about how Ida had taken the lead on the situation and quickly put together a plan and organization for this matter. So, he knew who he was voting for. When it was done, Momo and Ida had tied with two votes each. They stood at the front as the potential class leads, and were about to cast another ballot when some others put their own thoughts in. I know we technically aren't students, but maybe we could have a say too. The disembodied voice of Chika spoke up. Then both of Izuku's familiars popped into existence, and while some would claim that they would vote for Izuku, Riku was quick to point out a factor to this. That's why he had us stay out of it at first. He knew we'd be biased and felt that the initial decision shouldn't be made by us. But since it's a tie we can act as tie breakers. Ida and Momo bow to the wisdom of both of Izuku's familiars and wait for their answers. Riku has no problem with saying his own thoughts with, I think Ida's the better one for this whole thing. You took command of the situation today. And yeah that isn't a hero thing per se. It shows you know how to lead to a point. Let alone how you tried, though failed, to reign in the rabid yapping dog that is Bekugo. And while said angry Pomeranian is about to start shouting, Chika snaps her fingers, and a metal gag wraps itself around Bakugo's mouth. She then stands and agrees with Riku's assessment, then pointing out that Momo had struggled a bit during her battle trail. You came up with a decent plan and tried to work with your partner, but you fell short in the handling the unpredictability of your opponent. Momo thought back and remembered how Mina had slid around and passed all of the traps she had laid. And Ayama not only blasted down a wall to let Mina in but kept Sen busy by making sure he couldn't get close to either opponent. When Gyro pointed out that Ida was in the same place from facing their team, Chika brought up a different detail. We don't exactly play on the same level. Izuku knew how Bakugo would react given their history, and I knew where the objective was due to my divination. From there we built the plan of facing off with our opponents. Plus, we were in constant telepathic contact, so we always knew what was going on. The rest of the students were shocked but did see her point, as well as wondering if they can do that for anyone. With the familiar's opinions given, everyone agreed that Ida would be the class rep and Momo would be his vice. Right after this though, Adam and Tamil walked in to announce that they had a special class for the students today. We'll be doing an interesting class today. Meet us in ground beta. You'll see what we mean, Adam said with a smile that made a few from both classes uneasy. Adam had convinced Nezu that after the class elections were done, they would have an impromptu class for the rest of the day. After describing what he had in mind, Nezu's smile grew and promptly agreed. The overseers would be testing not just the students in terms of teamwork and investigation skills, but also in relating to the public to a point, a factor they normally don't cover till later in the year. But this could throw those who have advice from older students off and teach the young heroes how to adapt. As the students were walking into the training ground, they suddenly felt a tremor and saw a terrifying sight before them. There were destroyed buildings everywhere, smoke coming from some of them, and the cries of civilians rang out. Strewn across the roads were the bodies of some of those civilians, some injured, some dead, some dying. Seeing this terrifying sight made all of the students freeze up, but a few were quick to break out of the train wreck watching and jump into action. Momo creating medkits and other first aid equipment. 
Ida gathering up the stronger bodied students and leading to the debris points, Juzo catching Shoji, Satsuna, and Jiro to get their aid and reconnaissance, and Itsuka coordinating with Ida on security and protection of possible injury. One who didn't do anything though was Izuku. While this is normally counter to his nature, he knows something is up. So that's it. Just when Bakugo and Ida are shouting at Izuku to hurry up, the green-haired hero just smiles. He then creates a magic circle in his hand, before sending it skywards. Then at the highest point, he snaps his fingers, and a wave of magic reverberates around the area. The debris fields go away, the smoke vanishes, the injured civilians vanish, and the training area is eerily silent. Interesting way to introduce us to your widespread illusion spells, Tomo-san. Izuku says while said woman appears with a smirk. While this is happening, Ida and the rest are still processing what just happened and where all the damage disappeared to. Adam then floats down from on top of a building with a laugh before saying, That was something of a two-fold lesson for all of you. Ida, Juzo, Kendo, Yeyurazu. You four get extra credit for today. As do you Izuku. But not as much. You figured out the whole thing was an illusion meant to test their reactions and will. With the first year classes gathered up, Adam and Tomo explained some of what was going on. I used my illusion spell to create a scenario of a major disaster. I wanted to see how you all would react. Luckily, a few of you took command and sought to start helping people. But that isn't all we'll be testing you on today. Adam, Tomo explains and then passes the explanation to her partner. With a nod, the human member claps his hands and brings up a series of images. Assault cases, rape, murder, smuggling. All of these cases you will have to be involved in. But you don't know the first thing about investigating said cases. We'll be separating you all into groups of 10 and we'll be given cases to investigate. At each location is an illusion point, to make the exercise feel more real, without putting anyone in danger. A few chuckles ring out and the teams are chosen with a similar method to the battle trials. Adam creates a set of cards with students' names on them and then shuffles the deck. When that is done, he sets the cards in four different stacks. With it done the teams are as follows. Team A, Midoriya Izuku, Yuraka Achako, Yanagi Riaiko, Mizo Shoji, Kamori Kanoko, Ashido Mina, Ajiro Mashiro, Asui Tsuyu, Shishida Jirota, and Sato Rikido. Team B, Ida Tenya, Bekugo Katsuki, Kodai Yui, Hagakir Toru, Tetsu 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 Tetsu, Minda Minoru, Takaj Satsuna, Fukudashi Mang, Sunotori Pony and Jiro Kayoka Team C, Shizaki Ibarra, Mano Manito, Kirishima Ijiro, Rin Huryu, Kaminari Denki, Eiyurazu Momo, Takoyami Fumikage, Kendo Itsuka, Shota Nironjiki and Kirwaro Shihai Team D, Kaibara Sen, Todoroki Shoto, Kota Koji, Tsuburaba Kosai, Awase Yosu, Ayama Yuga, Bondo Kajiro, Honuki Juzo, Kamakiri Tagaru and Siro Hanada with the team set, Tamo gave each group a position locator with a map. These will take you to the points in the city where we have scenarios set up. The types of crimes will vary, and we will be monitoring each group. It is not necessary that you choose a leader right away, but be ready for whenever you need to step up, the Kitsune woman says to the students. Adam then steps forward with his own point. Don't just think of these exercises from just to find the villain or criminal or whatever. Look at all of the problems involved. Well what are you waiting for? Vimanos, he says with a quick wave to tell them to go. Each of the team's objective were set in corners far from one another, so they could not interact and compare. When Izuku and his team reached their assigned point, they didn't see anything out of the ordinary, until the step next to the building they were to investigate. As soon as they did, the area changed with police and others gathered around the area. While most of the team were surprised, Izuku and Shishida took the matter in stride. Officer, what is the situation? Shishida asked at the front of the building. Said illusionary officer, saluted before escorting the heroes to the scene. From what we've found so far, this appears to be an open-shut break-in and murder case. However, the victim was killed due to a quirk and was a former hero. That's why we called you other heroes in. A few of the students nod, seeing the better reason for this investigation. Most officers can't use their quirks or most likely wouldn't have a quirk suited to this type of investigation. Achako, Mina and Kanoko though are somewhat confused. Quietly Kanoko asks Shishida. What is the point to this? I don't get it. We're just supposed to fight villains, right? No, this is to create a profile for dangerous entities that we may not be engaged by right away. Remember what All Might talked about yesterday. How most villain acts are carried out behind the scenes. We're all too accustomed to the idea of villains attacking us outright. But if they are targeting specific individuals, then we have to stop them by protecting said individuals. Pachako and Mina were listening in, but they still didn't get what he was talking about. And neither did Kanoko. When they reached the illusionary penthouse, they were assigned to investigate, they could see the damage all around. There were burn marks on the walls, large portions of the floor had been smashed, and the main windows had been shattered. The victim in question lay crumpled in the middle of the floor. 
Izuku and Shishida took the lead again by assigning tasks. Suyu, Achako and Kanoko were asked by Izuku to check the other rooms in the penthouse for damage. Shishida had chosen to ask the officers more about what was found. Riaiko, Ajiro and Mina worked together to check some of the upper damage spots to and get some samples, mainly by Riaiko lifting Mina up and Ajiro using his tail to hold himself up on the walls. At first Sato and Shoji were lifting up a few of the ruined pieces of the floor and furniture to see if anything was left. But that was until Izuku heard someone cry out. Dad, what happened? Sato, Shoji, Riku, all of you help the officers to keep that person out of here. We can't have them in here right now. Maybe get a statement from them. Izuku ordered. The hero students were a bit off put by the abruptness, but Riku quickly obeyed, grabbing the two larger boys to pull them to the door. Once there, they saw a young man with similar features to the victim. Shoji put it together what Izuku was thinking on this matter and worked with Riku to calm the young man down. Sato didn't understand right away, but he did see some of what all involved were getting at, and since he wasn't sure on the best questions to ask, he instead opted for staying at the door and making sure no one else could get in unless authorized. Izuku in the investigation site had called out Chika as well. She was using a few spells to try and recreate the possible scene and attacks, were missing a few other details. She said after a few minutes. Izuku hummed a bit then he called for Shoji again. I got the statement. The guy in question is the son of the victim. He was out working apparently and didn't get back till late. He seems more comfortable with Sato and Riku, so he might tell them more. As long as he doesn't try to break in. What did you need? Shoji asked after giving a report. Izuku nodded and brought up a base illusion within the illusion to show what he was doing. We've been recreating the scene, but we need more details. And I think your sharp eyes, ears and nose might be what we need, Izuku says before explaining more. He wanted Shoji to duplicate enough points to smell and see other details they might have all missed. The larger boy nods and gets to work. It doesn't take long before he spots some tiny bullet impacts, as well as finding bullet impacts on the victim. The impacts were so small that it would be almost impossible to spot right away. Mina and Riaiko then bring something else as a clue to the matter. The burn marks aren't fully from a quirk, or rather, it isn't from this guy's quirk. Shishida said that the victim had a strength-boosting quirk, so, the flame impacts couldn't be from him. Kinoko then comes from the other rooms and reports a strange matter. The closet is almost completely untouched. Even the safe inside wasn't harmed. Just the doors busted off. But the bed and some of the other furniture was demolished. Then that doesn't add up with this being a robbery or burglary attempt gone wrong. Whoever did this was after something else. Sato, thought a sec. Shoji you should cover the door with Riku for a bit. Izuku says and asks Sato what he could learn just talking with the son of the victim. He didn't have much to say. Had a hard time believing his dad was dead obviously. He mentioned that his dad had a lot of big investments and made a lot of money from similar. You think that could have something to do with it? Izuku and Shishida think over the matter a few times but still can't come up with an answer. But then Achako brings up something else. Hey aren't these impact marks too big? Like I know the victim had a strength enhancing power. But even with that the impacts are too large, aren't they? This gets the two leaders eyes to widen and they take some measurements. They conclude that Achako is correct and that this may be more relevant than the rest thought. Riku then talks to Izuku's mind and mentions something that the son said in passing, that the victim had been seeing a woman for the first time since his mother had passed. This gets Izuku's eyes to widen again and he tells Chika to help him with a special spell. The two cast their magic on the broken glass and rewind it. While some of it was outside the window, the rewind spell showed a different matter. The glass had been shot through. Izuku hums a bit more and confirms with Shishida on the likely scenario. Okay so what we could be looking at here might just be a hit. Someone wanted the victim dead and did everything they could to make it happen. The woman he had been seeing is a possible assailant, and she had backup in the form of two others, and sized up one in the closest, and from the outside, one who could shoot tiny but deadly shots from across the street. Shishida explains, before Izuku takes over, he explains that the flame marks could have been from the woman and would explain why the bed was destroyed, given that she might have attacked while hum in the middle or at the end of well sex izuku says with a blush but the initial attack failed so the big villain came in next and tried to take him out as well and when that failed the shooter used his power to finish the job most likely catching him off guard with as small as the impacts and shots are they wouldn't make much of a sound and even when the glass broke it fell down rather than be scattered from an explosion or big impacts izuku says before showing the scenario with magic with this set and at least a few profiles of the people responsible the exercise is called complete by the magic setup, and the illusion dissipates. With that, Tima gets an announcement that they had passed the trial and that they could head back to the observation room. Suddenly though, an alarm rings out across the entire campus. It takes about 10 minutes before the alarms stop, but the class for the day has to be called. Back in the observation room, a brief rundown is given. 
Team A had fully completed their assigned case and passed with full marks. Team D was not far behind them and finished roughly the same time. Their case was an actual robbery and series of break-ins around the area they were investigating. Team C hadn't quite solved their case, but they were close. It was apparently a double homicide, and they had figured out who had been the initial killer. But they faltered at building the profile of the other killer. Team B though could not solve their case before time was called and had a bigger problem with their simulated arson case, primarily in the form of Beck Hugo. He was so belligerent in dealing with the public and others, let alone just looking for something to attack, that he had to be restrained by Minta of all people. They also ran into the problem of not many of their quirks could be used to help with the investigation. With that done, Adam dismisses the students for the day. After the students have left, he and Tom will go to meet the other teachers, at a point where the wall to the school had been destroyed. Look like we've got some bigger problems on the way. Nazu agrees with the kids soon by saying, This was a declaration of war. I hope we and the students are ready. The day after the joint investigation activities, the hero course students were asked to stay later than the rest, the freshman class primarily. They were brought into an auditorium to discuss some of where they faltered or succeeded in their investigation. Now then, teams and D well done in the research on the cases we created. Also well done in handling the press and family of the victim. Team C you did well on making the profile of the first killer, but you need to be open to the idea that there could be more people involved. In fact, there were three other killers associated with the case we created for you. Team B. Well you just had the problem of having to deal with a worthless belligerent asshole who probably has no right at all for being here. Adam said with a smirk toward an angry back Hugo. As he was starting into descriptions of more of what went wrong, a cell phone goes off in his pocket. Not his usual smartphone, but a flip burner phone. HM. Tomo take over for a minute. I've gotta take this, he says with a severe look. The Kitsune woman nods and starts to discuss how they all need to think more critically about an investigation and villains involved. Adam though is talking with a contact from China, and they have something grave to report. Western China. Xinjiang. You sure it's her? When did she? Okay, we'll be there within a day. Anything else? A manner. Hmm, okay. We'll see you soon. As Adam is finishing up his call Tomo is answering a few of the questions from the students, but the human overseer is quick to stop her. Tama we gotta go. Nezu I'm sorry sir but this takes precedence. Morta was spotted in China. We have to go. Adam says quietly as he pulls two talismans out of his duster coat. Tamo's eyes wide and she quickly summons her tanto and a collapsible najinata to put on her back. Nezu nods in understanding. As he sees Adam cast a spell with the talismans he brought out. The talismans then turn into copies of himself and Tamo. I'm sorry students. We have an urgent matter that requires our attention. These paper clones have roughly our level intelligence and should be able to answer your questions. No Izuku you are not coming along this time. Adam says with a pointed look to the teen overseer. Who had started to stand. And while Izuku wanted to argue. Tamo was quick to stop him by pointing out he was still learning himself. Leave this to us. We don't know for sure what she is up to. This could just be a misdirect. Tamo says while Adam creates a portal to the office in Zining. With a nod the two head out. Once they had left, the students continued to ask questions of the apparitions that the overseers had left behind. After the lecture was done though, all of the students were looking forward to going home for the day. However, they could not leave at the moment. A typhoon had rolled in and was stopping all traffic in Mustafa City. Well, that figures. Ah oh well, maybe we can do some practice here Izuku. Riku said as they were walking through the hallways. Just as Izuku was answering, Minda called out to him. Hey Midoriya, can we talk for a second? While a bit confused on what the resident pervert of Class 1 wanted, Izuku wasn't going to be rude about the matter. When Minda pulled him aside, he told Izuku about the main reasons he wanted to discuss with him. The first was obviously asking some questions about Tamo and Chika, and what they might have looked like naked. Izuku was quick to blast the pervert for that, while also trying not to think about the times Tamo had teased him in the bath spaces she had created. After Minda had shaken off the magic blast he brought up his second point. Do you think you could help me with improving my potential as a hero? I've figured out a few ways to use my quirk, but well, I'm just not sure on if I have the best potential for it. But I still want to be a cool hero for others, Minda says with a slightly sheepish look on his face. Izuku sighs before saying, I'll help but you've gotta work on some of the perverted crap on your own man. As for applications, do you have a way for launching those pop-off balls other than throwing them? Minda smiles before explaining a bit more of how his quirk works and how he can bounce off of the balls he throws. While the young overseer and resident pervert are getting acquainted, Momo had gone to the library to return some books she had borrowed. As she was walking back though she thought she felt a presence behind her. Hello, is anyone there? Minda, this isn't funny. She says as she keeps feeling and slightly hearing a presence around her. After a minute, she doesn't hear or see anything, so she goes on her way. Only to be attacked from the stairwell by a flying beast. 
She lets out a scream, but only Izuku and Minda are close by. You heard that right. We have to go see what's wrong. Izuku says before running off. Minda only slightly disagrees in his mind, but he also noted that the scream sounded feminine, so maybe he could be a hero to a girl alongside Izuku. When they reach the hallway in question, they see Momo on the ground, looking as if the life has been drained from her. What happened to Yehirazu? The thing that did it isn't still here right. Calm down Minta. Or maybe not. She was attacked by a vampire. Izuku says after inspecting Momo's eyes. Wait how do you know? You're checking her eyes not her neck. Not that kind of vampire. A Kangshi. Different type and style of vampire. When Minda asks if it is the same ones that hop around and have tags on their faces, Izuku tells him it is different. That is a Jiangshi. A lot more weaknesses to that monster. The Kangshi is from western China and floats around instead of hopping. He goes on to say that it drains the Kai or life force of its victims to strengthen itself and turn others into their slaves. While Minda has a perverted thought about Momo being a different kind of slave, he snaps out of it enough to ask how they can stop it. Izuku looks back and forth between Minda and Momo before sighing and muttering a sorry to the girl. Come here. I only learned this spell recently but I'm gonna need a Kai donor to save her. And you are unfortunately the only option. When Minda is about to retort about being the only option, Riku pushes him closer to Izuku. He then places his hand on Minda's head before touching Momo's. The short pervert's eyes widen, and a stream of his kai flows out towards Momo, who then groans before shaking her head and trying to stand. Phew, glad we got here in time. How are you feeling? Izuku asks the disoriented girl, who then replies with, I'm good Midoriya. Hmm, you know I never noticed how cute you look, though I gotta wonder what kind of package you've got down there. The tall onyx-haired girl says this with an aroused gleam in her eyes and she looks Izuku over, focusing a bit on his crotch and starting to reach for it. Okay, I'm starting to regret using your Kai Minta. This is gonna get extra weird fast. Izuku says while covering his crotch and backing away. Said short pervert is both aroused by this new side that he gave to Momo and disturbed at it. Is this what I'm like? Maybe I do need some help. The purple pervert thinks to himself while helping pull Momo away from Izuku. Once Momo's new perverted side has been reined in. Izuku asks what the creature that attacked her looked like. Well, it was a man or male figure. Somewhat emaciated though, not much muscle at all. And I can't even imagine that he had much to work with downstairs. Probably completely shriveled up. Momo says cupping her chin. Both boys' eyes twitch at the latter half but move on. Izuku mentions. Yeah well after draining you, he'll be feeling a lot better. And he's getting stronger. Hopefully he's the only one. But what is it doing her in the first place Midoriya? Minda asks as the group walks to the teacher's lounge. Izuku had called out Chika and Riku to help with protection as they were walking. My guess that call that Garcia-san and Tamo-san got was a red herring to lure them away. They're used to dealing with dangerous monsters, and quirks are somewhat useless against magic beings. I can attest to that. I sparred with All Might off and on while we were here, and while I often get knocked around, I can recover a lot faster than all of you can, Riku says while watching the rear with his sword drawn. Izuku then tells them a simple quote to deal with these strange beings. Magic must defeat magic, explaining that those who can use or direct magic are the only ones who stop other entities of magic. As he is finishing his explanation, Izuku feels a chill up his spine. Yay Arazu stop staring at my butt please. Oh, sorry Midoriya. Hey if you were so worried about how mixing mind is Kai with me, why didn't you use your familiars? Momo asks. Riku and Chika also questioned that factor as well. Izuku just sighs before saying. I don't know what the side effects could be. It would be mixing Yakai Kai with human Kai. It could result in you turning into a Yakai yourself Yeyarazu. Or it may revert you back to a normal human and take your quirk away. Or it could make it run out of control. I'd rather not take the risk. And I didn't use mine because that would be something of a last resort. The group nods a bit seeing the reasoning behind the choice. At the teacher's lounge they explain the situation to Aizawa and Midnight. Though they are both distracted by Momo's new behavior. Especially the fact she keeps eyeing up Kansei Kajiro, Aka Vlad King. Okay what is with your student here eraser? And, hey hands off young lady. Sorry Vlad sensei. This is somewhat my fault. I had to transfer some Kai from Minda to Yeirazu. So, she unfortunately has some of his personality right now. At that all of the teachers look toward Minda with disgust. And he tries to defend himself by saying he doesn't go as far as Momo has. Also, after seeing the way she acts. Well I'm thinking on talking with Hound Dog Sensei. Maybe I can get some help with this mentality. Minda says while looking down sheepishly. Aizawa just sighs before saying they will gather up anyone who is still in the building and meet at one of the gyms. We can't leave as is thanks to the typhoon. So, we'll have to be careful. The three students nod and make some calls to the rest of their class. It takes about 10 minutes for all of the people who are still at UA to arrive. There is only one missing. Has anyone gotten a hold of All Might? Mezu asks while waiting in the gym. Izuku has a bad feeling. 
and it is compounded with a knock at the gym door. The doors swing open and everyone sees the towering form of All Might. I am here, he proclaims, and while the students are excited Izuku knows something is off, and it is confirmed when his next shout is, to drain your kai. This shocks everyone and a few of the teachers try to stop the enslaved All Might, but they each fail. Todoroki and Bakugo also try to stop All Might but he just backhands both of them into walls, knocking them unconscious. Riku, slow him down for a second. I can stop him, Izuku says while pulling out some parchment. He writes a quick spell on the paper and uses his Tengu wings to fly in close to attach the paper to All Might's forehead. Once it is done, All Might stops completely. With a deep breath of relief, Izuku explains what has happened to the symbol of peace. Looks like the Kang she got to him. He's stuck as a slave to them until I can cast a counter spell. But the tag on his face will keep him immobilized. Aizawa, having shaken off getting knocked around by Vamp Might, takes a closer look at the now frozen form of the blonde hero. And right as Izuku is about to warn him, All Might shouts, you are doomed. This of course scares Aizawa and a few of the others near him almost senseless. Yeah, I was trying to warn you. He can still talk, but at least he won't be attacking any of us with that on his face. My lady and her brothers will feast on all of your kai. And when the day is done there will be no one to stop their reign. All Might proclaims while frozen in place. While he was expositing, Chika and Izuku created a circle around him to make sure they wouldn't be able to free the enslaved hero. Well, that's just great. We've got at least three Kai vampires to deal with, but at least they won't have their greatest weapon to restrain all of us now. Chika here, just in case I get grabbed too. Izuku hands a notebook he pulled from behind himself to show Chika the spell to transfer Kai. The Kitsune girl nods and takes time to read the spell. With a sigh Izuku tells everyone what they need to do next. Listen we have to find all of the vampires. And then. Okay this will sound weird. But we need their left socks. Ida. When there is a break in the storm. Run to the graveyard and find a few toadstools. Shika and I can cast a spell that will undo the stealing of everyone's kai. When that is done. We should be able to. Geyarazu. Stop doing touching my ass. While everyone raised their eyebrows at the mention of stealing the left socks. They knew that Izuku would be about the only one who had a clue on what they were dealing with. Though quite a few blushed profusely at seeing Momo feeling up Izuku's backside. What happened to Yamomo? Momo? Mina asks with her cheeks still tinged purple. Since Izuku is dealing with a pervy Momo who is also checking out some of the other guys, Minda decides to explain. Yeyarazu was one of the first victims we found. Midoriya didn't want to use his familiar's kai since it could have side effects. So, he was stuck using my kai. And trust me I know how bad it looks given how she is acting. I'm gonna work on a few things when this is all over, he says with his hands raised in defense. After finally getting Momo to calm down, Izuku tells that they need to divide up into teams. Two teams with him and Chika split between them. If you do see the Kangshi, don't breathe. Hold your breath until it leaves. At this stage they shouldn't be able to see anyone. But the more Kai they consume the stronger and more dangerous they become. With a nod a few of the teams are set. Izuku, Achako, Momo, Bekugo, Tetsu Tetsu, Jiro, Aizawa, Itsuka, Jirota, Yui, and Bondo all team up to check the northern half of the school. With Chika, Todoroki, Mina, Kirishima, Shoji, Minda, Ida, Midnight, Toru, Setsuna, and Pony taking the south side of the school. Just before we all head out, these things aren't like western vampires, and they aren't the Jiangxi. They are an older type from the western regions of China. So, the weaknesses aren't quite the same. As Izuku is saying this he hands out a few paper talismans to help all of them. While Bakugo scoffs at using them, the severe look in his eyes is enough to tell him to keep the parchments. As they are walking through the halls, Ida and Itsuka have to keep an eye on the resident pervert and currently modified pervert. This changes when the second group happens to see the vampire lady. Though still slightly emaciated, she still cuts an attractive figure and Minda can't help but gasp at the sight, especially since she isn't wearing much over her chest. This gets him grabbed, but he gets saved before his kai is stolen by Satsuna headbutting the female vampire. But they don't expect to see the more emaciated second brother of the female Kangsh. This one does drain his kai, and he is left to turn. But the charms Izuku gave some of them make the vampires run off. But not before Pony pins the female and they get her sock off. Guess I have to save him, right? Chika asks, before asking for volunteers. Kirishima come up and offers his kai. I wouldn't call myself a man if I didn't help him out. He says with a straightforward look. Chika nods and puts her hand on his head to begin the transfusion. This should work but it is my first time trying this. Chika says while still reading from the book Izuku gave her. With Kirishima's eyes widening. A trail of his kai shoots out and goes toward Minda. Oh good. It worked. Chika says when Minda starts to stir. With a cough and a shake of his head the purple haired boy awakens. Hey thanks for that Chika. Talk about a failing as a man moment huh? Well, I'll just have to make sure I get a good shot on the jerk who did that to me. 
he says with a confident smile akin to Kirishima's. The whole group is confused by the change in the resident pervert of one a way of speaking. But the girls aren't complaining since it seems like he isn't focusing on them as much. Izuku, we got hit on our side. But we did get one left sock. How's it coming on your side? Shika communicates to Izuku telepathically. We got the sock at least but Katsuki was drained as well. That means we've got at least one Kangshi with the ability to see. The young guard. Izuku reports back. With a sigh, he tells the rest to stand guard while he does the transfusion spell. Don't you need a volunteer Izuku? Achako asks while keeping an eye on their surroundings. The young overseer shakes his head before saying, I prefer using someone else's Kai, but I need you all to keep an eye out. I can handle this. With a sigh he sits down and starts the spell. Once it is done Bakugo now has some of Izuku's Kai inside of him. And as he is coming to, the explosive teen sees some of the memories attached and feels even more guilt than he already did at what he had said to Izuku some time ago. Dek, Izuku I. I'm we can worry about that later Katsuki. Right now, we've got bigger problems. Please be more careful. I don't know if a second transfusion will work. Izuku says with some finality. Though those looking back at him, namely Achako and Momo, can see a pained look on his face. Bakugo agrees and they get ready again. And hope for a break in the storm. With Bakugo restored, Izuku's group moved on to try and find the last Kangshi. We need a break in the storm. Then we can send Ida to an old graveyard. Izuku says while walking through the halls. Momo, who quickly imagines a mushroom as something else, shakes her head before asking, I'm still confused on that part. How does any of this end a vampire? Even a Kai one threat. A few of the others nod in agreement. But then Bakugo speaks his own mind. It probably has to do with the fact that a lot of eastern magic uses plants mixed with other objects to cast spells. Then there is the fact that Kai is often considered connected to everything a person may own, as well as calling upon the earth or spirits of it. Mumble mumble. Upon seeing this, all of Izuku's team is stunned, with said mage asking a big question of his teacher and friends. Is this what I'm like when I start analyzing things? Yes, is the resounding answer. A few of them remembered the battle trials, and how Izuku seemed to be picking apart their powers as they watched, let alone the mutterings and mumbles they heard the boy saying as he was writing in notebooks. So, with a sigh Izuku and the rest move on. With Chika's group, they had a second attack by the female Kangshi. Ida was sure that Minta would come towards the woman and try to get a feel. But to his surprise, the purple pervert wasn't focused on the monster's exposed region. Instead, he was focused on the creature's face and had taken a stance similar to Kirishima's. I got this. She can't bite through my hardened skin. Kirishima shouts and rushes at the Kangshi. The creature just floats over him and kicked the hard-headed redhead in the back, before floating down to drain him. Then out of nowhere, Minta bounces and slams into the side of the Kangsha's head. Just as he's coming toward the floor, he puts out another ball and bounces off of it. Kirishima, give me your best hit man. Minta shouts as he bounces toward the red head. Kirishima shakes his head at the manly courage Minta was showing and does like what he asks. Minta then is able to bounce around and around while smacking the female Kangshi from multiple angles. Eventually he got a good enough hit to where she was knocked down and the others could steal her left sock. Minta bro, that was so manly and epic. I didn't think you had it in you, Kirishima said with lots of gusto. Minda shook his head and said that he didn't either. I guess having the kind of manly spirit you embody helped bring it out. Though I'll admit Midoriya helped with some of it. As they are celebrating though, a new threat arrives. The other two Kangshi. In one attack, all of the second team is knocked down and two more are drained of their Kai. The female Kangshi draining Mina and then blasting her with some type of spell. While the slightly more emaciated brother attacks Todoroki. He had tried to freeze the creature, but it disappeared and got behind the bi-colored boy. When both teens fall, all three of the Kangshi look ready to attack again. Luckily Izuku's team arrive and blast away the creatures. Chika, are you? You know what? Dumb question. Let's just get these two fixed up. Izuku says before laying Todoroki on the ground. When volunteers step up to help the Kangshi victims, Midnight offers to restore Mina and Tetsu Tetsu offers to lend Todoroki some Kai. If the one a hardhead had enough in him for that, then so do I. Tetsu Tetsu reasoned. Shika rolled her eyes and asked to work with the boys rather than Midnight and Mina. This confused the girls a bit, and they were about to question her about it when Izuku stepped in. We have bigger problems right now. They're turning fast. The teams look down and see that Mina and Todoroki do seem to be changing quickly. The two mages get to work, and they manage to save the latest Kangshi victims. As Todoroki is shaking his head a few people note he seems to have sharper teeth than before. Damn those floating monsters. I'll bust through them with my own wool and get my Kai back. Todoroki proclaims. All this confuses the rest. Tetsu Tetsu has a big grin on his face and tells Todoroki that is exactly what he needs to do. 
Mina though is shaking her own cobwebs out of her head when she locks sight on both Izuku and Kirishima's rears, and with a smirk just like Midnight's, she reaches up and grabs the two. God damn it Momo stop grabbing my. Oh, it's Ashido. Wait, Ashido, Izuku says while both he and Kirishima are blushing. Mina then raises her hands above her head with a brush of her hair as she stands. She then gets up close to Izuku and says, I really need to thank you later, perhaps in more than one way. No you don't young lady, sorry about that you too. I've at least somewhat tempered my impulses over the years, but she doesn't have that it seems, Midnight says with a light dusting of her cheeks. While inside she is screaming youth and personally wanting to see where that could head, she also knows she is a teacher and has a responsibility to keep them from going too far right away. Izuku sighs before saying, We don't transfer your memories or intelligence. At most we're transferring part of your personalities, but we need to get the stolen Kai back before the sun sets. Normally it would be before the sun rises, but I think Morta had a hand in boosting these monsters up. The searchers all nod and Izuku takes note of the situation. They have the socks but the problem comes from there not being a graveyard nearby that could have toadstools. We might have a way to help you Chico. Everyone hears this but they don't know where it is coming from. Hey, in here. They all hear, and they note that the sound is coming from the girls' bathroom. The girls go in first to look around. They check each of the stalls but find nothing. Turn around you idiots. At hearing that, the girls turn and see not just Adam, but a horde of zombies are similar behind him. They all start screaming and the guys bust in to see what they are freaking out about. Adam just rolls his eyes, before putting his hand back toward the horde with a wave. He then turns his hand slightly and snaps his fingers. All of the sudden, the horde is demolished by a variety of effects ranging from the ground swallowing the monsters, to being incinerated into nothing, to lightning falling from the sky and splitting some in half, to others being stabbed and ripped apart by earthen hands. The whole UA group is shocked at what they had just witnessed, but they were also wondering, if Izuku's teacher was this capable, what would the student be like in a few years? Well we were somewhat right about this being a red herring, but there was still a threat here. We've dealt with most of it and that was one of the last issues. As Adam is saying this, the UA group note behind him that Tama was creeping up behind him, and she looked like a zombie. They were all freaking out and trying to tell him what was going on, but Adam was just getting more confused and annoyed. He then turned back right as zombie Tama was right on him and she attacked him, biting at his neck. This made the whole group freak out as the one weapon they could have against a crazed mage was now going to turn into a zombie. Adam though just looked nonplussed and tried to carry on with what he was saying. A few people fainted upon seeing all of that, and Izuku was crying at thinking he would have to kill or rekill his teachers to help them rest. Tamo knock it off. There is a serious situation happening. Oh boo, you're no fun, Tamo said with a teasing tone before waving her hand and the zombie appearance disappeared. This made all of the still conscious viewers want to pass out as well but they powered through. Not funny Tamo-san, I do not need that right now. We got a situation on our hands, Izuku said while trying to calm his panic. Adam just snorts before saying, I'm guessing there are about three Kangshi at UA right. Well, that was better than here. We had to kill off 13 of the damn things. Some kind of Kangshi clan or something. Upon hearing that all of the heroes and hero students are stunned, Adam presses on though before explaining that they can't make a portal to UA. But they can teach Izuku some quick portal magic that should help. You need graveyard toadstools to finish the ritual and the only poorly maintained graveyards I can think of in Japan might be in some old, abandoned ones. Izuku you should stay there. Send Chika and Ida, Tamo says before creating an illusion map of likely locations. Wait what are you two transmitting or whatever through? Aizawa asks confused by the whole situation. Adam just explains that they polished up a bronze bell to mirror shine. And then I used a transmission spell to create a temporary link from there to here. Don't worry, it'll fade once we leave. Aizawa though is facepalming at the insanity before him once again. But he's not rocking in the corner while trying to cling on to rationality Suo. Progress. Izuku quickly writes down the spell and the locations to send Chika and Ida. Okay I have the locations. And I can make portals that will send the socks to the river. We can win this way. With that the teams run out of the bathroom. And not hearing the warning that Adam tries to give the group. Izuku creates a portal in the hall and the two to get the toadstools head out. Aizawa then says they need to wait for the two to return. But just as he's saying this, the portal closes. What happened Midoriya? I don't know. I don't think the spell should have dissipated that fast unless. Oh crap. This spell might have location locks. They did say it was emergency portal magic. This makes all those present face bomb. They snap out of the shock though when they hear a scream from the direction of the gym where All Might and the rest are bunkered in. They run back and they see the Kangshi trying to break through the doors. Pony fires her horns alongside Todoroki with his eyes. But he monsters get away again. They get to the doors and bring everyone up to speed on what has happened and what the plan going forward is. Izuku then tries to create a new portal, and the spell works, but it is somewhat unstable. 
I just hope those two are having luck finding toadstools, because sunset is coming soon. Sadly, they were having less than stellar luck finding what they needed. They had found one toadstool in the ancient graveyard, but even with Ida rocketing around to look for what the mushroom they needed, they had yet to find a suitable second. What if we were to cut up the one we found? Ida asked after searching what he thought was the same spot three times. Shika shook her head and said, It has to be a full toadstool. No pieces. Ida just sighed and kept searching. It took them almost 20 minutes, but they eventually found two more to end the threat. They had to search around for another five minutes though to find the portal Izuku made to get them back. When they arrived though, everyone at Yue looked exhausted. They had been attacked by the Kangshi at least ten more times and the monsters had managed to drain enough Kai to where they didn't need to hunt by smell anymore. Two had been turned. Satsuna and Ayama had underestimated what they thought they could do and were dragged away by the vampires. The former, Izuku knew what was going on when the rest of the girl's body started attacking others. He had eventually found her head in Ayama and sealed them both. Okay, well at least we have the tools to beat the monsters. Let's begin. Yumo Gui Gui Fai Dai Zao. Yumo Gui Gui Fai Dai Zao. As Izuku started chanting this, the toadstools started glowing. He then placed the toadstools in the socks to complete the base ritual. Now I just need to make a portal to a river, but I have to leave the area to do it. Great, Izuku said with worry on his face. Chika and Riku though stood up to say they would go with him. Count me and Izuku. The one who said this was none other than Bakugo. While most were surprised given what little they understood of the angry blonde, Izuku's familiars were also confused, but the green-haired mage agrees. Minta, Tetsu Tetsu, Momo, Mina, Kirishima, and Achako step up next and they all agree to cover Izuku while he sets up the next portal. They head for the nurse's office to make the next portal and hopefully finish this fight. When they arrive, the Kangshi are there and they rush at the students. Bakugo, Izuku, Mina and Chika unleash a few shots. Then the two hardheads move in and try to distract the monsters. Minta and Momo do a surprise combo attack, with Momo using her staff to swing the former pervert around. And the short boy then tosses not just his orbs, but a handful of flashbangs Momo had made and given him. Once they are distracted, Izuku makes his portal and drops the socks into the river. The stolen Kai flows out of the monsters and returns to where it belongs. Once it does for Momo and Mina though, they both blush so hard their heads are steaming. Minta though looks to Kirishima and says another thanks for not just saving him, but giving me a way to look at how to be a cool hero, or rather a manly hero. Kirishima just smiles before fist bumping the purple hero student. Just as they are celebrating the sun starts to peek through the clouds, as the storm passes. Well at least that is done. They should start to disintegrate right about, Izuku says confidently. But the strangest thing happens. The Kangshi don't turn to ash in the sunlight. He then hears one speak to his mind. It mentions that they had been enhanced by Morta to be able to last for a time in the light. Izuku is then grabbed and knocked through a window into the courtyard. They all hear that the Kangshi will still fight on and grow their power. Don't think it will be easy for you. All those involved look up and see Adam and Tamo up above the main entrance to the UA school building. Both are floating in the air, with Adam having his arms crossed looking down at the monsters that had invaded. Tamo herself has a disdainful look, that slowly morphs into a sadistic smirk. A few fox lights surround her, and when one of the kangs she tries to flee, she is right in front of it. She stabs it in the chest with her sword, then draws it quickly before beheading the monster. And while it is still in the air, the whole body is consumed by fox fire. With the sister and other brothers still left, they try to flee as well. But they suddenly feel gripped by a force no one can see. Negron, do it, Adam says before the two trapped Kangshi are slammed into the ground a few times. Then the two are tossed into the craters before apparently being smashed a few more times. Adam then finishes the matter with a spell combining Christian Hellfire, the various fires from deep, and the popple of a hothouse to consume the bodies of the Kangshi. This all terrifies and amazes the students who had been watching. Izuku himself is wondering if he would ever get to that level. In a bar in Kamino Ward, a few unscrupulous individuals were discussing their next moves. It seems your initial plan to weaken the forces at UA was less than successful. Agreed. I didn't expect that the ones who followed me would train their own mages, let alone him having multiple familiars to aid him. This will complicate matters going forward. The two speaking are not in the bar itself. One is broadcast through a TV in the room, while the other has a misty veil up to project her visage. Her blonde hair is less of a mess compared to when Adam and Tamo last saw her, but fury still burns in her blue eyes. Morta Amesworth. She was once a famous mage in their old world before her wish, and belief that she was owed the power and position of the Magus and rule as the supreme mage pushed her to perpetrating multiple magical crimes, many of which were against those she saw beneath her such as an attack in Berlin that took the lives of 500 people in a single instance, all to steal and distill the minimal magic potential that every person possessed, or the attempted destruction of New Grange Mound to take its energy as a power spot. 
even making a deal with a dangerous black dragon equal to the world-creating might of Tiamat to gain more power, and almost doom the world. Now in this world, she was seeking new weapons and tools to take the place she believed she was owed, and that involved allying with silly monsters as she perceived most who possessed quirks, though she would not say it aloud. The first of whom she met was a monster known as Gigantamasia. When the beast tried to squash her, she promptly destroyed the monster with a light wave of her hand, ripping the beast to shreds before turning him inside out. It was then she was put into contact with the monster's master, a being who was much like herself, though she would not admit that. While the master tried to keep who he was a secret, as well as his location, Morta quickly found him. And while what she found was a damaged and broken man physically, mentally she could tell he was impressive, as well as the power he was emanating even in his crippled state. It was after this that she questioned more of who the man was and what he was after. The two spent a few days exchanging stories with each other on who they were and what they had done in their worlds, and a generous amount of respect was born between the two villains. While Morta could not heal the villain due to her lack of skills in healing and restorative magics, she could alleviate some of the pain as well as enhance the man in ways a quirk couldn't. Hmm. If they have a magic student, then the other plans to attack Yue could have issues. We might need more allies like the Kangxi. I agree. But can you get any on short notice? I might have an idea. She's tricky and troublesome in my old world. But she is also quite evil, cruel, and willing to torment humans. Just give me a day. With that, Morta stops her communication to the bar. The master then advises his protege on gathering more forces and discussing with the doctor on making the weapon to fight All Might better. And maybe we need to be ready for that mystic duo. Adam Garcia and Tomo. Troublesome opponents for different reasons. With orders given and plans set, the villains adjourn. Until their ally at UA can tell them when a new opening occurs. The day after the attack by the Kangxi, the students are given an easier afternoon for their classes. As much as I'd like to have the first years doing rescue practice, after what they went through due to those monsters, I'm willing to wait a while longer. Aizawa says at a faculty conference during lunch, Nazu agrees with idea, as do most of the teachers. Adam though warns about something that was bothering him. It was a large coven of Kangxi we found, and the leaders were the ones who attacked the school. I have to wonder if it was an intentional attack to take out the heroes and hero students, or if it was just a probing attack. A few of the others are wide-eyed at the thought of what the attack could mean, as well as what could be coming next for them all. While the initial plan had been to go to the USJ for rescue training, the general plan now was to help each of the students with improving their quirk capabilities. Some had little to work on like Bakugo, Todoroki, Aoyama, and Yeyurazu. But others were getting aid in different ways, such as a few working with Sato to find out if other sugars could cause different reactions with his quirk. Others like Kirishima, Riku, Tetsu Tetsu, Sen, Rin, and Ajiro were all sparing to improve each other, with Rin practicing long-range attacks with Pony, Gyro, and Bondo. Achako and a few others were attempting to come up with new ways to use their quirks if the need arose again. That mess we got into with those vampires was crazy, and none of our quirks really worked on them. If a lot of other magic stuff is like that, then we really need to think outside the box, Minda says while scratching his chin. Most of his classmates though are surprised by the purple pervert thinking matters through. Izuku had thought about working on his rapid spell casting, but he opted for something different. Instead of physically working out, he went with working his mind. He, along with Chika, were going over various tomes and scrolls that Tamo had provided, with Izuku finally getting a handle on proper healing magic. So it's not just about having a compassionate heart that wants to heal. You also need to better understand the anatomy aspects. That's why I couldn't properly restore the plants I was testing it on. I was just repairing all that I thought was broken, not the other pieces that might have been damaged. Now we can both help with healing anyone who might hurt themselves, though you might be looking to others more intently. Chika teases after they had finished some scrolls. The ones Chika was thinking of were the duo who had gained a perverted attraction to the boy after the Kai transfers. Momo had at first not thought much of Izuku other than seeing him as interesting due to his magical abilities, as well as his strategic mind and skills as a hero and investigator. But after getting a decent dose of mind as Kai, she suddenly found herself looking over Izuku with a more appraising eye. He is kind of cute, and he's got the mentality to be a great hero, and the muscles I felt were what am I thinking? I'd be just as bad as mine to if I follow these thoughts. Right, Momo debates with herself while peeking over at Izuku. Mina on the other hand is questioning her own horniness given she kept feeling aroused when looking at a few members of her class, male and female, but feeling it strongest from Izuku, Riku, Chika, and Achako, let alone the series of wet dreams she'd been having for the past week. Even now as she was trying to improve her acid output, she kept feeling her eyes wander to all of them. Everything okay Mina? Achako asked while they were taking a break, but Mina just freaked out a bit before jumping back and saying everything was fine. No problems here Achako. 
I'm just, I'm just going over. You know what I need to go to the restroom for a minute. Mina says with a purple face, and she quickly skates away. Once there she spent a few minutes trying to alleviate her current issue, and finding middling success. For some of the others who had transfers, they each felt that they now had new drives or perspectives on what it meant to be a hero, or on their own reasons to be a hero. In Minda's case, while he still wanted to be a cool hero to impress girls, he also wanted to prove his own grit and manliness. While Todoroki was feeling a bit more passionate and driven to use everything he could, with even his left side lighting up a bit under his iced over half, Akugo though started to think more about the hell he put Izuku through when they were children, let alone that his old victim wasn't trying to show him up or really prove him wrong. He was more focused on trying to be a hero that saves people. The new insight bits have given me ideas for later, but I'm not sure if I deserve to be here now. Not with everything I did to Izuku. And to others, Bakugo thinks out loud while looking down at his hands. He lets out a frustrated sigh before working more on his explosive adjustments. While the students are preparing, Morta has found the area with the ally she hopes to gain. In Tachigi Prefecture she finds a dilapidated house and temple nearby outside of the city of Nasu. Once the fallen mage walks in, she can tell that she is being observed. I don't think there is a reason that we can't discuss matters calmly. Why don't you come out? I might have something you would be interested in. The only thing that interests me are those who can give me a terrified look as I ravage and devour them. You do not interest. Morta hears behind her, and blue fox flames strike the barrier she had put up beforehand. The mage smirks before looking above and seeing the face of an enraged nine-tailed fox with golden hair above her, and a scar over her left eye. Morta just chuckles a bit before saying, how a mighty demon has fallen. To be forced back here due to an injury that mars your face. I'd be willing to bet that if it were not for that, you could attract any man you wished. Do not toy with me whelp. Were I not impressed by the skills you have, I would have devoured you. The fox snarled at her supposed prey. You'd try, but fail. I've dealt with your kind more than once. Morta sneers at the fox after saying that, practically daring the demon to attack her. But the fox does not and just let out a frustrated sigh before asking what the woman was doing there. I came seeking a bit of help. I'm aiming to attack a group who call themselves heroes in this world, but they have strong magical aid. And while I may be capable, I'd prefer a bit of insurance. While the fox comes down from floating above, Morta conjures images of Adam and Tamo, noting that this pair were ones who worried her the most, but they also have young allies. This accursed overseer saw fit to train a new magic warrior should he fall. Morta then conjures images of Izuku, as well as his two familiars. Upon seeing the familiars though, the fox's eyes widen in rage, and she lets out a furious roar that make the ground tremble. I take it you know one of the ones I am worried about. They are the reason I am scarred in the first place, so that is where you have gone, child of mine. The fox seems to contemplate a moment before agreeing to aid Morta and her allies. You will leave the children to me. I wish to personally burn that brat who cut my eye, and I will quite enjoy disciplining my ungrateful brat of a daughter again. Perhaps I will keep the boy she is tied to and torment the both of them, to make her fall further in for my own amusement. The fox says with a sinister gleam in her eyes, Morta just shrugs as if to say she doesn't care, and leaves a bit of portal magic so the fox can link up with the rest of them when the time comes. With the biggest weapon recruited, Morta goes to try and gather a few more magical entities, while Tamura gathers as many villains as possible to better cripple All Might and the heroes of UA. With the students collected and feeling better after training with their quirks for a day, Vlad and Eraserhead can bring up the plan for the next step in their hero training, which is spelled out on the boards as rescue. A few students cheer as it was the whole reason some of them wanted to become heroes in the first place, to save those souls lost and in pain in this world of ours, Ibera said with a beam of light shining down upon her. Once the homeroom teachers had reined the rest in, they went on to explain what they would be doing with their sister classes for the day. We'll be heading to an off-site location to train each of you in how to handle a disaster situation. Floods, fires, etc. You'll be taught by me, Aizawa, All Might, Garcia, Tamo, and another instructor when we get there. Vlad explains to Class 1B. Aizawa tells much the same to his students and they all suit up and head for the buses to take them to the location. All Might loads up with Class 1A, while Adam and Tamo take the time to try and get to know Class 1B more. Hey, I was wondering Garcia-sensei, what is the relationship between you and Tamo-san? Kanoko Kamori asks with a tilt of her head directed at the two overseers. The two look between one another, before the human shrugs saying, we're partners. In the more, it's a little odd but in the professional sense, and kind of in. Well, if I were to compare it, she's kinda like my common law wife. In a sense, that feels accurate. We both trust each other implicitly, and we've been good friends and partners for years. But if you are wondering about attraction, no. Adam has an eye for men you see. Tamo says with a smile while Adam just shrugs agreeing with the woman. This shocks a few of the students, while Takage Satsuna makes the joke of, dang, here I was hoping for a romance with the foreign teacher. 
He is pretty attractive. Thank you for the compliment, but you're too young. And obviously I'm not interested, Adam says with a smile. This gets a few others to laugh before they move on to other questions and curiosities about their otherworldly teachers. Izuku meanwhile is discussing with his classmates on how to best handle the challenges they will face during rescue training, commenting that he had learned some observation and other types of magic to survey a location beforehand. Man, that magic stuff is crazy useful, and it's got a lot more applications compared to my quirk. All I can do is take a strong punch. Kurashima laments while on the bus ride over. Izuku nods but tries to bring up his classmate's spirit a bit. It's true you don't have as flashy of a power compared to me or a few of the others in the class, but that can be an asset, if you figure out the way to work with it. Others wonder if Izuku would be more like his teachers and act as an investigative hero more than one who fights villains. The young mage smiles before saying he'd try to do both. My magic abilities could give others hope too especially those who don't have quirks. They could learn to be heroes that no one else could compete with. That is an exceptional way to look at the matter Midoriya. As heroes we are meant to inspire. But that inspiration can come from many aspects of our character. Ida says with an excited chop of his hands. Once the group arrives at the USJ, they are all greeted by the space-suited heroine, 13. After a quick introduction of the facility before them, 13 goes on to explain how her own quirk works, and how it could easily be a threat to others. Therefore, it is important to remember to restrain yourselves with your powers, and not take lightly the damage you could do with them. This resonates more with Bakugo, who thinks about his past and what he had done to Izuku and a few others at their old school. He looks down at the palm of his hands and feels disgust at the ways he abused his abilities in his youth. Probably wouldn't be thinking about this if I hadn't had my personality mixed with Izuku's, and hadn't been put in a state where I could see what a monster I was, and maybe still am, while Bakugo is heavy in introspection. Thirteen starts to escort the rest toward the center plaza, until a black misty mass opens in the middle of the plaza, and a horde of villains comes from within. Has the training begun? No humber, we've got your version of. Villains. Oh no, Adam says before seeing something that makes his hair stand on end. Coming out behind some of the villains are a variety of demons and other yakai, and standing next to the first villain with hands on his body is none other than Morta Amesworth herself. La Para Bruja, Adam says while pulling his hat down tight on his head. Tamo meanwhile has her tails all pointed straight out and her blade is already drawn, and each of the heroes is also wary of the new enemy before them, and how they are supposed to fight against monsters they only thought of as legends. As the villains and monsters strode into the USJ, the heroes just glared down at the gathering storm of villains. Adam, is that one? All Might asks with a bit of worry laced in his voice. Yeah, La Bruja herself. Morta Amesworth, one of the worst magical criminals from our world. Adam says before creating a magic circle next to himself. He reaches in and pulls out a few pieces of gear. First is a mystic belt that holds a few smaller weapons, with a pair of pistols being the main pieces seen. One looks blood red and is similar in appearance to a desert eagle and on the barrel appears to be demons screaming. The other is a white colt dragoon revolver with what looks like a scope on it as well as demon ivory for the grip, with angel wings etched into it. From the back of the belt there is a knife of blue-looking metal that can shift to sword length. He then takes off the jacket he was wearing and pulls out the duster he arrived in the world in. It has multiple mystic protections and is made from dragon hide, bunyip scales, and chenu skin. The last item is a different hat. It looks similar to his usual white cowboy hat, but Izuku notices something odd with it. He walked around to get a better look with his familiars following him, and then he saw it. The hat turned to him and seemed to look at the boy. Oh Garcia-san, what is up with your hat? Adam looked down at his protege and explained that it was made from a manticore. A leader king one if you will. Had it turned into a hat with some extra power running through it. You'll see. Adam tips the brim while the other heroes contemplate who and what they were dealing with. I get the feeling nothing we were ever prepared or trained for. All Might says with a severe look in his eyes. Adam agrees and suggests that Thirteen and Vlad remove the students. You, me, Tamo, and Aizawa though should engage the villains and monsters. Izuku you aren't fighting this time. This is more of a battle than I trained you for. While Izuku wants to disagree, a look down at the forces gathering tells him that his teacher was correct, especially with the newest arrival, one that makes Chika freeze up in fear. Walking out of Kirijiri's misty portal was the fox Morta had recruited, before she had appeared in her fox form to intimidate, but now she was human-sized, with her golden hair and tails flowing behind her. And while she was still quite beautiful, it was marred by the scar Riku had left on her face to save Chika, who was currently having a panic attack and only quietly muttered out mother while backing away from the stairway. A few heard this but before they could say anything, Tomo interjected. I thought as much, but I wasn't sure. We have much in common little one. We both are the daughters of Tamamo no Mi. Tamo gave her pseudo-cousin a sad look before it morphed into one to say it would be alright. 
Adam, I want to handle that bitch. Adam looks to the fox woman and then to the enemy fox. He smirks before saying, more power to you. I've got my own targets. His glare is fixated solely on Morta. Before he and the others start down, he warns All Might to not face the Yakai. You may be healed but you shouldn't push your luck. Besides, you have a different dance partner. All Might follows the overseer's gaze and locks eyes on the massive black-skinned and beaked monster that the villains brought with them. It's not magic is it? All Might says. Adam confirms it isn't and tells the number one and Aizawa to be ready for almost anything. With a nod from both, their attack begins. All Might rushes down first, clearing a wave of villains and knocking away some yakai. Before said yakai could recover though, Adam drew his pistols and started blasting. The shots from his red gun seemed to engulf the beings in fire. While the white gun let off a purifying light, some of the shots had other effects even if he missed, such as making the ground rise up and attack or summoning lightning. Tamo and Aizawa meanwhile went to a middle ground between the number one and the overseer, engaging villain and yakai alike to ease the threat to the students, who were now being accosted by the same entity that brought all of the villains to the USJ. Greetings. I am Kirajiri and we are the League of Villains. I do apologize, but we can't have you leaving so soon. Kirajiri says before stretching out his misty mass across the top of the stairs. Izuku narrows his eyes as 13 and Vlad King step in between the villain and the students. Riku and few others look ready to jump in to back up the teachers. Meanwhile, Chika is still terrified at seeing her mother again, with the girls questioning what her mother did to elicit that reaction. Izuku lets out a set of talismans to a few people around. Riku, Achako, Bakugo, Koda, Ibera, and the vice rep of Class 1B Nirenjiki Shota. Guys listen up. I've got a plan. We obviously need to get Ida out of here so he can get help. But we can't do that while this villain is in the way. While many are unsettled by Izuku speaking to their minds, they want a group move past it quickly. The first stage of the plan comes when 13 uses her quirk to try and pull Kirajiri into possible oblivion. Riku, Ibera, and Koda use their abilities to slip the talismans Izuku had sent them behind the villain. Once those were in place, the others placed the talismans where the rookie overseer had noted, while Izuku slipped behind the space hero for what he suspected would happen next, and Kirajiri pays this off by opening a portal behind the hero. Izuku smirked before tossing another talisman into the portal and slipping one in front of 13. It said, get ready to move, Izuku exclaimed with a clap of his hands. Right as he clapped the place talismans erupted in light and surrounded the villain, with his portals even being completely cancelled out due to the talisman in his body. Izuku then made another set of gestures and bound Kirajiri to the point. Hurry, I can't hold this forever, Izuku says while holding his hand sign. Bakugo shouts for Ida to run and the class president does just that. He blitzes out first and many of the others are right behind him. Izuku, how you holding up? Bakugo asks after half of the class had escaped. Izuku grunts as he feels the binding spell start to break apart. I can hold it a bit longer, but this guy is pushing back pretty hard. Get out of here. Bakugo refuses as do a few other members who hadn't left, namely the two hard heads of the hero course, Mina, Momo, Sato, Achako, Yanagi Riaiko, Huryu Rin, and Shishida Jirota. The hero teachers also refuse to abandon the boy. Before Izuku can protest, Kirajiri breaks free of the enchantment. After taking a few breaths, he compliments Izuku. You knew exactly how your teacher would fight and how I would likely counter. You even brought another so it wouldn't be obvious on what you were planning. The misty villain's tone shifts though and he quickly sucks in and separates all of those still at the top of the stairs. When Izuku shakes out of the confusion of the dark space, he notices that he is falling toward a set of ruins. But he isn't alone. Falling below him is Momo who seems to be panicking about what she could create to save herself and the others. The other being the iron student Tetsu 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 Tetsu. Izuku touches his charm though and answers her question. Hold on. Izuku shouts as his Tengu cloak unfurls. He dives down and catches Momo first picking her up in a princess carry, and of course, making the heiress blush. For Tetsu though he can only shout for the boy to grab on. Hey thanks for the save Midoriya. I probably could take the fall, but it would still probably hurt. The iron boy says while hanging onto Izuku's leg. Izuku chuckles before flying to one of the rooftops. Tetsu Tetsu drops first and takes a battle-ready stance. Izuku is finally at a place where he can set Momo down with minimal issue. Thank you Midoriya. I was a bit frightened and unsure of what to do. Momo says while looking to the side. After patting her cheeks to wake up, she creates a shield and a staff with her quirk. Do you want any tools Tetsu Tetsu? No thanks, I'll take these guys down with my own fists. And will, Tetsu Tetsu exclaims before Izuku chops the top of his head. Pipe down will you? We don't need to announce our presence right away. Izuku basically stage whispers. He hums a moment before telling Tetsu Tetsu to hold up his hands. I know you want to fight them head on, but that won't work on the yakai. If we were dealing with western demons or elves, you'd be the perfect weapon. 
Izuku create bindings around Tetsu Tetsu's hands with his talismans, making the team look like he'd taped up his hands for the fight. This'll let you hit the magic beings, and maybe give you some better defense against the oddest ones. Tetsu Tetsu nods before thanking Izuku again. He then asks to borrow the rod Momo made to enchant it. I was wondering, did you know about those tools and weapons were Midoriya? Momo asked while Izuku carved some spells into the metal. Oh no, those were new to me, and I've been training with them for a year. Guess they didn't feel the need to use those when dealing with average thugs and smaller magic threats. Izuku said while wondering if he'd have more tools like that one day. The other two with him though just have flat looks and tilted heads. What? They don't consider a bunch of vampires invading a school. And turning people into more vampires a big enough threat. Momo says while thinking back on that day. And how embarrassing it was. Tetsu Tetsu has his own thoughts on the matter. But they are put aside for a moment. Look out. He shouts as he runs at Momo. And punches an oni that was coming out from her shadow. Izuku lets out a crap before casting magic circles around his hands. Villains and yakai appear all around but Izuku can tell that most wouldn't be too dangerous. Mostly the villains. And this was proven when they rushed forward first and were easily knocked out and restrained by Izuku's magic. That's about the best you can get from these fools who pretend they are still human. They actually think these quirks are a good thing. A woman said as she sauntered up to where a few had fallen. She then terrified most everyone there by spitting silk from her mouth and pulling two of the villains to her. She then bites down and seems to drain the life away from one, while the other she lets out a poison that seems to liquefy the villain, and she then devours the liquefied remains. All three of the teens feel sick to their stomachs at seeing that, with a few conscious villains puking before begging the hero teens to either help them or free them. At least let us fight these things rather than dying like that. One shouts as an oni stalks over to him. One claims that they just thought the yakai were just like them. People outcasted for their quirks or who felt restrained by the laws. Some admitted to just enjoying the ability to use their quirks with reckless abandon, even killing. Izuku thought for a moment before freeing a select few. You do realize that once this is over, I will be capturing you again. Yeah and I don't care. I'd rather side with you than be food for these monsters. One villain says before turning his arm into a cannon. Around the rest of the USJ the other students are having issues fighting. Katsuki had been dropped with Riku, Kirishima, and Shishida. And while Riku still had the urge to punt Katsuki into the mouth of the new floating above the downpour zone, he put it aside to deal with the matter before them. Shika though was uneasy with her team. She had been warped away from Izuku into the mountain zone with Mina, Riaiko, Rin, and Sato, and she was still processing that her mother was so close by, let alone what she would do to her, Riku, and Izuku. She shivered at the thought and wished she could be anywhere else. Shika, you need to focus. I know you're dealing with a lot right now, but we don't have the luxury of a panic attack. Sato says while kneeling down to face the girl. Shika gulps before grabbing onto Sato. She gives a shaky nod before saying she was good to move. Achako and Rin had been warped with Vlad King and 13, and they were given permission to use their quirks to fight back in this situation. Especially given 13 here isn't a combat hero. And don't give me that look. You're out of practice when it comes to anything combat related. Vlad says after binding a few villains. 13 grumbles a moment before saying, Maybe so. But you didn't have to say it out loud. Achako mainly helps by using debris as shields while Rin barrages the villains with his scales, while Thirteen works to distract or take some of the villains off balance for Vlad to defeat or restrain, quickly making their way to a side exit to the USJ. While the remaining students were fighting their own battles, the main combat in the center of building was coming to a tense head, as All Might, Aizawa, Adam, and Tamo picked out their likely dance partners. Aizawa, Tashinori, I'm gonna do something a little crazy so I need you to buy a bit of time. If this works, we'll be able to avoid a lot of potential damage. Adam mutters when close to the pair in question. Tomo has a suspicion on what her master has in mind and starts some subtle spells to aid him. With the villains though, they are each eyeing up the heroes they want to kill. Except for Namu who is just staring blankly. So good of you to show up for your funeral all might. Namu here has been perfectly crafted to end you. With a little aid from our friend here. Shigaraki Tamura, the recently introduced leader of the League of Villains says. Morta rolls her eyes before warning the boy that it may not be so easy. This pair of mongrels have been hounding me for quite some time, especially that detestable fay of a man. This incises Adam but he lets it go to focus on the task at hand. Didn't think you'd align yourself with average humans, even if they're a little odd in this world. Adam says before letting some talismans slip out of his coat. Tamo then takes command and brings them to a few points around the villains. Tamura then interrupts and calls out All Might and the fact that they would kill him to put an end to this hero society. With Aizawa and All Might calling out Tamura's bullshit at having some lofty ideals, which annoys the villain but he can't deny what they say. Well no matter, Namu, kill the symbol of peace, and the rest of the heroes, Tamura shouts. Adam just smirks before saying, 
Won't be that simple punk. Mundos to distancia. Create a bridge till called back once more. Suddenly, under the major players a set of lights shine. All Might's and Namu's matched, as did Tamo's and Tamamo no Mi's. Kirajiri's though matched no one and Morta quickly disabled the circle that was forming under her. All Might and Namu had been warped to a special arena where they could fight all out without having to worry about others being hurt, which made the number one hero smile, especially since this creature could take quite a few of his blows. For the two dark-clothed opponents, they were in a dark forested area of some sort. Aizawa smirked while thinking. He sent me to a place where my usual combat style would be perfect. Thanks Garcia. He then tosses out his capture tool and yanks Tamura to him, before giving the villain a powerful kick to the solar plexus. For the two fox women though, they had already begun clashing swords and fox fire. Kamamo no Mi snarls as Tamo strikes her blind side. It seems you're quite crafty yourself. Why do you friend with the humans? They are little more than cattle to us, but alone being just as twisted and evil as they claim we are. Because there have been plenty who have shown me kindness in various ways. From the first day I met Adam, to the children and teachers of this world. I'll stand with those who fight and help others, rather than consuming those weaker just to make me feel powerful, feared, and like I'm better, Tamo says before unleashing more fox fire. Once the magic has run its course and the only ones still in the center of the USJ were Adam and Morta, clever as usual, an arena warping spell with you as the primary conduit, unless you were to be defeated or disabled it yourself, each of the people contained will be removed from this plane of existence. Adam scoffs before admitting that he'd hoped he'd be able to send her and Kirajiri away. If only for a few moments. But I suppose this will work too. I was hoping to take you down. Adam says with a flourish of his pistols. Morta scoffs before brandishing her staff at the man. The two glare at each other before engaging. Adam lets off a barrage of spell shots the Morta evades or deflects with her staff. Even creating some spells and firing them as well. Some to attack Adam. Some to deflect the fired off spells behind her. Once in close quarters, she lashes out with her staff and Adam quickly blocks with both of his guns, sliding them down to try and get a shot on her. But the witch moves her head out of the way before trying to stab with the sharpened base of her staff, as well as unleashing some spells to burn the overseer. Adam leaps back and uses his coat to soak up some of the damaging spells, from water blades being absorbed, fire not affecting him, and ice melting right as it hit his coat. He quickly holsters his dragoon and draws his knife first engaging by slashing in knife form, the rapidly elongating it to cut the side of Morda's face and hair. The mad mage snarls before shouting at Adam. Blast those items. I created entirely new spells, alongside mastering all of the old arts and ways of spell craft. Meanwhile you use trinkets, tools, and items you had made by others, and yet you were considered a candidate. Adam clicks his teeth at the pettiness of the mage who was once known as the prodigy. He charges up some spells before saying, I never wanted it and I was never competing. You were just pissy about not having everything handed to you. And now you're looking to use the monsters and beings from this world to get what you want. Who says I haven't gained what I sought? Who is to say that I haven't achieved the goal I dreamt of since my youth? Morta says with a gleam in her eyes equal to the last time the pair met in creating a barrier to block the overseer's shots. Adam lets out a chuckle before saying, Because you're still only thinking of yourself. This infuriates the woman as she intensifies her strikes as she lashes out at Adam cutting his leg at one point and a few minor burns from some explosive magic at his front. But she is not unscathed. Adam had singed her head slightly from a hellfire shot and put a holy beam through her leg. The witch knows she could be in trouble, so she pulls out an old favorite. Morda taps her staff on the ground to unleash a new spell, one summoning a large number of monsters and golems to overwhelm Adam, a tactic she would often use to throw overseers and heroes from their old world off and either give her a chance to cast a new spell or get away. Same old tricks, huh? Well I've learned a new one. Adam does a spin flourish with his pistols before blasting a set of lights in front of him. Amitraladora Mystica. Dozens upon hundreds of magic shots are fired from the points Adam dropped in front of him. Morta realizes what is coming her way and quickly flies up into the air. When the attack finishes, there is nothing left of the creatures and golems she summoned. But, that was impressive. But you seem to have exhausted yourself in doing that. So, it is over for you. Morta shouts as she dives down to impale Adam with her staff. The overseer is catching his breath but he smirks as she dives down at him. Right as he was about to be stabbed in the back, Morta is stopped by an unseen force. If I were fighting alone, perhaps. But thanks to you, I have a more potent and dangerous weapon in reserve. Negron, around the butt of her staff, a set of hands faded into existence. Black in color and claw they pushed her back as they seemed to grow from Adam's back. The overseer quickly turns and fires off two more shots from his pistols. Both shots miss, but they get the witch to back away further. Adam is still breathing a bit hard, but he's aided by the entity coming from his back. I think someone you once tried to make a deal with would like to say hello. 
Adam says with a grunt, and from his back other thing appear. First a pair of large black wings, followed by a smaller set below that. The clawed hands expand a bit while the arms appear and fill out more, and a black forked tail extends from the base of Adam's spine. And finally, a head appears. Glistening black horns shine from the top of its head. The snarling fangs gleam in the light, and the eyes of the dragon are a shade of red that makes Morta wonder if they were drilling right into her soul. And her eyes widened when she realized who this dragon was. You tamed it. But how? I couldn't get this demonic dragon to ally with me. All I could promise was that I would free it to reap its vengeance. He at his core just wanted to be free. I learned this after being bound to him. After you foolishly unearthed and freed him to potentially destroy the world, I finally got through to him enough to where he chose to be my familiar. Adam says with a smug look while Negron glared from above his head, rather than intimidate Morta into backing down. This just infuriated her more. She summoned as many creatures as she could to take the monstrous pair down. But the two worked properly together to cleave through her remaining created monsters. Negron grabbing onto a few or slashing through the monsters with his claw, or stretching out his neck or tail to stab and devour the creatures, while Adam used his pistols to keep some at a distance and interrupt Morta's spell casting and attempts to resummon her allies. The battle rages for ten minutes until Morta is at her limit. It's true you're stronger than me, and you have much larger magic reserves due to your heritage, but I'm not one for flashy shows unless necessary and I prefer to make a solid and reliable spell compared to a new one that could have problematic effects, just so I can show how much smarter I might be. As Adam was saying this, the students had arrived at the center and could see the battle wrapping up, with Izuku being especially shocked at the monster coming out of his mentor's back. Did you know he had that? Momo asked while leaning on Izuku, who numbly shook his head. Guess that answers that whole dragon's keep thing. He's literally keeping a dragon inside of him. Tetsu Tetsu says while looking up at the beast. The Iron Head lets out a shiver before calling it manly because of how intimidating it looked. Chika and Riku's groups are much the same, with Bakugo gulping at the idea of having to spar with the Overseer, and the dragon coming out of his back, or some like Riko being intrigued by the beast and the almost ghost-like appearance of the monster. Guess that answers what killed those Kangshi. They got ripped apart by a red-eyed black dragon that was coming out of Garcia's back. Wow that sounds crazier when I say it out loud, Mina says with a nervous chuckle. Morta snarls again, especially as the portals light up again, likely bringing back the victors of the various battles. But thanks to this, she can better see and analyze the composition of the spell Adam made, and use that to resummon their escape route, waiting for her moment to pounce. While the ranger overseer was facing off with the Mad Witch, each of the students kept fighting the villains and strange new enemies accosting them, some with slightly better luck than others despite some of Izuku's misgivings. He freed a few of the villains he had captured so they could fight against the Oni, and the Jorugumo that was currently staring them down. Midoriya, what's the plan? Momo asked while holding a shield in front of her. While a bulked up arm villain and Tetsu called out that they'd take the demons down, Izuku stopped them with some quick bindings. Don't rush in. The spider dropped a few traps in front of her. Clever boy. But how do you intend to defeat us if you can't get close? The Jorugumo says with a twisted smile on her face and the clicking of her mandibles. Izuku takes a breath before saying, by removing the ground on which they lay. Order. Izuku then slams a talisman to the roof they were standing on, causing it to collapse and all those close to fall down a level. This surprises the demons and Izuku then tells the muscle heads to go for it. Thanks man, Tetsu Tetsu says before charging and attacking some of the other yaka, knocking out a few Minkarawa and a Honingyo quickly while the villain attacks a Dorotabo and a Hanya. Izuku squares up in the meantime with the Oni and Jorugumo while Momo and a villain that turned his arm into a cannon stand in front of him. Little warning next time. The villain shouts before firing shots from his cannon arm. Izuku rolls his eyes and asks that the two buy him some more time. I've got something special planned. Izuku pulls out some prayer beads and talismans before quickly chanting a mantra Tamo Taen. Does that boy think he can get away with insulting us? The Oni roars before throwing a punch in Izuku's direction. And Momo gets in the demon's way with her shield and staff to cover Izuku. She flinches from the impact but is surprised that she doesn't go flying. Then she notices the kanji Izuku used to etch into her tools, strengthening and fortifying. So, these runes can at least get me closer to the level we need, she thinks before striking at the blue-skinned monster. The villain though is having less success against the Jorgumo. Every time he fires a shot, the demon quickly dodges and scuttles away. What the hell kid? I thought you had some kind of plan or were supposed to be a hero. I am, and now is the time to finish this part of the fight. Izuku says before rapidly finishing his chant and clapping his hands. Suddenly the spell traps he identified from before are activated again. But this time it is Izuku who is controlling the magic in question. And he uses it to wrap up and bind the yakai and the villains. Uh, hey, not cool. We helped you. 
The two shout as they are caught in new magic bindings. Yes thank you for that. But I don't trust you enough to expect you won't try and stab us in the back. Izuku says as he relaxes his hands and returns his items to his pockets. Good thinking Midoriya. That way it's less of a problem later. Momo compliments him with a sigh. Tetsu though seems a bit sad. Saying, still, they were kinda manly to be willing to help us. Doesn't feel entirely right to lock them up again. The one of students just give him a look as if to ask if he was crazy before moving on. Though Izuku puts a few more talismans on the more dangerous members of the demons gathered before leaving the ruins section. In the downpour section Riku and Kirishima take point at going through villains left and right, not to mention fighting some of the yokai gathered. Oh man, never thought I'd fight things like this in my life. Kirishima shouted with a bit of excitement. Yeah well maybe you should focus on them so you don't end up dead. Riku comments after cutting down a lesser oni and a rokurokubai, the latter of which had wrapped up and tried strangling Jiroda. The young beast man coughed a bit before thanking the Munija boy. Then he boosted up his beast state before engaging some of the larger yakai, like Karakura Ana and Agashido Kuro. And while Bakugo wanted to engage the yakai up close, he'd learned his lesson on that not working. After one of his big explosion blows went right through a Buriburu, and it then went into him and started to freeze him from the inside out, as well as trying to strangle him. I'm not going down like this, he shouted before unleashing one of his own explosions on his stomach. The heat and impact of the blow knocks him back and pushes the yakai out of his body. He then focuses on blasting it from a distance. I don't know enough about these things to assume my usual techniques will work, so I'll keep my distance for now, he thinks before helping cover Riku and Kirishima with explosions. It takes some time, but they eventually beat enough of the yakai and villains in the downpour section. Back Hugo's hands and stomach hurt from the explosions. Kirishima was tired from keeping up his hardening and Jirota was exhausted on his back after being in beast for a long period. Riku was the only one who was still in good shape, mostly thanks to Jirota wearing down the larger enemies and Yakai while he focused on countering the Yakai that were at his level. We need to get out of here. The others could be in trouble, he says after using some bindings that Adam had showed him how to use. In the mountain zone, Sato had taken point since his combat style was more close quarters focused. Rin was just a bit behind him since he could do both close range and mid-range combat while Chika and Riaiko were in the middle of the formation given their own specialty of ranged fighting, and Mina brought up the rear. Most of the villains were of little trouble for the teens since they were more than capable of dealing with average villains, even when Sato felt the drawbacks of his quirk. But the yokai were a different challenge. Some of them evaded or were unable to be touched by the teens when they attacked. Oh, come on, how do we fight something like this? Mina asks as she tries to attack a creature Chika identified as a Gasha Dokuro only for her acid to be sent back to her by the winds the yakai was made of. Ryaiko meanwhile works to free Sato and Rin after they had been enthralled by a Hinoma, yanking them back before throwing stones at the creature. You would deny my need for sustenance, it says while putting on a sad face to elicit some sympathy. Obviously, I'm not letting you take them. Ryaiko shouts before picking up some of the villains and tossing them at the yakai. But the woman thanks Ryaiko with some and begins siphoning the life force of some of the male villains, killing them. After licking her lips, flames seem to appear around the dangerous female yakai. She and a few other yakai come towards the teens, each looking to prey upon them all, even the so-called allies that are the villains. Shika had been trembling the entire time, especially since the face of the Hinoma reminded her so much of her mother. But something in her snapped and she suddenly charged at the burning woman, roaring as she plunged her tanto into monster's chest. You little brat. The Hinoma roared back as she used he flames to slap Chika away. The flames barely hurt the little fox, but some other yakai started to pounce on her, and she is saved by the students. Rin leaped in to first launch his scales and then punch the Hinoma, while Sato rushed in with a boulder to knock the yakai away from Chika, and the girls attacked with acid and other objects. Riaiko also helped increase the range of the acid Mina could let out by taking control of the fluid and throwing it at their enemies. Sato pulls Chika back before telling her, you need to calm down and focus. We can't beat these things by ourselves, and you can't do it alone. Chika takes a few panicked breaths before trying to slow her breathing and do just as the sugar rush user said. Ha, huo, oh, ha, ho, okay, I'm okay now, I think. We need to fall back. I need to get you guys more ready, Chika says before preparing her flames to make an illusion. With a clap of her hands, she makes a massive beast of flame appear above the yakai to startle them. Taking their chance, the students retreat to a different section of the mountain. Once there, they all take a moment to catch their breath. Sorry about earlier, but, seeing her again. And then that Hinoma who reminded me of. It's a lot to try and process. Shika-chan, what happened to you? Mina asked with worry lacing her voice and pity in her eyes at what she suspected. Sato put a gentle hand on the Kitsune girl's shoulder and the look he gave helped her to calm down more. It's a bit involved, and we don't have a lot of time. 
I'll go over the basics while I reinforce you all, Shika said before weaving a spell. She talked about her mother and how she was born into this world, and what her life had been like for decades, only finally finding some hope and respite thanks to Riku, and then a new home and mother thanks to Izuku and his mother. Hearing all of this brought all of them to tears and some of them furious, with Mina giving the little fox a hug and apologizing to her for what she endured, with whom she's probably fighting. Hopefully you won't have to worry about her though. Ryaiko says, an angry glint in her silver eyes. Shika agrees and hands Ryaiko a handful of talismans. Try to use these with your quirk. Make as many of them impact on the yakai as possible. She instructs before enchanting Sato and Rin's gloves. She then asks Mina for some lower viscosity acid. Not to burn exactly. I've got something else in mind. Shika says with a smirk. The pink girl isn't sure what the plan was, but she quickly fills the vials the little fox provided who then uses some herbs and other plants to mix with the acid to create something to fight the Yaka. Speaking of whom, a few of them had taken to consuming some of the defeated villains. If they were weak enough to fall to children, then they have no other use. The Hinoma says as she consumes the life force of another unconscious villain. As a few lower in Yugami track the teens, Chika puts the finishing touches on her spells and enchantments for the others. She then began a chant to finish the fight once the rest had worn them down. Let's go. Mina shouts as she leaps out and starts skating around tossing the vials Chika had given her. When they impact on the yakai, some of them feel pain or are cleansed completely. Others that impact the ground grow into trees or modify the ground to impede or impact the creatures. Sato and Rin jump in next, with the dragon boy's scales turning into metal and other elements as they are fired out, his scales even turning his hands into metals that dissipate some of the yakai. Sato meanwhile is using his full sugar rush boost, but this time it isn't dulling his intelligence. It's so much easier to fight when I can control how I'm attacking. Sato thinks as he starts in on some wrestling and other attacks. Chika's spell was one to counteract the side effects of his quirk, by super enhancing his mind, but it would only last for as long as his sugar rush did. Ryaiko meanwhile took advantage of the confusion they were sowing to add to it, by quickly creating a storm of talismans to bind and disperse the yakai. This tempest will bind your curses once and for all, she claimed as the slips of paper flew around the area. But the Hinoma was less impressed and burned away many of the talismans and the attacks the others threw her way. Do you really think this would stop me? She taunts as her flames roil around her. No, but this will. Chika says before finishing her chant and a few signs with her hands. Suddenly a torrent of water appears behind her and rushes toward the woman. You think just because you've created a lot of water it will stop me? The beguiling woman shrieks as she increases the heat of her flames, only to be shocked and unsettled by the way the wave of water moves. It separates and loops around her flames and keeps coming towards her. As she is about to unleash another attack, she feels something unsettling at her feet. She looks down and sees a rat made of water, which quickly explodes into a massive wave of water rats. And while the teens were worried that all the water would wash off some of their own attacks, their fears are unfounded. It's a spell built around harmonious relationships and rivalries. Water suppresses fire, and the opposite to a fire horse like her is a rat. Shika explains as the rodents continue to swarm over the yakai, extinguishing all of her flames and consuming the dangerous demon. Mina and Sato shiver at hearing the yakai's gargled cries as it dies within the mass of the spell. We should move on, but I would like to talk to you about your spell work Chika, Ryaiko says as they move away from the remaining villains and captured yakai. In one of the temporary battle zones, the fight between All Might and the Namu wrapped up rather quickly given he had been restored, or at least he thought it was wrapped up quickly. He knocked it out in five blows but was surprised when it got back up again and again. No matter how durable it is, I can keep knocking it out. Or can I? All Might thinks aloud while looking at the creature and how it keeps restoring the injured bones he broke. He also noted that his blows did seem to be not as effective as he thought. After the third time knocking the Namu out, all Might was questioning what would be the best way to deal with this threat, and then he saw something else on the creature's skin. Magic. That woman used some spells or something to make it to where this thing is getting still able to get up. Right as he finishes thinking this, Nama rushes him and sends him flying. After All Might lands, he shakes his head before getting attacked again. After taking another few powerful hits, he notices that the attacks hurt more than before. So that's it. Every time I attack, you can get stronger and hit me back with closer to the same force. All Might thinks aloud while grappling with Namu. The creature just roars at him before trying to headbutt the hero. But the hero evades and then tosses Namu away. If he gets stronger by me attacking, then I don't attack, he thinks before his smile grows. When Namu rushes at him and tries to punch the man, All Might evades and keeps evading all of the attacks the creature throws at him. And as he does, he notes that Namu seems to be getting a bit exhausted from the attacks. All Might keeps evading and throwing the monster away to keep him from hitting himself. As the fight goes on, All Might looks for his opening, 
And then when the Namu has slowed down enough, he gets behind it and puts the creature in a sleeper hold to knock it out without triggering the healing factor or the runes on its body. For Aizawa, he adjusts his fighting style after realizing how his opponent's quirk worked, capable of destroying or decaying anything he touches with his hands. Then the key is to make it to where he may not want to use it. Aizawa thinks before fainting and tying up the hands of the LOV leader, who screams about Aizawa cheating as he keeps using the young man's reliance on his quirk and hands against him, not to mention making him freak out a bit after knocking away a few of the hands he had all over him. Father, Tamura shouts before trying to quickly crawl to the knocked away appendage. But Aizawa was counting on this and gave the blue-haired teen two strong blows to the sides of his head, rattling his brain and knocking him out. Well at least that's done. Wonder how long I'll be stuck here. The fight between the foxes though is quite a bit different. At the start of the fight, they kept exchanging blows in their more bestially forms, biting, scratching, and launching fireballs from their mouths and tails. After a few minutes of this, they shifted into their more humanoid forms to fight once more, launching spell after spell and fireballs at each other, as well as crossing fists and kicks to try and knock each other out. You have impressive skills, and you say you are a descendant of myself or something along those lines. Perhaps you could be a better successor to my role than that brat of mine. The one-eyed fox says between blows and blasts. Tomo narrows her eyes at the demon and says she was full of it. You don't want a successor. If you did, you'd have treated Chica better. You'd. No, I get it. Just like my own mother you wanted to break her spirit, to make her weak enough that you could take a new body. But it won't happen. The tan-haired fox casts a few spells before taunting the older scarred fox with the fact she could fake her beauty anymore and a few other taunts mock the evil fox's vanity, which culminates with a spell to mess with her appearance and anger the old fox further. And after seeing what Tamo had done, Tamamo Nomi transforms into a much larger fox than before, her flames wreathing around and along her entire body. She charges up a ball of flame that when launched Tamo estimates that it could level a mountain. Okay, she's mad. Good. Tamo thinks aloud before drawing her wakazashi and channeling a spell along the blade. She then changes a bit to reduce her to more of a human form and taunts the mad fox once more. The great yakai snarls before charging at Tamo and slashing at her. But the younger fox slides in and cuts the great golden fox. But it isn't very deep, making Tamamo Nomi laugh and call her attacks pitiful. But her large size makes it to where the great demon can't really keep her eye on Tamo, who kept inflicting small injuries and cuts, some intersecting with previously made cuts. Your attacks mean nothing. Your little blade can do nothing to me. One attack no. Two attacks no again. But, a death by a thousand cuts can be inflicted in more than one way. Nihon no Idai Nani Seishin. Tono Ju de Kanojo no Chikara wa Shibaritsu ti Kudasai. Dakar Kanojo wa Nadoto dare nai mo kigai wa kiwaru koto wa deki mace nisha. After Tomo finishes her chant, the cuts from earlier in the fight light up and show that each of them became kanji. With those as well as her chanting and other magics, Tamamo no Mi screams and yowls as she feels her power being drained and her body restrained. What, what did you do to me? The old fox shrieks as she starts to look like an decrepit old woman, barely able to move from the spells in place on her. Tamo smirks before saying, It's a special binding spell. The only place you'll have any power is just where you were found. You'll never have your beauty. You'll never have your immense power. You'll never be able to terrify anyone again. As she is saying this, Tamamo no Mi collapses, and a portal back to the USJ appears. As the portals open once more, and Morta gets a better look at the composition she smiles before silently weaving her own spell. Adam notices a bit late that it is happening and doesn't draw his guns quick enough to shoot her. We will finish this another day. Morta proclaims before creating a spell underneath herself and then sending one more to pull Tamira out. After they had warped away, the Mad Witch catches her breath before recalling the rest of the spell. She kicks Tamira once and tells him, Hey, wake up brat. We need to get your caretaker. As the alleged leader of the League of Villains coughs and starts to come to, he is tempted to attack Morta for kicking him only to be scared when he is suddenly surrounded by various elemental spears. You shouldn't be surprised I expected that. And if you ever think of doing that again, I don't care what our mutual ally says or thinks. I'll reduce you to nothing. Just like your own quirk, Morta says with a furious glare in her eyes. Tamura grumbles a bit before apologizing and asking if she knew where Kirajiri was. The misty villain suddenly drops down from the sky as it were and groans as he fell on top of Tamura. Oh, what the hell? Morta rolls her eyes and tells the two to return to the LOV hideout. I need some time. I didn't expect many things when we faced them. But, perhaps I'm looking at this the wrong way. Tell your master that I'll have some new options eventually, the Mad Witch says before dropping her staff down to fly away. As the blue-haired young man grumbles, he checks on Kirajiri to get him to warp them back to the bar to plan their next move. Back at the USJ, most of the yakai left after feeling the defeat of Morta and Tamamo Nomi. 
while the villains were captured or surrendered after everything that had happened. Monsters, demons, Yokai and Ayakashi. I thought they were just a bunch of folks who had quirks that just made them like those creatures. This was not what we signed up for. Some of the villains complain or scream as they are escorted out of the building. With said demons though, Adam and Tamo take the forefront and plan to take most of them to Emperor Sudoku to be punished or simply imprisoned. You may call it Tartarus, but that's a fallacy. It barely compares to the real Tartarus, Adam says with a little laugh. And while the officers want to deny what he said, they couldn't deny that they couldn't contain or hold the yakai, evidenced by one easily escaping the maiden and trying to fly away, only for Adam to shoot it out of the sky with his colt and be trapped with bindings around it. Impressive. And why haven't you used those guns until now? Snipe asks while looking at the pair of firearms Adam had. He just smirks before spinning it a bit before holstering. Wasn't a need to. Don't need a devil or angel forge tool or weapon to deal with most of this riffraff. They're barely even threats, let alone not even really being villains. He says this while looking at most of the average villains, hurting what little pride some of them had left as they were loaded up and sent to Tartarus. For one demon though, they were unsure of where to put her. That being Tamamo no me. We can't exactly kill her. She'll just... Well we both know what would happen, but it's not like she can do anything or move here. Adam says while looking at the ancient fox, then send her back to that old temple she squatted in. It's in Tachigi Prefecture, just outside the city of Nasu. Riku explains while keeping himself between Chika and her mother, with the little fox ducking her ears a bit while she hid behind Izuku. The older overseers agree and set off for the locations, Tamo opening a portal to Sudoku's realm, and Adam teleporting to just outside of Nasu. For the teens, they each collapse after everything was done and before being escorted off campus. So many of them have different thoughts running through their minds as they leave. Some wonder if they'll have to deal with more demons and yakai. Others question the use of their quirks in paranormal situations. And even more just wonder what else could happen while they were students at UA. Morta meanwhile thinks over some things while she is flying, eventually stopping at the Hawaiian Islands to rest. She sighs as she creates a quick disguise for herself and walks the streets of Honolulu eventually coming upon a young woman who was leaving a hotel. The girl had a similar look to Morta, with blonde hair and blue eyes, but this girl's were obscured a bit by her glasses. She trips a bit before spilling the contents of one of her bags, the contents being papers with a variety of formulas and designs, some of which intrigued the witch. She looked over a few and found the composition similar to some of the spells she made. Morta looks down at the girl before helping the girl pick up her papers. Thank you miss, are you here for vacation or something? The girl asks while looking up at Morta. She hums before saying it was something like that. What are doing here? Or what were these papers for? She questions after handing some back. The girl smiles a bit before saying they were some papers on a few inventions and theories for new support gear. I'm trying to help improve what support gear can do. Not just for heroes, but even in the day-to-day -day for some people. Morta nods before asking why she seemed to be leaving already. Well, the conference already ended yesterday. And I need to go back home. Oh speaking of my flight leaves in. Though no, the girl panics a bit as she misread her ticket and got up at the wrong time. I'll never make it there and through security before my flight. Morta hums before turning the bag she had back into her staff. I think I can make up the time. Morta then taps her staff on the ground and they are quickly whisked to the airport and past most of the security before the girl knew it. What was that? Do you have some kind of teleporting quirk? Morta chuckles a bit before saying, No my dear, there are things in this world that are perhaps a bit beyond your comprehension. When the girl asks a bit more about it, all the witch says is that it would take quite a bit of time to explain. Well, maybe you could visit me at home. Show or teach me some of what it is that I don't know. The girl asks with a slight puppy dog-eyed look to the mage. She hums before saying she would think about it. What's your name girl? She asks before teleporting away. And said girl realizes she never introduced herself. She smiles before extending a hand to Morta and saying, My name's Melissa. Melissa Shield. I won't deny the bit with what Tamamo no Mi was after is a bit of an ass pull, but it has to do with something else in my own stories and comics. If I could find an artist who could draw the characters, I'd send them into Dark Horse or Image Comics. The Monday after the USJ attack, Adam and the rest of the teachers were still cleaning up and investigating the domed practice ground to understand what all happened. I can't track how more to turn my spell around on us. And even if I could, she's long gone. And once again, I have no way to track her. Adam says while rubbing his face in frustration. She probably already knew we were here, but the fact we've allied with heroes is going to make her act more cautiously. She's probably on another continent, Tamo explained while stretching her back a bit. All Might nodded and said, Do you think the League of Villains have any more of her spells or artifacts? Tamo shook her head and noted that it wouldn't do them too much good. Without an actual mage to empower the spells or runes or whatever, 
They can't do much. I noticed it with that Namu creature. Aizawa was again bashing his head into the wall at the madness that had become normal for him and everyone else at UA. Midnight and Mike have a chuckle at his expense before remembering they all had classes to take care of. Though we might mix the students together so you could tell us more about. Well a lot of things. I agree with present Mike. You might fill in the students on who it is we are dealing with. Especially your own. Nezu said with a firm look towards Adam and Tamo. The two overseers sigh before agreeing. Hijo de puta. Well, I guess we were going to have to do this sooner or later. I just would have preferred later when Izuku and the rest had more training. For said students, they were all talking about the crazy fights they all got into. But man, Riku bro you are a badass. You sure you can't hang out more? Hiroshima said while thinking back on how he fought the largest yokai that they were up against. Momo complimented Izuku on the way he reformatted the spells the Jorgumo used against her. Quite the clever way to do a turn your opponent's strength against them Midoriya. I wonder if you could do the same against us with our quirks, she said before contemplating the matter aloud. Bakugo scoffed before reminding the girl that he did it to him. During the battle trials, Riku there used that talisman thing to absorb my explosion and sent it back at me. Izuku and Riku preened a bit at all the praise and respect that was being sent their way. Shika meanwhile was trying to be comforted by some of the others who had learned her story. Hey, she can't hurt you anymore. Tomo-sen made sure of that right. And we'll be right with you if she tries to go after you and Midoriya. Sato says before offering her some sweet Inari sushi. The red-haired fox looks up at Sato and gingerly accepts the treat, her cheeks puffing slightly in happiness as she snacked on the treat. The moment and talks were broken up by Aizawa arriving and calling them all to attention. He sighed before saying, You all did well considering the crazy situation we were all thrown into thanks to the League of Villains and that mortal woman and her yakai allies. But you have a new challenge coming your way. The UA Sports Festival. Upon that being mentioned all of the teens cheered explosively. Even Izuku was excited to have his chance to show off what he could do with his skills and magic. Oh wait, they don't allow outside tool use. But maybe I could find some other way to circumvent the rule. Maybe, Midoriya. Izuku was shaken out of his mental ramblings by Aizawa shouting at him and giving the boy a minor glare. The young mage clears his throat before asking what it was that Aizawa had been saying. I'm guessing you already knew this, but most support gear use is not approved, so you can't use your talismans, and I'm honestly not sure about your familiars either. Nezu is still debating the matter. Izuku nodded and noted that it was what he was thinking about before Aizawa called out to him. The underground hero nodded and respected that Izuku was considering how to compensate. In the meantime, we'll be helping all of you improve over the next few weeks in your skills. Aizawa explained before telling all of the students to meet at one of the auditoriums after lunch. While most of the students were excited at the prospect of getting to show off their quirks, there was a different distracting concern at their door. That being all the students from the general and other courses, guess it was bound to happen. Everyone is wanting to check out the students that survived a villain attack. And worse right Izuku. Bakugo said while packing up his gear. It surprised Izuku to hear Bakugo calling him by his actual name still, but he moved past it and agreed with the explosive team. Riku and Chika took to hiding at this time while a few general course students were asking them questions about what happened during the USJ attack, but they were asked to move as the hero course students had a new lecture to go to. Hey, don't think you'll be standing at the top forever. The sports festival is a chance for all of us to show what we couldn't in the entrance exam. An indigo-haired boy with bags under his eyes said this before introducing himself as Shinzo Hitoshi and claiming he would make a big splash with the festival this year. I wouldn't be so sure on that. There are stranger things than you would understand, Izuku says with a smirk at the teen. In the auditorium, Adam and Tama were standing at the front of the room. The former was leaning against the wall while looking disgruntled. Tamo meanwhile was pacing a bit while bouncing some magic back and forth. Uh, Garcia-san, Tamo, is everything okay? Izuku asked before taking a seat. Not exactly. We lost Morta so now we're worried about what will come later. Because she will try again. And she knows where we are now. Tamo says with a twitch of her tails. Adam pushes himself forward while sighing and acknowledging they needed to explain a bit more about who the teens had been attacked by. The LOV is relatively straightforward. Those are just a bunch of idiots from your world who were looking for their chance to make a splash or become famous. Morta though, she is a whole different story. Adam went into a few details about some of the magic crimes she had committed during his time as an overseer and investigator. From the death of hundreds of people to distill the baseline magic of a number of people to increase her own, to the release of a dragon with the potential power on par with Tiamat, meaning it had the rough power equivalent to the Big Bang, and she thought she could control it to get what she wanted. Crazy freaking Magus blood. Hey, Adam do not go there. Talking like that is part of what got us into this place. You calling her that is as bad as some from our world calling you a sleepwalker or parasite. And it's part of what pushed her over the edge too. Tomo said with a very disapproving glare shot his way. 
The human grunted a bit before looking away. Izuku and many of the other kids though were curious on what it was the two were talking about. Tamo facepalmed and asked if they really wanted to know, but the looks on their faces showed that they did. Adam cleared his throat before creating an image with his magic. There are two major ways that magic exists, or is used by people in our world. The hereditary mages and the awakened mages. The magic orb Adam created showed the symbols for both sides. Neither is really sure of which came first. The hereditary ones are often related or associated with nobles in one way, shape, or form so they often act like they are above. Morda is part of this given she's from the Amesworth family of mages. Tama would speak next on how it wasn't entirely inaccurate to call the hereditary mages stronger in many cases. They are in quite a few cases like you with your quirks. They are around magic and its influences from young ages and can understand the oldest forms of magic. So I guess you could compare Morda to like say, young Bakugo there and how she was treated. Hearing this makes Katsuki freeze and jerkily turn towards the fox woman. He gulps before saying, you mean in that she was told she would be the greatest. She would be the next number one and would show everyone how she was the best. Right. Accurate. It's part of where that mix of compliment and insult of Magus blood comes from. Aside from the fact it's completely false, it's often used to build up certain mage egos, or used as a way to say they only got so far because they were born lucky, and often put stress and strain on trying to live up to that standard, causing some to snap hard. Back Hugo and Shoto both tightened their hands at that, thinking about how others had decided almost everything for them in their power and responsibility. Or in the case of Bak Hugo, he'd let the fact he was born with a powerful quirk by luck and his talented thoughts regarding it make him think he was so far above everyone else that they were all just pebbles to him. Adam continues the lecture by noting he was an awakened mage. We're not exactly common, but we aren't as rare as hereditary mages. While there are some major families, they don't have children often and they do have a bad habit of trying to keep their lines strong. Not to the point of inbreeding, but you might get the idea. He talked about how he met Tamo and by being close to and empathizing with her had opened his mind and eyes to the world of magic. That's actually why quite a number of us end up being overseers. We can be brutal or hard when needed, but we can often empathize with those we are watching over. Most of the time, the bigger difference is that awakened mages don't have quite the same amount of power compared to a hereditary mage. Since they aren't exposed to it from a young age, they often work with less innate magic. But they have a major advantage over the hereditary mages. Awakened mages can gain familiars. Tomo continues by noting that by being contracted or properly allied with a creature of magical might, an awakened mage could shortcut the way to match a hereditary mage. But this all often led to disputes and arguments between the two sides of magic, both on a socio-cultural basis and in terms of what either side of the magical world would do or could be influenced by. Morda was told from a young age that she had the potential, power, and wisdom to be the next Magus of our world. It was practically all she was told after she created some of her earliest spells as a child and mastered the secrets of the oldest magics, but she was never meant to become the Magus. Adam noted while showing some of the early images of the woman in question, many of them showed that she was a normal teen just like they were for so long. But Momo noticed a pattern of something she had experienced in her private schools. How some of the girls would kiss up to or swarm around her because of her family, appearance, and status. All in the hopes of getting something. Guess that was some of what eventually pushed her over the edge. Momo thought while looking at the mad witchlet. Tamo brought up what was one of the final nails that sent her spiraling out of control. It was when Adam was asked to meet with the Magus. And the master of all magic told him that he was a candidate to be the next successor of the position. Jaws dropped at that and they all looked to Garcia with near reverence. Even Ibera was considering it after learning about the links the mages had with heaven and hell. The man looked up before admitting he had stayed in the running for a time. But I eventually had to pass because a different matter requires my entire focus. The dragon on my back, Adam says with gesture toward said beast. He notes that the magus did switch during their lifetime and Morta was never considered a candidate at all. She had been getting more extreme and trying to prove she was the best and when I was made a candidate despite being new to magic, she didn't take it well at all. The pair continued by noting that all of the crimes that came to light and she committed afterwards. The dragon was one of the last straws honestly, and most of those who kissed up to her for years turned their backs once she didn't reach her position, mocking her with the term Magus blood as much as they had complimented her. So again, not helpful to use that even if you hate her. Tamo's words ring true to Adam but he wouldn't dignify the matter outright. Instead, he focused on teaching the kids about some of the ways mortal liked to fight and her preference for using various kinds of minions since she was out. Hopefully we'll have some time before she makes her next move. So instead, we'll be practicing some of how to expect those attacks by sparing with me and Tomo. Adam said before pulling out his gun belt and directing the students to Jim Gamma. 
Izuku though thought about what Adam had said in his own path as an overseer and mage. I'm an awakened one just like he is. That means, while my tricks work against everyone here, against a real mage like her I could be in real trouble. If the power gap is really that great, I need some way to close it. Hey watch out. Momo shouts before catching Izuku's arm and pulling him away from the wall he was about to walk into. Though with the unintended effect of pulling him into her cleavage. Though you wouldn't be able to tell given his face matched the color of her hero costume. The heiress was blushing as well but managed to refocus and ask if Izuku was okay. Uh, sort of. I'm just scared and a bit worried about what could happen later for me. Even if I'm the only mage from our world right now, I'm scared I can't handle any other magic threats. Especially since Morta really does like to use other magic beings for her fights. I barely survived my fight with the Dadonki and the other Yakai because I had my familiars and you all. What if she does something like that Kang she attack and pulls Garcia and Tamo away just to attack us here? Izuku's eyes were darting all around while he was saying this, and Momo could tell just how scared he was of the idea of facing her, let alone how it could cost all of them their lives if he failed. She bit her lip before hugging him slightly. While still embarrassing for both of them, it wasn't like before. Instead, Momo was trying to help Izuku calm down by patting his head. You are right that so far, you're the only mage at UA aside from Garcia-san. But you aren't alone. You have all of us too. Even if we can't really use magic at all, we can help in other ways. Like what you did with my staff or Tetsu Tetsu's wraps. Izuku looks up at her with slightly wide watery eyes before resting his head again on her chest. She's right you know. And you have the two of use as well. We've got your back Izuku. Riku says while materializing and putting a hand on Izuku's shoulder. And Chika hugged him from behind. The green-haired mage sniffles a little before thanking all of them. Momo especially. Listen, take these. They aren't much, but they are some good quick-use talismans for in a pinch. Maybe you could use them with your quirk to turn the tables if necessary. Oh, a uh, thanks Midoriya. I'll have to test it out later. Momo says with a smile while accepting the slips of paper that Izuku had extended to her. He wipes his eyes before saying they should catch up with the rest and get to training. But they aren't the only ones training or beginning to train. At I Island, Melissa had been taken her chance and used the card Morta had given her to bring the woman in. So, what is it that is beyond my comprehension? The young inventor asked with a slightly skeptical eye. Morta chuckled slightly before spinning her staff and causing a few strange effects in the room. From transforming certain items into autonomous beings, making a few chemicals into an actual potion, and restructuring a compound into a metal most would call a myth or a chalcum. This is but a small sample of what magic can do, and I believe you have a bit of potential in it yourself. Melissa blinked in surprise at all she had seen happen and had to take her glasses on and off to make sure she wasn't going crazy. You want to teach me magic, but I'm a scientist. I thought I'd be one of the last people you'd want to work with, Melissa said with a confused gaze up at Morta. I have learned through many instances that science can at time match the strongest magics, and in turn, the wisdom of science can greatly improve what one can do with magic, so long as it is understood properly, which I believe you truly specialize in. Melissa blushed at the praise and the way Morta linked the two disproportionate worlds together. She looked over her awards and other devices before looking to her hands and the woman who had shown her all of this, and started her path with one phrase, where do we start? In the weeks leading up to the sports festival, both magic students were taking to their studies well. Izuku was dodging attacks and spells from his familiars and even his classmates, and shooting back himself. While Melissa was working her way through a variety of spells and effects around her when Morta brought up something that had intrigued her. It seems you might have more magic potential than I realized. You might actually be a hereditary mage. Melissa looked back and asked how that was possible, only for her spells to go haywire and cause a lot of destruction. Morta chuckles before flourishing with her staff and rewinding the room to before the damage was done. There is magic in your world. It could be that long ago your ancestors had tapped into that potential. But without something more to act as a catalyst, you couldn't truly become a mage, the mad witch surmises before instructing Melissa to start again. At UA though, Izuku was questioning more of how Adam and Morda's magic differed. So how do those pistols of yours work? Izuku said between his work of interlaying spells and circles. Adam looked up from his phone before saying, I guess you could say I prelude some spells into a few rounds. But when those run out, I can keep using just base magic essences from the tools. Tamo jumps in and noted it was common for a number of mages to do or use similar tools. Awakened especially use these. It often helps to get the drop on certain individuals, though most of them use the modern style. Modern style? Melissa asked her teacher. Yes, it's a style to simplify aspects of magic and make it easily accessible. Some have noted that it is for the awakened mages mainly. But I do see it as a good baseline to work with. She then demonstrates by creating a handful of small spells around herself, each with different effects and potential, but limited in its breadth. 
When the magic runs its course Morta directs Melissa to try similar or at least a few of the spells. It is far weaker than ancient magics. That is what we hereditary mages can tap into. I'll teach it to you eventually. But I need to be sure you have a grasp of the starting magic. Whoa, wait. So, ancient magic is like super powerful spells. How powerful are we talking? Izuku questioned in between attacks. Adam let out a breath before admitting it was sometimes called the power of the gods. Adam went on to say, It's from the oldest forms of magic. Stuff like the Ark of the Covenant, the Rui Jingu Bang. That type of stuff. Basically, if there's a myth about an item or special spell, well then, it's related to ancient magic, and hereditary mages can use it fairly easily. Izuku was wide-eyed at this and questioned if that meant they had no chance against a hereditary mage. Nah, those types of magic have a few drawbacks. One you've seen already. You solved how the curse of matcha could be stopped, and plenty of other spells have similar rules. Tamo floats above with her foxfire and says, If the rules of this spell aren't followed, then it won't have much effect. That's why she often would create new spells from the baseline to work for her. Izuku thinks it over while backflipping out of the way of her fire shots. So modern magic has the advantage of being easily understood and simple effects. But ancient is complicated by the rules of the gods. That seems like an odd issue, Melissa said while practicing casting barrier spells on a different day. Her eyes noticed the pattern of how Morta would make them rotate and one would flash before firing, giving the bespectacled girl a few seconds to intercept. Morta let out a frustrated sigh before saying, Indeed, I've run into a few issues with it regarding said powers, especially when that frustrating rival of mine has a similar talent. Melissa looks back and asks who Morta meant, only to get blasted in the back by a lightning spell. Even when asking questions, don't lose focus. And, huh, his name is Adam Garcia. He's an awakened mage but we have similar talents in memorization. He can roughly memorize any spell he's seen once or twice. I can do similar. My advantage is, I can understand the ancient languages and formulas. An awakened can't, which is part of the problem in facing her. Adam said while using his pistols and training with Izuku. Though it was not going well for Izuku, he'd taken at least three hellfire shots to his face and got tripped up by a blessed light bullet to his knee. He groaned before asking, is that why you have extra tools like that? Tomo acknowledged it was one reason, due to channeling specific or complicated energies. If the circle or spell is interrupted then the whole thing crashes down, but you need something strong enough to do it, like a pistol that shoots hellfire, or a knife made of divine Damascus steel. Izuku acknowledged that before asking, so when do I get something like that? Adam and Tamo laughed a bit and noted he had to earn it himself. You don't just get tools like these by going to the store kid. You gotta earn them, Adam said before shooting at his protege again. Morta meanwhile decided to test a few other matters, namely by giving Melissa her staff to test how she could handle spell work with it. Melissa gulped slightly before finding she could make the tool change into many things, as well as efficiently forming and casting spells. The Mad Witch smiles at this as some of the magic fades. I thought so. This staff is special. It only responds to those with enough innate potential to make it work. That was how I made it. Morta explains while Melissa looks at the item in question. Wait, how do you measure potential? Is it similar to how we scan quirks for their power potential? Morta hummed before noting it was similar and different. My staff works by scanning the mana reserves and potential of a wielder. I designed it as a failsafe if anyone took it from me, she said before casting a few spells by hand. Izuku grunted as he was tossed to his back but not before leaving a talisman for his teacher to step on and stop his advance. Mono reserves, like in an RPG, he asked incredulously. Tomo shrugged and acknowledged the similarities. If I were to give a broad description, your average person has about 1 to 200 points. If the RPG thing helps to visualize it, in Adam's case when he started, his reserves jumped up to about 5,000 after I became his familiar. Garcia sighed as he got out of Izuku's spell. Good trick, didn't expect it. But even with that, it still didn't compare to Morta when we originally met. While I was at like 5, she was up to at least 20,000, and she's only gotten stronger. Izuku gulped at this and questioned if anyone back in Garcia's world could keep up with the Mad Witch. There are four, and a half who can. One is known as the Sage of the Far East. He mastered all of the magics of Asia. Shinto spells, Taoist arts, Buddhist prayers, etc. He noted that the Pope of their world was one who could face her as well. Turns out, the Popes actually have mysticism as part of their work just involved in holy magic alone. Ours actually stopped the attempted invasion of all seven princes of hell and their armies himself, crafted holy chains that dragged and resealed the demons away, after Morta unleashed them to try and gain power. Melissa was surprised at what a different high clergyman could do in their world. Then there is a frustrating awakened mage from Egypt, one who has the ear and blessings of all of the gods of Egypt, right down to having a copy of the Book of Thoth, as well as Amit as a familiar. The last mage she noted as on her level was a genie who had once been human. 
She was less of a problem though given her own commitments with her partner. I'm not sure why she bothered, but she became a famous hero in our world, protecting people from insane threats rather than committing herself to fully honing her skills. That's four, but you noted in a half-mage. Who's the last one? Melissa questioned while looking at the composition of Morta's staff. The witch grimaced before admitting it was her rival, Adam Garcia, though he often had more important things to work on as an overseer. I still won't forgive him though. Melissa looked up at her and asked what she meant. Amesworth shook her head and said it wasn't important. Izuku asked the same and his teacher gave him a similar noncommittal response. I can't forgive or forget what she did though. And whether she admits it or not, it was her fault what happened. We were just doing our jobs. He explained that with Nigran's power, he was on par with Morta in terms of capacity and strength. Thus, he was the best chance to defeat her when the time came. His protege looked like he wanted to know more, but Tamo stopped him. Not the time Izuku. That's a wound that's, well delicate to say the least, she said with a sad gaze of her own. Izuku though was wondering if he'd ever really be able to measure up to Garcia. I'm decent enough at the investigation side, and I've got two capable familiars. But, they really don't compare with Nigran or that mortal woman. If I'm going to have any chance to help, I have to get stronger. Izuku thought before questioning if there was a good familiar that could put him on the same or similar leaf. After another training session at I Island was done, Morta had a subtle thought cross her mind. I wonder if that trap I left has been picked up by anyone of note. Perhaps that will give me more time to work on my new apprentice, she thought before taking her staff back from Melissa. Momo was showering after a rough day of training, and some backfire from a few of the talismans that Izuku had given her. Need to think it through more when I use those. Midoriya didn't really explain anything with them. She thought aloud before dressing and calling her family car to get home. Once she was there though, something felt off to her. Father, mother, is everything alright? She asked after walking in the door. She shivered slightly while walking through the foyer and towards the dining room. A hand reached out and set itself upon her shoulder, causing Momo to scream in a panic. But it was just her mother. What's wrong dear? You act as if you've seen a ghost, the lady said with a relaxed smile. Momo caught her breath before asking her mother to not sneak up on her. Aya, uh, there's just something strange in the house, or it feels like it, the raven-haired girl said while her eyes jumped towards the corners. Ah, uh, I wondered about that as well. It might have something to do with an item your father purchased recently, the Ayurazu matriarch said before waving for her daughter to follow. In her father's study, there was a strange statue of a baboon. It looked Egyptian in nature given some of the ornamentation. The eyes in its waist though were what unsettled her. The eyes seemed to be almost like burning red orbs in the statue, and for some reason the sculptor had chosen to have a somewhat erect aspect to the baboon. If I remember what the man who sold it to me said, this is the deity Baba, and a uh, part of the appearance was related to it being a semi-fertility god. Momo's father tried to defend after noting how uncomfortable his daughter was. She shook it off and quickly removed herself from the room to shower, not noticing that the gleam of the eyes did seem to follow her for a moment. After dinner Momo still felt uneasy as she went about finishing her homework and preparing for the next day. But she pushed it aside and tried to relax into sleep once her assignments were done. Though not without grabbing a talisman to put under her pillow, the Eirazu heiress had somewhat settled into sleep. Though not without a handful of dreams that made her blush bright before she woke up because she felt a presence again. She looked around her room but saw nothing from her large bed. She got up and checked her adjoining sitting room and bathroom but found nothing. So, she shrugged and laid down in bed again only for her eyes to shoot open upon seeing the statue her father had purchased hanging above her bed. She screamed as it dropped down and gripped her wrists tight, but she was able to grab the talisman as she saw a portal opening to her left. As her parents burst in to see what was happening, Momo focused her thoughts to make the magic do what she hoped. Just as she and the statue were pulled into the portal she flicked the talisman at the wall, and it formed a message. Call Adam Garcia and Midoriya Izuku, was what was read upon her wall. Thus, both overseers were called out in the middle of the night to investigate this anomaly. Hijo de Puta. This is Morta's work. Looks like, some sort of portal or similar spell to cause chaos. No telling how many of these might be out there. Adam analyzed while trying to determine what they were dealing with. Not to mention unraveling the post-cast concealment spells at it. Izuku though was less concerned about that and more worried about what Momo could be enduring. We have to go after her. There must be some way to follow her. He proclaimed as the familiars were combing the area for other traces. Um, if it helps, the statue was of Babai the baboon god of Egypt. Perhaps that could narrow your search, the Yeyurazu patriarch said while trying to comfort his wife. Adam shook his head before saying, Not likely. That could just be a feint and she was taken to a completely different mystic realm. I highly doubt she'd make it that easy. But if there's a chance we should take it and find out what happened, Izuku said before creating some magic circles and tracing the magic that was used to make the portal. 
Izuku wait. Even if it dropped you into the same initial realm, it could have teleported to a different one entirely. You can't go off half-cocked. Izuku ignored this before saying, She's probably terrified and needs our help. I will save her. He sees the mixed pattern of images and symbols and uses those to create a portal of his own, calling out to Riku and Chika as the portal opened again. While Adam and Tamo tried to get Izuku to stop, he of course didn't and stepped through into a strange hellscape-like world atop a mountain, one with a flaming lake below him in a valley, and the calls and hoots of baboons coming from the forest near the lake. Let's go find that statue, Izuku said before unfurling his Tengu wings. Riku and Chika took to the air themselves and fell in behind him. Hold on ye Yurazu, I will save you, Izuku thought as he made his way down the mountain. As Izuku regained his bearings, he had one major thought go through his mind, I shouldn't be here, but he wouldn't let that stop him. Izuku, are you sure this is the right place? I mean Adam did seem like he thought Momo should be somewhere else. Chika said while trembling slightly. The young mage took an uneasy breath before saying, He might be right, but what are the chances she's stuck to something simple? She's been here for at least an hour, and we don't know how different the time is between dimensions. So, let's get moving. Chika and Riku look at Izuku in a bit of worry as he starts in a direction past the lake of fire they were beside, after they had been walking for a time. Izuku started to build up a tracking spell in his hand but wasn't having much luck. It's like something's disrupting my magic. Well sort of. He kept getting more and more frustrated as the spells broke apart in his hands. Izuku tried a few types of blasting spells that Adam had shown him, and they worked just relatively fine. With the earth and fire ones working the best, while water seemed to have little effect at all, and wind spells were completely useless. Shika was much the same when she tried to cast a few spells. It feels like the root or link of my abilities is... Very far away, she said while only being able to conjure some small fox lights. Probably because it is. Didn't Momo's old man say it was an Egyptian or whatever statue? If that's the case we could have some issues given we're not from the same set of myths. Riku reasoned before taking a whiff of the air, hoping to track Momo in some way. He eventually caught the scent of a human and took the lead over Izuku, who grumbled and wondered why he still couldn't make the magic work right. It's not something you're doing boss. I'd say it's your mind or thoughts that are the problem. Riku said while focusing ahead of himself. The young mage stopped for a moment and asked what Riku meant. I mean, it's pretty clear your thoughts have been running like crazy for a while now man, and it's all wrapped up in a few of your issues with comparing yourself to others. Riku continued by noting Izuku still kept comparing his abilities with magic to those who possess quirks, which never helped his confidence more than feeling like he needed outside help. And now he felt tiny in comparison to Morda and Adam. You aren't aiming to be a magus or whatever right? You just want to be a hero like with your magic, and that can take a lot of forms. The young Mungir reasoned before making their way to a grove that seemed to be all Karasada trees. Chika looked down and thought about some of Izuku actions as well, noting, You were already feeling down when Momo tried to help bring you up, but when you heard she got grabbed you lost a lot of reasoning and jumped right in. Maybe you're right and she is here, but now you can't make the very thing you wanted to save her work because of your own actions. Izuku stopped for a moment in some shock at what his partners had said. He wanted to say they were wrong, that it was just the region they were in that was putting him off and giving him trouble. But his other thoughts stopped him with one phrase, they're right, and you need to stop. He looked up to the strange dark sky before letting out a frustrated and uneasy breath. Okay, let's just stop, at least for a little while, Izuku said before stepping over to a fallen tree to gather his thoughts. Riku gave his master a small smile and followed his lead to collect themselves, with Chika bringing out some snacks she got from the others and was saving. After taking a few minutes to relax Izuku thanked his familiars. I was so ready to show I could do more. That, I could measure up right away and be a big hero. But I forgot that I'm still learning. And I have plenty of time to get stronger. Riku smiled before saying he wouldn't get stronger. We'll all get stronger. And work together to save whoever we can. The trio of mystics share smiles and nods before eating some of the snacks Chika brought out. With his mind a bit more relaxed Izuku can focus more on what needs to be done to find Momo as well as taking better stock of the realm they were in. Babai is supposed to be a god of death if I remember the myths of Egypt, among other things I can't recall, and that lake of fire we were by. I think it does coincide with his realm or something, so if nothing else we should be in the right place to ask him about that statue. Izuku's reasoning seems sound and the pair agree, but I have to wonder why they took Momo. Shika thinks aloud as she feels an unsettling new vibe, one that Izuku and Riku pick up on too. I can't even count how many there are. Riku says while vaguely noticing the gleam from the trees. The young hero mage hums while advising the pair to stay ready. Just as they were drawing their weapons, a scream was let out, and the group saw a person running towards them. It was a woman and she seemed to be in a terrified panic as she was sprinting at Izuku and the Akai. Help me, they're going to, no. She shouted before a baboon leapt from the trees to her back, 
followed by another, and another, and another, each ripping at her flesh and biting into her bones and entrails. Izuku felt sick to his stomach as it was happening, and couldn't muster up anything to strike back with. Neither could Riku or Chika, the latter of whom started to vomit off to the side. All that remained of the woman once the small primates were done, was her heart and a few bones. Before anyone could step forward to pick it up, a trembling stomp was heard in the area. Izuku looked up and saw a terrifying sight. A massive crocodile-like beast stalked forward, glaring down with its burning red and yellow eyes. It opened its massive jaws and quickly snapped down on the heart that remained, before turning back and walking on. Okay, excuse me while I go clean my shorts, Izuku says while walking away stiffly. Riku agrees and asks for the same. Shika blushes before slipping away to take care of her own problems. Once everyone was sorted, Izuku confirmed that they were in the Egyptian underworld. I guess whoever that was, they were some kind of sinner or criminal, maybe trying to escape with their heart and the baboons were set upon her. Quite right young man. A voice rang out loud and regally through the area, and suddenly the group were surrounded by wind, then dropped into a palace or courtroom of some sort. Sitting at the center of it all was a mummified man with a whip-like weapon and a massive sickle. The ruling god of the underworld, Osiris. To his sides were other gods of the realm. Anubis, Thoth, Hathor, Horus, and Mott. The last of whom looked upon Izuku somewhat favorably. Though he hadn't done much to warrant that. The boy gulped before the rulers of the underworld but steadied himself to not show weakness. Something Horus nodded in respect at. Osiris shifted upon his throne before speaking to the trio once more. You are not of our realms. And you are not dead yourselves. Why have you come to the Jewet? Izuku lets out a breath before taking a knee before the god gesturing for his familiars to do the same. I, I only came to this realm to try and find a friend. She was taken by an enchanted statue. One, I believe relates to Babai. Izuku reported while maintaining his composure. Only just though, he recounted the artifact in question before asking if the gods would or could help him find Momo. Hathor was the first to speak. He speaks truth, and he seeks to maintain law and order. I believe we could at least aid him that far. Osiris, she said with a wink towards Izuku. The king of the underworld hummed for a moment, accepting after five minutes of mental deliberations. Izuku and the familiars smiled before thanking the gods, as a portal was opened off to the side. Boy, just a moment, Hathor said before she and Mott shrunk down to look at Izuku more closely, though both were still quite a bit taller than him. With impressive assets from Hathor that were right in his face, he blushed before saying, Um, what can I do for you? Hathor Sama and Mott Sama. The first goddess smiled down at him before holding an ank out to him. You seek one you love, or at least deeply care for, yes, this will help to protect you along the way. Izuku was surprised but gladly and gratefully accepted the warding charm. Mont stepped forward next. She seemed unsettled though and said, you already possess ways to fly, so me gifting you wings would not account for much. Instead, there is this. She held a finger aloft before gently tapping Izuku's heart. The teen was confused by the matter and asked what it was about. You will understand eventually. You should hurry. Riku pulled on Izuku's arm and noted she was correct. Izuku thanked the gods once more before leaping through the portal, into what looked like a savage palace of violence, bones, and monkeys. Well, that's not unsettling at all. Izuku snarked before starting up some spells once more to protect himself. Shika meanwhile prepared a variety of wards and other protective spells to help the other two, while Riku readied his blade and armor. The unsettling feeling returned in force as they made their way into the palace, and now they could all see the eyes gleaming from the sides and shadows. She's definitely here. The scent is really strong. Riku reported before noting the way they needed to go, only for him to be attacked by a group of baboons leaping from the shadows. Before they could land though, Izuku quickly blasted them all away. I feel better now, not just because of when we stopped, but also because of what Hathor Sama said. Just focus on what needs to be done. Izuku thought before reforging a few spells to make a small windstorm. The group make their way further into the palace and see a number of somewhat disturbing sights, least of which were a number of orgies happening in various rooms, some of which had baboons and other animals in amongst the humans. Okay, now I remember one of the things Babai is known for, virility and death, Izuku shouted while trying to ignore what was going on. Thankfully though, Riku reported that Momo's scent wasn't in any of the rooms with romps happening. She's further in. Unfortunately, I think Babai is there too. The Munija boy reported with some fear, slicing a number of baboons down as they rushed through the halls. Shika makes the comment of, that would just about be our luck wouldn't it? What's the plan Izuku? Izuku had considered just busting in with everything they had, but that's just hoping everything will work out. No, we have to be smart about this, he thinks before formulating a plan to face the baboon god, who was both intimidating and not when they found him. Well this kills some of my worry, but not all of it, Izuku says as the burst into the throne room and find Babai passed out on a throne. He was massive, but still completely dead to the world. 
It was in this room that they found Momo, who was trapped in a cage of bones hanging above the hall. Yeyarazu, Izuku called out before unfurling his Tengu cloak. Momo had barely acknowledged his voice at first, but as Izuku got closer and called to her more, she started to stir. Midoriya, is it really you? She asked with tears in her eyes. She was barely wearing anything. Just strips of her pajamas that didn't cover anything and she had multiple cuts across her body. Yeah it's me. Hang on. Izuku said before using a spell on his shirt and making it into something she could wear. It was just a long sweater. But it would at least cover what was necessary as they flew down. Izuku asked what happened while Chika went through some notes to try and get them back. Just after the statue dragged me here, I tried to get away. And before I knew it, the baboon started attacking me. She thought it was going to be worse when Babai himself appeared. He grabbed me in. Licked me while I was in this state. Then he brought me back here and locked me in that cage. I don't want to think about what he intended to do. Momo said before crying as she covered her face with her hands. Izuku was mad, but he saved the matter for later. We're getting you out of here. Once Chika finds the spell in my notes we should be able to make it out of the underworld. Izuku said with assuredness. Don't think I'll let you take my new toy easy boy. The group heard this from behind themselves as a massive hairy fist came at them. Chika's ward and other protective spells were broken through like it was nothing and Izuku's own magic shield barely held up. It was aided by the ank that Hathor had given him. Izuku cursed under his breath before forming some spells and firing them rapidly at Bamai's arm, setting the appendage ablaze after a dozen shots. The ape god roared in annoyance at that, and the anger grew as Riku managed to leap up and stab the god in the eye. We should run, Chika says before floating herself and Riku up. Izuku agrees and quickly picks Momo up to fly her away. They make their way out of the palace as fast as possible, blasting baboon after baboon away. Momo even gets some payback by making a few grenades drop behind them. Once outside, Izuku asked that Chika find the spell once again. But a pair of crashes distract them. The first being the roof of the palace bursting upward. And then a powerful crash in front of them. Babai had returned and he was furious. The god let out a powerful roar before trying to strike again. But the group kept out of his way for the most part. Riku had to stick to the ground since he couldn't fly. But he was fast enough from all of his training to keep out of the danger zone. Izuku and Chika had less shockwave danger to worry about so they kept attacking the great ape with any spells they could think of. Though it was a bit harder for Izuku given he still had Momo in his arms. Leave me. You can't fight him like this. Just drop me. She pleaded. Her own abilities were of minimal effect on the god. Anything she threw at him, it did little more than annoy Babai. Like hell I'm going to do that. I will save you. I'm not losing someone I care about. Izuku shouts while trying to fire back with a few spells. Momo blushed hearing this but her thoughts were interrupted by the constant need to evade the strikes from the god. We can't win like this Izuku. We need some way to contain or stop him. Shika reported while using whatever fox fires she had to harm the god. Izuku grunted as his shield blocked a boulder thrown by the monster. A way to stop him. As if we could stop this rampaging beast that. Wait. Izuku thinks before realizing a way they could contain the monkey god. Yeyarazu. Can you make circlet of gold? Izuku asks while flying around. Momo looked at him funny and asked why he needed that. All he would say was that it was for a powerful set of spells to save them. Then, call me Momo, please. The heiress's request surprised Izuku, making him blush as bright as she did. Momo, Izuku muttered out. She asked him to say her name a few more times before hugging his neck tight. While she was, she made the item Izuku asked of her, handing it to him when it was fully formed. Izuku smiled before saying she needed to take cover. I know it's counter to what I said before, but now I know I can save you and all of us. Izuku said as he flew to a high cliff away from the fight. Shika and Riku kept Babai blinded while the humans were preparing. After he set Momo down, the girl felt an even stranger feeling of enamor looking at Izuku. Slightly flying above her with his black Tengu wings out, he could have been mistaken for a fallen angel. But to her, he was her hero and angel. Wait, she said as Izuku tried to fly back down. She caught his arm and pulled him back for a kiss. One Izuku melted into after a few seconds. For luck, she said as he face was a red as her hero costume. A state Izuku mirrored before thanking her. Time to stop a monkey. He said with a smirk. I'm sick of this. Babai shouted before unleashing a beam of magic from his mouth as the familiars kept attacking. Yeah, well how about this? Izuku shouted before creating a large set of magic circles. The same ones that he used on the Zero Pointer robot. The attack did damage, but it was still minimal compared. Why don't we try this at different level? Izuku said with a challenging look to the baboon god, who snarled and demanded to know what Izuku was talking about. You face us at our level. It's not like you're winning this way. Izuku said before pointing out he still had energy to spare. Babai snarled, but knew the young mage had a point. They may just be mosquitoes, but those can do plenty of damage alone, he thought before agreeing to Izuku's terms, shrinking down to fight them on the ground. 
While he was doing this, Izuku was weaving more and more spells into the circlet Momo had made. I can't match the butta, but I should be able to make one that'll really put some hurt on this guy. Izuku thinks as he descends with his wings. Once the god was at human size, Izuku noticed something interesting. You took on a human form. He asked with some confusion. I thought it might be more appropriate for when I kill you, the human-like baboon god said while feeling his now smooth face. He was roughly the same height as Izuku now, with his black hair spiked up in a major widow's peak. Babai's body was muscular and radiated power and strength. There is no way we take him down, Shika says quietly while looking over the human-formed god. I know, but we can at least make him submit with some work, Izuku says while noting something important. Babai was still just wearing a loincloth around his waist. Now then, time to die. Babai shouted before rushing Izuku. The boy didn't have time to defend or put his plan into action, but he wasn't alone. As Riku leapt forward to slash and protect his friend and master, Shika meanwhile cast as fast as possible to keep the god off balance, supported by Izuku doing the same once he regained his composure. Babai though was still not impressed. This was a foolhardy idea boy. At this size, I can crush you even easier. The god shouted before unleashing his magical energy to push his assailants back then punching out both Chika and Riku before they could react. He put all of his strength into one last blow to burst through Izuku's chest before he can react, only to be shocked when his punch is stopped at the skin. Thank you, Matsama. Now have a taste of this. Izuku grunts out before moving the circlet under Babai's loincloth and right around his testicles. What did you ah? Babai screams out as the ringlet tightens and shocks him. Izuku grunts and groans while still focusing on the circle of pain. I knew we couldn't really beat you but I could get you to stop and listen to what I have to say. The baboon god tries to deny it, but Izuku increases the amount of magic he put into the ring. Damn, I'm running out of mana. Izuku thinks while trying to maintain some measure of a negotiating advantage. But just as before, he isn't alone. Riku and Chika both put their hands on and empower their master with their own mana. All right, all right, just make it S-T-O-O-P-P. Babai shouts as he feels more pain run through his balls. Izuku breathes heavily before saying, You will not chase after us anymore. And you will leave me and Yeyarazu alone. She was only brought here by the machinations of another. And if she hadn't been, then I wouldn't have come and put you through this. Though to be honest sir, you're lucky it's Izuku who showed up. If his mentor had, this might have been worse. Riku commented while Chika showed how ruthless Adam could be. Same with Tamo. Babai groans as the pain eases off and he can at least stand again. He needs a few moments to gather himself but agrees to Izuku's terms. You impress me boy. I'm still furious at stealing her away and this little trick you used. But you were smart in how you faced me. So, before you go, a little gift from me. Babai flicked Izuku's forehead and suddenly felt a massive rush of magic and power flow through him. Upon his head were a set of hieroglyphs that read out Babai's name and title. Bull of Baboons. And on Izuku's back, there was now a powerful looking ape as well. Impressive. You withstood that better than I expected. Your casting needs a bit of work though. Here, let's fight again someday. And next time, no tricks. Babai says before gesturing for his baboons to leave. While a pair of golden rings were sent to Izuku's wrists, ones that quickly multiplied into three rings on each arm. Izuku looked them over before focusing his magic into the rings, and each ring seemed to turn into a different form to focus spells into. Okay, this has been a very weird night, Izuku says before unfurling his wings and making his way back to Momo, who leaps to him and kisses him with an impassioned fervor. You did it, she said as tears were flowing from her eyes. Izuku let out some tears to an agreed. Now let's go home, he said as Chika and Riku arrived to help make the portal home, only to realize they needed to go back to where they originally arrived to get back. Meanwhile at I Island, Melissa had been practicing a number of spells that Morta had been showing her, and had just created her own original spell. Just a bit more. Rise from the seas and split the clouds in twain. Is that right? Yes. And swirl and build until. Her smile broadened as the spell she started making formed into a miniature storm. Nothing as big as a hurricane but a storm that was built from the excess water in the ocean and formed into the room she was testing it in, quickly evaporated to remove the problem of salt water, then rapidly formed into clouds and made to rotate with the power of high and low pressure air. She said as the storm stayed stable in sync with her movements. Impressive work. I didn't think you'd make your own spell so soon. Melissa heard behind her, and there stood her mentor or master as she had taken to calling her. Morta smiled while looking up at results of Melissa's spell. Well I couldn't have done it without some of your insights master. Melissa blushed while saying this. It wasn't entirely wrong. As Morta aided in translating some of the various texts and glyphs from the cultures she made the spell from. You truly have learned well on how to make magic work for you. But, you still need something more. And these are the first parts to it. The Mad Witch something that made Melissa scoff slightly upon seeing it. Namely a wand made of wood. 
No offense, master, but are you serious? Melissa said with a raised eyebrow. Morta chuckled and admitted it was a bit strange. To really refine your magic or rather to cast it well, you need to have a focus. Wands are often good. Side arms, I believe is the term. They don't have much power, but they can make it easier to cast a spell. Observe. Morta demonstrated with a different wand and neatly put back the various books Melissa had strewn about the floor, and then showed how messy it was when a mage just used their hands. The learning witch was interested in this and asked more about the wand her mentor had brought for her. It was a simple piece but apparently the elder mage knew enough about crafting the tools Melissa needed, at least as far as this side piece goes. To truly make your magic soar, you'll need to make your own staff, and I have what you need to make it. Morta then brings out a variety of metals of mythic origin, and a few other pieces of wood to reinforce the tool. Melissa was wide-eyed as she looked over the metals, smiling as she felt the materials and started to consider what she could all make. She stopped though and asked, but what's the catalyst? You mentioned that too. Ah, oh, yes, that I also have for you. Here, Morta says before pulling out a crystal. She tells Melissa that it was a mana crystal, condensed magical energy that when absorbed by a mage, namely a hereditary mage, would bolster their mana reserves. It'll at least bring you up to a respectable level of mana for more lessons. So, shall we begin? Melissa looks the blue crystal over in awe but agrees, but not before asking, how did you get this crystal master? It should have taken a long time right. Morta nodded and said she had been storing some extra magic away for a period of time. Took a few years but, it should help you now. But this was a lie. As Melissa started absorbing the energy of the crystal, Morta thought of the places she had gained the extra magic from, flying to various prisons across the US and other parts of the world, and using the same spell she used in Berlin to condense and distill all of the base magic potential most thousands of criminals and guards erased from existence and turned into a blue crystal of magic, one that Melissa had finished absorbing and could feel the energy running through her. This is incredible. So about the staff, does it matter how it's made? Morta shook her head before telling the girl she could add technology to it if she wanted to. I don't fully understand science, but I do respect how far it has come. Incorporate whatever you wish into it. It is yours to make, Morta said before leaving her apprentice to work, though she felt a quick pang of regret as she walked away. Namely at seeing the excitement in Melissa's eyes. She quickly brushed it aside though and focused upon setting some new challenges for Adam or Izuku. Be it there in Japan or perhaps I could call upon another interesting individual to cause some mayhem. She thought while projecting a map of the mythic hotspots around the world. Considering the next target for her machinations. So that got a bit dark at the end. But I wanted to show more of how far gone or just straight up evil Morta has become. It's no one bad day type of thing, but she is one who I built in my comic ideas as being one of the worst villains of that universe. I have others, like a mad mutant from Beijing who brings others together to try and rule China. Power mad or obsessed nouveau rich types and newly powered villains that justice or others from there have to deal with, or even the various magic gangs that the overseers have to try and keep in check. Upon arriving back at the Yeyurazu house, everyone was shocked by what they saw. For one, Momo was basically naked and being carried like a princess by Izuku. Two, Garcia could sense the intense growth of the boy's magical reserves, and possibly power. Gonna have to work with him on controlling it and showing that it's not everything when it comes to using magic. The third thing was one that made Momo's mother happy and her father annoyed. Their daughter was holding Izuku fairly tight with a smile on her slightly sleeping face, and while the man wanted to interrogate the pair on the matter, his wife knocked him out and said they'd discuss things in the morning. We cannot thank you enough young man, if you ever need anything. We'll be happy to help, the woman said with a twinkle in her grey eyes. Um, thank you ma'am. Right now though, I just want to get some sleep, Izuku said while realizing it was almost dawn, and they had classes to go to. Adam alleviated some worry and said, I'll talk with Nezu and the others about what went down. Think I can probably swing you a half day. Izuku thanked his mentor before preparing to fly or portal home, only for him to fall asleep while trying to do both. The Yeyurazu matriarch had a slightly mischievous smile on her face before suggesting that Izuku could get some sleep in one of the guest rooms. We do have plenty of them after all, she said before clapping and calling a few servants to escort Izuku to a room. You know what? I think I'll take you up on snore Izuku started before collapsing and being caught by his familiars. Adam sighed before taking his leave, though the explanation he and Tamo had to do was fairly extensive. This is quite unsettling. Do you believe there are other tools or weapons that Morta has left? I'm not sure Principal Nezu. The worst part is, we won't know if there is a trap until it is sprung, or anything else like that. She's quite good at hiding spells, Tamo says with a worried gaze. Her words were somewhat broken up by the sound of Aizawa bashing his head against the wall at everything described, constantly muttering, illogical, irrational, or shouldn't exist over and over. Nezu meanwhile approved of Momo and Izuku being excused from their classes for the time being. 
There was a bit of a shock for the pair when they woke up though. That being the two in the same bed together. What? I just got away from. I didn't think you. Wait. You look just as surprised as I do. Uh, yeah. Because the last thing I remember was passing out from no sleep and fighting a god. Izuku said with a completely red faced. After a few seconds of staring at each other, the team broke down into fits of laughter. Once they had laughed enough to bring tears to their eyes, Izuku asked, So about the kiss? Oh where do we go from here? Momo blushed before admitting she wasn't 100% sure. I'd like to see if this grows into more. But, well we have a lot to worry about and work to do, the heiress said while looking down sheepishly. Izuku was a little saddened but he did understand what she meant, or so he thought. She probably doesn't want to be associated with a guy who is quirkless, even if I'm a mage. Not to mention Izuku thought started this way, but what Momo said next brought those to a halt. Aunt said, we are both teenagers, not to mention we're aiming to be heroes, and in your case, an overseer. Not only should we try to enjoy this, but we should see this as a way to, well handle what life will be like when we do go pro. Izuku's jaw dropped before asking, so, you want to start a relationship? Maybe just in secret. Momo's face turned scarlet again before nodding and saying she would like that. That's cute. Hey, anytime you guys want privacy, I guess the two of us could just go somewhere else. Riku's disembodied voice said before returning to normal space. Shika popped in as well and her face matched her hair while glancing between the two young heroes. The teens in question also blushed and Izuku said, Um, if we do decide to do something. Yeah, could you give us some space? Riku gave his master a thumbs up and Chika bashfully nodded. Once it was all said and done though, Izuku felt himself rocketing up to cloud 9. After recovering and returning to training, Izuku was excited that he had time to learn more of what he could do with his new tools and the familiar on his back. It's not quite like mine in that it'll come off to help you fly or attack independently. At least I don't think so. It seems more like an inter enhancement type. Basically, it'll make you stronger and a bit more capable of casting quickly. Adam explains before telling Izuku to test out some of what he can do. The boy nods before lifting a huge boulder and throwing it from the mountain zone into ground beta. I wasn't even trying, Izuku says excitedly. He then tests out his new strength by punching a few rocks and shattering them with ease. And then later, he learned what the bangles Babai had gifted him could do. Namely, they let him load a set or type of spell within the rings, letting Izuku fire the magic off in blasts or patterns, though it only really worked for simple spells. Not that it wasn't fun for him anyway. Pull. Izuku shouted before a rock was thrown into the air by Riku, and then he blasted it with a set of explosive spells in a shotgun-like fashion. The next set, he created a set of spells more focused on kinetic force, and the result were shots that had more range and impact. Aside from that, Izuku was riding high thanks to some quiet dates with Momo and enjoying spending time with her, though some of the time they ended up just doing things like studying or practicing together. Not the most romantic thing I can think of, Izuku said while rubbing the back of his neck. Momo tittered and admitted she wasn't sure herself. I've never been interested in anyone before, so this is all new to me as well. But I will tell you, even if all we're doing is messing with your magic or my quirk, I have fun spending time with you. Izuku turned crimson and thanked his girlfriend before thinking of something special. Riku, Chika, could you bring me, whisper, he said before the pair of familiars produced some materials and ingredients. Momo looked over his shoulder and asked what he was doing. Nothing too crazy, just a little something fun, Izuku said with a smile while setting the materials onto the ground. Then with a touch of earth magic, he made a circle beneath that and started a ritual-like spell. It started by bringing the seeds that Chika had given Izuku into a spiral of wind and a little lightning. This caused the seeds to glow and then sparkle within the small funnel. Momo was wide-eyed at this and stepped next to him to watch. It's not done yet. Hap, Izuku said before clapping and the sections of metal Riku had provided started to spark as well blasting upward and then reflecting between the seeds and lightning. But this wasn't just a light show. As the metal was bouncing around the wind funnel, it was making noise as well. Wait, music, are you playing a song with magic by making the metal resonate? Momo guessed while looking on in awe. Izuku grunted as he was having trouble maintaining the spell. But he did murmur out that it was accurate before settling the power. I was kind of making it up as I went, but I thought it could be a different kind of fun this way. Even if it didn't last long, he said while looking down slightly. Momo smiled before bending down to kiss his cheek. Maybe we should do this type of training more. One that lets us just play with our powers, she said before making a few small fireworks with her quirk, and then setting them off with Izuku. Adam noticed though that Izuku was getting a touch overconfident in his new familiar and abilities. So, he thought it would be a good idea to give him some humility. The man waited for a moment before classes ended for the day and set it up as a training match. Let's see what you've got Izuku, and how will you handle the power you've gained. Just you and the new familiar, the ranger overseer said while narrowing his eyes at Izuku, who smiled and said he'd be happy to show him. 
punching his fist together and powering up the bangles to aid in his casting. Once at ground beta, he leapt towards his mentor for a punch that would also have the force of an explosive spell behind him and an impact or kinetic spell in front. But the man easily got into his space and threw him, using the force of Izuku's intended blow to send him spiraling. The young overseer shook his head before shifting the bangles again and firing a number of impact spells at the elder overseer, who waved his hand and created a set of small magic circle shields around him, easily intercepting the most damaging or dangerous spells Izuku sent his way. The others flew past him. Those articles may make it easier to quickly cast spells and even stack up the spells you want to use, but they won't do you a lot of good if you can't focus the spells, and you're up against someone who can anticipate your moves. As Adam is reprimanding Izuku he fires back with a few spells of his own and waits for the counterattack. Izuku makes his shield to block the first attacks and then leaps around to get a new attack angle, only to fall victim to something he didn't know his mentor had set up. With a snap of his fingers, Garcia cast a flame pillar spell that struck Izuku before he was hit from the side by a lightning spell. Wait a minute. Those? You set those up earlier. Izuku exclaimed, realizing that both of the spells he had been hit with took time to cast and prepare. I did. You didn't really think I wasn't planning to give you my all did you? You may be my student, but that is all the more reason that I won't pull my punches. Adam said before quickly casting a few more spells. Izuku blocked and dodged most of them, but he had to be more careful as he moved around the clearing. While he was catching his breath, Izuku tried to better assess his situation. He's likely laid all kinds of traps around, and if I just keep running blind, I'll fall into another one. Okay, time for a magic scan. Izuku thought before quickly forging the spell in question. Before it would fully finish though, Adam created a powerful element ray spell and fired it Izuku's way. The boy couldn't block and had to escape as fast as his wings would take him. Though he found it was harder to fly than he remembered. You've gotten lazy. Or rather you're relying on the wrong things Cabrito. And it's coming back to bite you. How do you figure? Izuku says before leaping out and throwing some logs at his mentor, who easily blasts them out of the air and then blasts Izuku. The young mage then casts a number of spells while moving and avoiding the few traps he'd found with his search spell. Maybe the fact you're not really fighting like a mage anymore. You're fighting like a person with a quirk. This statement gets Izuku to trip and barely avoid another trap that Garcia had set. Your new familiar gives you strength, endurance, and speed comparable to many with quirks, and the bangles you got from Babai let you basically fire off spells easily, as long as you preload the types you have in mind. No different than a person who has a special activation condition or needs specific equipment to really use their quirk. You've lost sight of who and what you are. After all, you started this fight just like your former friend would. Izuku grit his teeth before responding that his mentor was wrong, and then tried to use a combination of elemental effect to trap the man starting with a wave of water and then trying to quickly freeze it. But Garcia was able counter this with a large earth wall that ate the wave of water. He succeeded with a secondary spell though and Adam was wrapped up in vines. The young mage was happy that his plan worked and stepped out to talk with his mentor, only to feel his legs give out on him a moment after stepping out of the bushes. You haven't even realized that you already lost, Garcia said from his position in the vine trap. Or was he in it? Izuku blinked a few times before noticing that his mentor was not in his trap. Instead, it was a dummy made of earth and somehow projecting his voice. While we deal more in true arcane arts, you shouldn't discount a staple of stage magic. Misdirection, Garcia said while coming up from behind his pupil. Izuku then felt his hands being moved behind his back and he couldn't work his bangles and his baboon familiar's strength was waning. You didn't realize I'd made even more of a first move muchacho. The whole time you were fighting, you never knew that I wasn't really there. And that all of my talking wasn't just to lecture you or get you to realize something. Even simple words in a conversation can be laced with curses and enchantments, Adam said while walking around Izuku as the boy was losing consciousness. As the teen was fading, Adam took off his hat before setting it atop Izuku's head. You need to remember this Izuku. If you really want to grow as a mage, you can't just go about blasting everything with high-powered spells. Sometimes, the simplest things can cause a fortress to collapse, and a small set of spells can really add up into an impressive display. With that, Izuku passes out in the clearing of the training ground. He woke up an hour later in the infirmary. Sitting next to him were Riku and Chika and they looked worried. Izuku, what happened to you? Chika questioned while putting a fresh cloth on his head. The green teen's eyes widened as he recalled the match with his mentor. He had me completely beat. I didn't even get a real hit on him. But is he right? Have I really been treating magic the same as a quirk? Or is it only recently that I've started thinking like that? Maybe, I need to go back to the basics. Izuku thinks while looking at the bangles on his wrists, and considering what could be next for him. As an overseer, mage, and hero. Just for reference, Izuku's little storm spell is different from what I had Melissa do for her spell. 
For one, he had to set things up to cause the effects of the magic and use materials and ingredients. Melissa on the other hand could just cause that by herself and it was much larger. It's one of the differences between the two types of mages. 